Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, we're going to get started in about 10 minutes at 9.30. So just a reminder, if you haven't um, signed in and got your uh, paperwork already, please go over to uh, Camilla's Waving over there at the table. We also have coffee and breakfast if you didn't walk down that way already. Um, and upstairs, if you'd like uh, uh, another coffee drink, you can go to the coffee shop. So we'll get started in about 10 minutes or so. Right. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started in about five minutes, so please find a seat here in the cafe.
All right, everyone. If I can get everyone's attention. We're gonna go ahead and get started, folks. Welcome everyone to the Anchorage Community Housing Action Summit. My name is Felix Rivera and I represent Midtown on the Anchorage Assembly. And my name is Anna Brawley. I represent District 3 West Anchorage on the Assembly. We are so very glad to welcome you all to the UAA Student Union for this occasion. This has been months in the making and I thank you all for being here. We have a great day ahead of us, but first some ho housekeeping items. Uh, this event is gonna be live streamed on YouTube, so hi to everyone who's watching us on YouTube. Um, restrooms are down the hall to the left. Uh, there are three exits in this room and then there are two exits down the hall. Uh, coffee, there's some free drip in the hallway, and then there are some fancier options available at the student-run coffee shop upstairs. Um, breakfast is going to be provided until 11.30 a.m., and then lunch will also be provided. Um, some uh, basic rules on decorum. This is not an assembly meeting, so feel free to clap if you appreciate something that's being shared. <laughs> there we go. Um, if you don't appreciate something that's being shared, just keep your booze on the inside, please. <laughs> uh, this is not a town hall, but there are gonna be some opportunities for Q&A, and there's gonna be lots of engagement in our afternoon sessions. When we get to the afternoon sessions, wanna remind folks to please respect everyone's voices and point of views, keep your comments brief, and focus on ideas, and approach this with curiosity. Looking forward to that when we get there. If you are viewing this on the live stream, a reminder that all materials today can be found online at anchoragehousingaction.org and on the assembly website, www.muni.org assembly. As we begin, we recognize that we are gathered on the unceded Denina lands and are grateful for the past, present, and fewer stewardship of future stewardship of the Denina. It is because of their stewardship and their sacrifice that we now call Anchorage home. And I don't take that for granted. We all know someone who is housing insecure, but because there aren't enough housing options for everyone, it's why we are here. This morning, we'll come to understand this problem, and this afternoon, we'll work on the path to solving it. So a little bit of a recap of some of the housing actions that have been taken so far. The Assembly has long worked on housing issues, but really in 2022, it started to bubble as a priority for most members on the Assembly in response to calls from our community about the increased cost of housing and the need to build more housing to solve our community's biggest issues. In the fall of 2022, we gathered at a retreat to focus on what the Assembly could do to increase housing affordability and accessibility and heard from municipal planners and industry leaders about problems and potential solutions. As soon as we got back from that retreat, we started tackling projects on the list, including eliminating parking minimums, easing the process for building ADUs, passing a resolution with the Assembly's housing priorities, and investing in a year-long community effort to focus on housing action. Housing action is one of the top priorities for the Assembly this year. While many of us are working on major legislative projects to deal with pieces of the problem in the near term, we've also been working on our housing strategic plan, which sets the vision for our work in the long term. So that brings us to Housing Action Week, a week-long initiative to welcome the community into real conversations about the future of housing in Anchorage. This week, we convened alongside partners including the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce, ACLU of Alaska, NeighborWorks Alaska, and the Alaska State Home Builders Association. And tomorrow, we're partnering with the Design Forum at the Mountain View Library to bring these policy ideas to families. Today is the culmination of that work. However, while Housing Action Week is nearly over, this is just one step of the process. We hope that you will follow along with our work on housing long after this week. We will continue to keep the anchoragehousingaction.org website up and running as a central place to learn about housing, get updates on the work, and get involved. And we hope that you do. You can also sign up for the Assembly's newsletter to get updates on the projects that we're working on, as well as our recent actions and items that are coming up. We wanna work together as a community, the legislative, 
the executive, and our community partners to achieve the vision of housing. Our goal today is to present the first draft of the housing strategic plan and welcome the community's feedback. Okay, so let's uh, do a little bit of standing up exercise. Um, we wanna do some introductions and really reflections about um, our own housing experience and then uh, looking around us and seeing others' housing experiences. So housing, finding a place to call home is the first step in being a community. Uh, being part of the community. Everyone has a housing story as shown by the data that's displayed here in this room and that we're gonna be working through for the rest of the morning. Um, you're seated among your neighbors. Some are students, some are industry experts, some are elected officials, some are folks who work on housing every day, and, and pretty much everybody loves Anchorage and wishes to see us uh, have a brighter future for our community. So let's take some time and get to know each other and like I said, get ready to, to stand up. All right, so to start, can we please have assembly members stand? I know there are most of you here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the legislative branch of our government, uh, members of the Anchorage Assembly represent all neighborhoods within the municipality of Anchorage, all the way uh, from the Knick Bridge to the north down to the Portage Interchange on the far end of the Turnigan Arm to the south. Our role is to author local laws and pass a budget that reflects our city's values. Using policy and budget together, we set the vision for the city, and we're honored to host you all today to help inform that vision. Next, could the mayor and the staff of the administration please stand? And if there are any, um, yeah. yeah, if there are any uh, members of the planning or health department. I know some of you are here. If you wanna please stand. Yeah, I see you all, there you go. <laughs> so the ex executive branch of local government, uh, these folks are the implementers that bring the policy goals that we're gonna set forth today and in the future to life. So thank you, thank you for being here, for working with us to craft a vision for housing action and for, co and for committing to the work that will come next. Finally, could uh, any state legislators or state employees here please stand up? Great. Thank you for being here. I recognize that you have a tough job leaving your families and loved ones here in Anchorage to represent our community at the state level. Thank you for being with us here today. I hope that you glean some insights from today's program that can help you when you, it's time to return to Juneau. Anchorage and other towns across the state are struggling and we can't do this work alone. We need state funding and support to, to tackle this crisis. Okay, so now this one's for everybody. So uh, please stand up if you own your home. We'll do a little bit of stand up, sit down. Okay, now stay standing if you bought your home more than one year ago. So if you just move, sit down. Okay, stay standing if you bought your home more than five years ago. Okay, so I'll ask you folks sit down. Now stay standing if you believe you could afford to buy your home again today, if it, given the value of the property and current interest rates. Ooh, yeah. I, I, would, be, I would be sitting down too, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so thank you, everybody can sit down. Okay, now we'll do um, the next group. Stand if you rent, if you currently rent your home. Yeah. Okay, now stay standing if you've moved more than once in the last three years or so. Okay, so we got some longtime renters. Stay standing if you've moved to access more affordable housing at any point. Okay, stay standing if you've considered purchasing a home here in Anchorage. Okay, and then stay standing if you've considered leaving Anchorage to access more affordable housing. Okay, so I see a couple folks standing up. And so I want to acknowledge there are other people there who are not in this room who would have um, answered yes to those questions. Uh, thank you, you can sit down. And then uh, a couple more, stand if you love where you live. No wrong answer here, but that's a good one. Um, <laughs> stay standing if you love your neighborhood. And stay standing if you're happy with the quality of your home. Yeah, I see a few people. <laughs> A few people have some DIY projects, looks like. Uh, thank you, you can sit down. And then we've got one more of these. Um, so go ahead and stand if you would like to move out of your current housing for whatever reason. You're thinking about moving. 
Uh, stay or stay standing if you'd like to move into a neighborhood but you can't afford it. Yeah, that's a tough one. Stay or stay standing if you know somebody who has moved, or and you can also stand back up, if you know someone who has moved or chosen not to live in Anchorage because of the cost of living. Yeah. So thank you. Take your seats. So yeah, I think I think we recognize um, it's it's not. Sometimes it can be hard to love Anchorage, but but we all love Anchorage. Um, but but not everybody really has um, the the ability or uh, the the easy access to live here. And so that's that's really why we're here, uh, recognizing our own stories, but also the other people's uh, experience in our lives. Okay, and so now we're gonna do just a brief um, at your table's introduction. So please um, take a few minutes, about three minutes to introduce yourselves at the table, and then please share with folks, uh, why are you here? You know, what brings you to the housing summit? And then we'll bring people back together in a few minutes. Folks, one minute warning, so wrap up conversation soon.
All right. I hope everyone had some good conversations, got to know each other at the table, and got to talk about why housing is so important to you all. So we can go ahead and get back to the agenda here, folks. So it's clear that housing hits close to home for folks, and everyone is excited to talk about housing, which is really great. So next, we're gonna hear from some local experts to understand the Anchorage housing shortage problem. We are gonna facilitate a brief Q&A after the presentation, so please submit your question, questions via Slido or write your questions on the note cards provided at each table for our team to pick up. Uh, so first, uh, we'll hear from Nolan Clauda, Executive Director of the Center for Economic Development at the UAA Business Institute. Nolan previously presented to the assembly and industry leaders during a housing retreat this spring. His findings defined problems that we knew existed but didn't always have the words to express and are actively helping policymakers create solutions. This is one of the vital roles of research universities in our community. Local researchers inform local actions. Today, Nolan will present updated data and paint a picture detailing the current landscape of housing in Anchorage's economy. Nolan, welcome. Let's see, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it this way. So uh, thanks, thanks very much, Felix, and I appreciate the chance to be here today. So in addition to being um, somebody who kind of goes around and comments on things happening in the economy, uh, I am also a human who lives here in Anchorage and has the same basic kinds of needs for food and shelter uh, as everyone else. And so, um, so I do have a, a housing story to share um, also that uh, 2019, my, uh, my partner Michelle and I were looking for a home. We had a, we had a baby that was going to be due very soon. We realized we lived in too small of a place and we, we really needed to upgrade. And so, so we you know, had, the same exp had the experience of going onto the housing market and you know, we had our, our budget was this much and we had these, this checklist of things that we wanted to see in a house and this neighborhood and these attributes and, and so on. And then uh, like so many people before us and since who have been on the housing market, you, you realize that that budget is too small and that list of things that you want is too big and uh, you have to make some compromises. And so we had a, a really depressing experience you know, going around looking for the places that are there. You know, one place uh, was, was was pretty good, but it was really going to need about eighty thousand dollars or so worth of work to be, you know, uh, to be really fully up to up to par for you know kids, and so we were not quite in the mood for a fixer upper. Um, another one had like a deep saturation of cigarette smoke, and our realtor said, "Forget it, you're going to have to strip it down to the studs." And then my personal favorite home uh, that crushed us was the, this beautiful house in a great neighborhood that was very, uh, very, very big for the houses we've been looking at, and also very competitively priced, very good price. And so we went, looked at it, and we're like, wow, this, this is just a, this is a really fantastic house. And then I remember walking on the top floor of it, and you ever have that feeling, you know when you're walking on level ground, it feels a certain way. When you're walking downhill, it feels a certain way. And this felt more like the downhill kind of thing. Um, and a house is supposed to be pretty level, but this house was not. So uh, we decided that we would have to take a hard pass on the house that was leaning pretty hard to the right. Um, and, and so we ended up in a really good place, actually, after, after all of that. I think we're, we're really some of the fortunate ones. We live in Bayshore. We have a house that meets the needs. We now have two little ones, and uh, we're in really good shape. And so, so my, my experience is, is really one of, of privilege, but having had a taste of how rough it can be out there. But I think what really gets, hits hard is how much things have changed just in the four years since then. And I think this is something that I, I saw a lot of people had bought their home, you know, that our homeowners had bought their house recently. Um, so you know a lot of the pain. Um, I think a lot of times when you've lived in your house for a while, you, you, you don't necessarily know how much worse it's gotten since you got your home um, in a lot of cases. And so since 2019, uh, the average listing price in Anchorage increased by more than $100,000. I mean, this is, this is much faster than the rate of inflation, much faster than the weight of any typical wage growth that we've seen. Um, so, it's a, it's a, it's, so we're talking about a pretty dramatic cost increase. This is something that happened nationally, but it certainly happened here in Anchorage. And then at the same time, the amount of inventory on the market, like I, we felt like we had so little to choose from, is down by 72%. 
So it's only about a quarter of what it was just four years ago. I mean, so when you're on the market and you're looking for homes, you have a lot less to choose from. So we didn't have to get into a multi-bid situation like a lot of people did. Um, you know, we, we didn't have to, we, you know, we were fortunate to not have to experience housing insecurity like so many out there do. Um, but but this is, this is a, it's a pretty amazing thing to look at how little there really is on the market. And, and one of the things that's, that's different about this, that's, that is different from, from Anchorage versus other places in the U.S. is that you know, we all saw a big demand in housing, big cost increase in housing nationally. It's not a, not a totally new thing, not a totally unique thing to, to Anchorage, but uh, w other places tended to respond by building more homes. Um, so just a little bit of demonstration here. Talk about the, the amount of homes that we build here in Anchorage. Um, I, I, I did this little exercise of if, if the Matsu Valley had the same, if adjusted for population, like on a per capita basis, if we built the same amount of homes that they build in the Matsu Valley, which you know, is not going to happen for a variety of reasons, it would be about 2,000 houses. Now, Matsu Valley has very different circumstances. It's not something that Anchorage can, can mimic or, 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 or emulate, but, but in the Matsu Valley, it's a much lower cost of land, a lot more available flat land that can be built upon. Um, so uh, just as a reference point, 2,000 houses, if, if it was scaled to Anchorage's population. Um, and the Matsu Valley, by the way, builds about, se about, about two out of five homes built in Alaska. The entire state of Alaska are built in the Matsu Valley, and that's a much bigger share than its, than its total share of the population. Um, but if we were to build homes at the nationwide rate, you know, adjusted for Anchorage's size, it would be about 1,500 housing units per year. So that's a pretty good amount. Um, it's about double the statewide rate. Um, we, the state, in the state of Alaska, uh, if Anchorage built at the overall statewide level adjusted for our population, it would be about 700. But I think some of us here probably already know the answer to what Anchorage actually builds each year. It's about 400 units, um, which is, which is very, a very small number for a, for a community our size. So, so the state of Alaska as a whole it ranks near the bottom of all states as far as the number of homes we build, and Anchorage is very low even within the state of Alaska. And so that, that really does, you know, kind of ask, brought us to ask, you know, why, why is that? What is it that we can do differently? Why, what, are, what are some of the circumstances that create that problem, right? And so what are, what are some of those circumstances? Well, you know, we do have really high construction costs, uh, for one thing, right? So it, it costs, um, you know, the figure that, that builders say is, you know, it's roughly 40% above, like, the national average to build, to build in, in Anchorage, and, and it's, you know, varies throughout the state. Anchorage is not necessarily the most expensive place to build, right? Um, interest rates right now are very high. The last couple of years, you know, that they are very high. Not a, not a great time to, to take a mortgage in a lot of ways, um, but, but uh, so that's certainly a factor. Land availability, something of a factor. Um, I think that this is always one, like, are we out of land in Anchorage? Are we not out of land? I mean, we're, we're not, I mean, we're built in such a low density format that it's really hard to say that we're out of land. Um, but, you know, we don't necessarily have a tremendous amount of greenfield development that can be developed, you know, inexpensively. So it's not necessarily a lot of land that's available and profitable to develop. Um, there's a lot more sort of infill opportunities or, or land that needs infrastructure access or other kind of expensive um, improvements in order to make it work. So, so the two things that we do have, the, so those, th those three things we don't necessarily have a lot of control over, right? And construction costs are also high in the Matsu Valley, too, and other places where they're building more homes in the state than we are. So it can't be just that interest rates, we didn't build any more houses when interest rates were low. Um, you know, land availability, we, we have a limited amount we can do about that. Permitting processes and zoning and codes. Now, it, I don't want to say that this is the entire problem. It's not the entire problem. But these are two things that we might have some ability to have some control over. So whatever they might be contributing to the problem of not building enough homes um, is, worth, is really worth a hard look. Um, it, it really is worth a hard look, I think. Um, this other question is, why do we actually need to build more housing when our population isn't really growing? Like, you know, we, we know that I think, I think probably most folks here realize that Anchorage has is, is actually shrunk a bit. Um, we have fewer, fewer people than we did about 10 years ago. Um, we're on, we, you know, we've had a, a bad out-migration trend. Um, but probably a lot of people don't realize that we have more households than we did 10 years ago. And why would that be? Uh, well, it, it, it's because less of our population consists of families with children. When you have kids, you know, you have more people living in a home. Um, so we have more, more of our population consists of adults now than it used to. And so, you know, if you think about a, a family with kids, you, you know, say it's a family with teenagers 10 years ago, now those kids are adults and they need their own housing. So people that used to fit into one house now are spread across, say, three households if it's two kids, right? Uh, so, so we have fewer people per household um, in place. And so 
that creates kind of ongoing demand for housing. And then you also have some amount of housing decay and deterioration. You lose some housing to fires, you lose housing to aging. Um, about half the homes in Anchorage were built in either the 70s or the 80s, so they don't last forever without needing some significant rehabilitation. So you need to build some, you need more, more housing units being added even when your population isn't necessarily growing that fast. Um, the rent is too damn high. Uh, the, um, so so the, the median rent, you know, this is for a typical apartment in Anchorage is, is about $1,500 per month, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, we have a vacancy rate of about, of about 4%. And um, so to put, put that in perspective, the U.S. Va rental vacancy rate is around, around 6% right now, and that's a multi-decade low. Um, so, it, so vacancy, you know, 6% vacancy rate would be a, is actually a pretty tight market. We're 4%, so we're an even tighter market. And, and you, you look at what the role that rental housing plays. It, it, I mean, for, for a lot of people, uh, it fills a variety of needs. A lot of people who haven't had the financial resources to be able to purchase a home. Um, a lot of times younger people are more mobile people. If you are, say, like a, an early career teacher or a nurse who wants to move to Alaska, um, and we need both of those types of professions really badly, you are going to have a pretty hard time um, you know, with, with, you're, you're, you're probably going to rent, right? Like that's probably going to be the easiest way to get into the market. So you need that kind of flexibility of, that rental housing provides. And, uh, and it's something we, we haven't built a lot of rental housing, a lot of multifamily housing um, in, in the last few decades. This is something that's not terribly profitable for developers to build. A lot of what does get built is, is usually with, with some amount of public money. Um, there's this other issue too that I think is also worth mentioning, and that is the, the issue of short-term rentals. Uh, the, it's, it's something, something interesting to look at is that in, in 2022, between 2022 and 2023, the number of, of, of um, short-term rentals in Anchorage increased by about 400 units. That's about the same amount of units that we built. So uh, I, I don't necessarily want to want to attribute too much blame to, to short-term rentals, but I think that there's some amount of contribution that they make to, to squeezing housing and raising rents and, and really lowering accessibility availability of them. So I think that, that nationally we do know at, at the national level from studies that, that uh, short-term rentals do increase the cost of rent, and so there is likely you know, a contribution that they make. Uh, the problem for me is that each year going by, if we keep seeing the growth of more and more of our housing getting tied up as short-term rentals, um, you know, that's, a, that's not a good trajectory to be on. That is coming to some degree at the expense of our housing stock. So you know, there is some logic, I think, to the idea, not of eliminating them necessarily, um, but, but of, of placing some kinds of limitations on them. I think there is a case for that. Uh, so, you know, where, where do we go from here? I think, I think that um, I'm excited to hear more about the Assembly's uh, strategic plan, and I did have a chance to take a look at it, and I think it does align with a lot of, with, with, you know, the, the kind of three core ideas that I, that I mentioned here. Um, you know, one is that, is that allowing for some amount of increased density, I think. This, this, there are ways of, you know, the, the, the buzz term is the, the gentle density, I think, which is, you know, what can we do to allow a little bit more housing to get built on the land, the buildable footprint that we have? You know, a lot of times our zoning does not allow for that. It sets, it sets density minimums, and I think that, that what can we do to relax some of those that would allow for more housing to get built on a given amount of land, especially when we're looking at redevelopment opportunities or infill development opportunities, is there a chance to increase the amount of density, to increase the amount of housing that's there? Um, also looking at any kind of streamlining of permitting processes. Is there, are there things that we can do to make it a bit easier to build? Um, you know, and this is not something about trying to, to cast blame, um, but I think that, that a lot of places in the U.S. look at this in a sort of a competitive way. How can we be as, as friendly to the right kinds of development as we possibly can? And then also looking at developer incentives, things like property tax abatement for building new multifamily, or sort of um, ways of publicly financing some of the site infrastructure to make some of our undeveloped land, you know, more, um, more economical for developers to, to build on. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I look forward to the discussion today, and uh, thank you very much for the chance to speak. Yeah, thank you, Nolan. Um, and just a quick note, too, I know folks are coming in. There are seats in the back. There's a few tables that are pretty sparse still, so um, you're, you're welcome to stay there, but feel free to walk back there and find a spot at the tables. Um, so thank you again, Nolan. Um, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> um, and, and so I just want to emphasize a couple things before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, first, if you have questions, uh, there's the blue cards at the table, so please write down your questions and then staff will be picking them up. If you're online, you can submit questions through Slido. Um, and then we will do questions um, after our next presentation. We'll get through a couple, so, um, so panelists stick around. Um, but also I just want to observe a couple things. 
First, um, the market is rough out there. Um, so I know the folks who are, are looking for a house, who work in that industry, you, you know the deal. Um, but the rest of us, you know, including me, who aren't, aren't looking for a new home right now, maybe aren't aware of that. But so, so then you think, well, why should I worry about that? That's somebody else's problem, right? Well, really what we're talking about is where our kids are going to live, our grandkids, where our parents maybe want to move and have a smaller house they don't have to take care of. Um, where our employees are going to live, our teachers, our first responders, um, our snowplow drivers, and then really our families. I really want to emphasize that too. You know, I, we've all seen the news about folks, uh, working age folks moving out of state. That is a family who's not choosing to live here, to not have their kids grow up here, to go to UAA, to go to other places. So, so really, th this is an everyone problem, as we keep saying. Um, and I also just want to put a fine point. When we talk about building housing, uh, everybody thinks of the single family house. What we really want to talk about is all housing. Uh, certainly, detached housing, you know, you've got one structure per lot, that's one type of housing. We've also got condos, attached housing, townhomes, and of course, apartments. You know, not everybody wants wants to, to buy in a home. Not everybody at the, is at their stage of life that they would want to. So we want to make sure we have options for everybody at all parts of the market. Um, so with that, I think we'll move on to our next speaker. So again, um, hold your questions for now, write them down, turn them in, and then we'll get back to uh, Q&A after the next presenter. All right. So now we're going to welcome Mike Robbins to the stage. Mike is the executive director of the Anchorage Community Development Authority, a municipal corporation that encourages responsible development and redevelopment through partnerships and community engagement. This year, ACDA hired a McKinley Research Group to explore policies that incentivize development of attainable housing. And for folks who don't know that definition, we define it as housing that is affordable to households earning about the average level of income relative to a community. So today, Mike is here to report on their findings. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Felix, and we appreciate being here. So I, have, I too have my own housing story. Um, we rate, bought our house, uh, about 12 years ago, we were one of the lucky ones that bought when the market was way down. Um, it had that smell in it that, that uh, Nolan was talking about. And uh, we couldn't afford our house today. Uh, if we had to go and buy that house, uh, there's no way we could afford to live in that neighborhood or be able to buy the, the house at the value that it has increased by. So lucky me, but that's one of the challenges with housing in a market like ours. Um, is that when someone buys a small home, uh, they end up selling it because of the um, amount of the growth in the price, and um, the next guy in has to pay for that. So my son, my story about housing is that you know, I sent my son away to college, and I thought, great, he's going to come back. He wanted to come back to Anchorage. I was lucky to that in that regard. So he went down, and he got his degree at University of Portland. He came back, and... Uh, guess where he's living? <laughs> because he can't, you know, he was able to get a job. He decided he wanted to be an attorney, so he went to work. He got a full-time job. Um, he was working at a decent hourly rate, but he couldn't afford an apartment. And the apartments he could afford weren't somewhere that he wanted to, to spend his time living in. And so it's, it's uh, not like Nolan's story exactly, but it's part of the reason that uh, several months back we did retain McKinley Research to do a study. And I'd like to just give them a round of applause. Moria, could you stand up, please, for McKinley? She's here today. So if you have any real questions about our data, just catch her, because she's the smart person who did this, not us. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through really quick um, and kind of give you some highlights from this survey. We'll be handing out copies, uh, and it is also available for download uh, on the ACDA website, so you'll be able to go there after the, the symposium today, and you can pick a copy. So before we, uh, why does uh, housing matter? So this was a there was a study done by AEDC some years ago that talked about uh, why housing is important to a community. If you look at this chart, I think it tells a pretty a story similar to what Assemblymember Brawley was talking about, that 47% of the people surveyed weren't happy with their housing. Um, i got to put my glasses back on so I can read it. And when you look at the, um, 
You look at the number of 15% um, of the employers that were surveyed had job candidates turn down jobs uh, at their company because when they got to Anchorage, they, they didn't like the housing situation. Um, only 8% 8, 8 of their employees said that they were happy with their housing choices in Anchorage. And of course, they rated also the areas to live in the city and downtown ended up to be number one. So it's important to a city for attraction of workers. It's important to a city for um, also for uh, maintaining our workforce. And um, before we, I wanted this, this is a slide that talks about the housing spectrum. And if you look at this, I think it mirrors Anchorage pretty well. Um, you have your lower end housing that's publicly funded for those of us that are experiencing, you know, for those in the community that are experiencing homeless, it's completely supported. Uh, and then it goes all the way up to privately, 100% privately funded housing. And so what we did is we wanted to look at a segment of the marketplace because there's a lot of work being done on the lower side of the spectrum. There's a lot of work being done by CHA and, and several other organizations to try to deal with, uh, with housing. But we wanted to focus on that sort of mid-range, people who have a job or maybe both husband and wife are working <clears throat> but can't afford housing. And so what is attainable housing? I think Felix gave you some sort of an indication. Attainable housing is defined by HUD as um, housing that can be purchased by people earning between $79,000 a year and $119,000 a year adjusted for Anchorage, as opposed to um, affordable housing, which is usually for the 80% or below. The average house, pricing house in Anchorage was $456,000. or $456, And so when you look at the attainable housing thresholds and you look at that annual income of $79,000, you'll see that in order to do that, you have to be able to purchase a house at $265,000 a year. Is there anybody who's been looking for a house lately in Anchorage? You have. Was there a lot of choices in that 265 range? <laughs> I went online yesterday and I saw that there were about 48 houses in Anchorage for sale under $300,000. And they averaged about $300 a square foot. It was pretty, pretty intense when you look at the pricing. And then it, you go all the way up to your 120% of medium income, which most of us, we figure if we're, we're earning 120% of AMI, we're doing pretty well, right? We're successful. We consider that to be successful. Well, you got to be able to buy a house at $397,000 and you won't find a lot of inventory in Anchorage right now in that price range either. So defining attainable housing is important. <clears throat> and this chart really tells a story. If you look at 2013, and you look at the number of units that were built under 300,000, or were for sale or sold in the marketplace, and then you look at 2022, and you look at the difference, you can see that there's been a massive migration up on the scale. And Nolan pegged it when he said that since 2019, housing prices have gone up over $100,000. And actually, if you look at the last two years, average housing prices have gone up over $89,000. So a lot of that growth has been in just the last two years post-COVID. And what it's doing is it's driving housing out of reach of the, the, the ones who are hardest hit here aren't people like me that are sort of, you know, I'm 62. It's my son. He's, 20, he's in that 25 to 40-year-old age group. He's starting his life. I hope he gets married soon. Maybe he has a family and some grandkids. He can't afford housing. So the hardest hit demographic from this shift in housing prices is that 25 to 40-year-old. So attainable, attainable housing development, this just shows you uh, all these graphs and everything that's in here is in the report that we're going to be handing out. And so this just shows you what's been happening with population, what's been happening with uh, housing construction, both multifamily and single family. What you're going to find inside the report is you're going to find population projections, uh, you're going to find homes sold, you're going to find the obstacles to attain attainable housing development, and then in some incentives, some suggested incentives. And so one of the things that we did uh, is we tasked McKinley with, instead of just uh, anecdotally saying, well, we could try this or we could do this, because I, I have to applaud, the Assembly's been doing a really good job this last 24 months of really putting their shoulder in to try to figure out how we can solve the housing problem. But we, had, we asked McKinley to go out and do some market studies and actually study other markets that had a problem with housing. 
Now, we, I showed this slide once before, and they said, well, yeah, but those places aren't Anchorage. <laughs> well, you're right, they're not. But one of the things that they all have in common is that they had the same problem that we have today, a decade ago. And what they did is they found common solutions that worked in their communities for ways in which they could affect the housing market. And you'll see those case studies outlined completely in our report so that you can look at them and you can analyze them for yourself. These are the results, that, and, and th I think results do matter. So when you look at Billingham, Washington, they were able to build 1,164 units in the last decade of just attainable housing. This isn't their overall housing development. This is just in that attainable price range. Bend, Oregon, 297. Boise, Idaho, 1,520. And you can see what Missoula did as well. So we think that there's some really good uh, hard information in the report that you can look at that will help you to understand not only the housing problem that we have here in Anchorage, but also some ways that we can fix it. So when you look at the incentives that were offered, um, one of the other things that we did is we broke those incentives into categories to try to make it easy to understand. And so you'll see financial, process, zoning, and, and then of course sustainable uh, attainability is the last one. So what are the takeaways from the study? Um, I, I think that financially, one of the things that we need to do in Anchorage is we need to develop a, an area-wide tax incentive for multifamily housing. Um, right now we have specific targeted areas, and I'm gonna show you a map here in a second as to where those are, but we did an area-wide area tax incentives for multifamily so that we get more multifamily infill in some of the neighborhoods. <coughs> Excuse me. We also need to uh, come up with a way to help fund infrastructure for builders for single family home developments. Uh, I've heard numbers as high as 35 or 40% of the cost of building a house is putting in the roads and the sidewalks and the sewer and, the, and all of the utilities. Well, those are all things that we're gonna own as a city, not the builder. And we should come up with a way to fund those um, for development, not for the builder, but for our population so that we can afford to buy homes. And then um, we also should form a housing land trust. One of the things that you'll, you'll see in the study we talk about <clears throat> at length is the housing land trust, what it does is it picks up pieces, it picks up land and then it makes it a land available for first time home buyers on a deed restriction so that John can buy a home because he's a first time home buyer with his wife and then he can sell it five years later, but he's not allowed to sell it and realize the entire profit. He's able to realize a small portion of that so that it keeps that house affordable, so that when it resells, it has that same deed restriction on it so that the next person five years later can buy it at that attainable or that affordable range so that he can be a first time home buyer. For most of us um, in this room, your house is the largest purchase you're ever gonna make. Now I know I see some boat owners out there and I know your wives probably think that that's the largest purchase you ever made, but Homeownership is, is really key to building personal wealth for families. And what we're doing right now, again, is we're hurting that 25 to 40 year old age group in our house, in our population by not allowing that. So in addition to the financial incentives, we need to come up with some zoning incentives. Um, we're not, I'm not a zoning expert by any stretch of the imagination, don't wanna pretend I am, but in talking to builders and in looking through the report, because we also talk to local builders, we need to deal with setbacks so we can get, we can build larger density, more density on those lots. We also need to look at Title 21 reform. Everybody I talk to, every builder you talk to talks about Title 21 reform and, and ways in which that drives up the cost of construction. Procedural, I think that we should, and this isn't a new idea, so those of you who've been around for more than a day have heard this suggested multiple times and that is that we need a housing liaison officer, but we need a housing liaison at the municipality who isn't a clerk. It's someone who has the ability to deal with managers and directors and people at the level that they can actually get things done. Somebody who can manage the incentives uh, and work with the builders to help get them through the process that can promote our incentives and encourage builders to build. And then we also need to reduce our time to permitting. You know, there's a lot of talk about uh, permitting department and planning and all of the challenges that we have there. 
And those, it, it's easy to blame your problems on someone else, but that is, you know, if you look at the housing pie and what it takes to construct and to, you know, all the way from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, that is only one small part of it. All right, there's a lot of other things that go into it. Community councils have an impact on the process. There's a lot of things. So we need to find a way to help reduce the time to permit whatever that is. And I think that some of the plan that the assembly's got and some of the things that we're working on are gonna do just that. So thank you very much. I just wanna say thank you for giving us an opportunity. Really quickly, you can find all current incentives in the marketplace at uh, acda.net. They're listed here. This is a map that shows you where all the incentives areas are available here in the city. And then if you need to get a hold of us, here's my contact info. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And I really encourage folks to read the report. Um, and I think that was a great summary. Um, I want to just share qu quick takeaways before we get to our questions. Um, but I also want to say, if you have a question, these are the little blue cards. Um, go ahead and hold it up, and then staff are walking around to collect them. And then, of course, um, we're going to keep moving after that. But if you have uh, other questions or you really want to uh, pull someone aside and ask, ask some more details, um, you can find them throughout the day during our breaks. Um, and then. Uh, so a couple of uh, takeaways from both of these presentations to think about. Uh, one is that housing is a big complex problem. I think we know that there's a lot of technical aspects to it. I see some eyes glazing over. We'll get more into kind of how some of these policy pieces uh, interact in real life and look at some real world examples this afternoon. Um, but really just to say this is something we have to attack from multiple angles. Another one is that we're not alone. So we have uh, examples of other case studies of cities, not just that are similar to us in some ways, but also who have been able to make some progress and to um, actually get more housing built. I also want to um, observe that those four case studies, all of them are university towns. We are also a university town. We have a great student population. Um, it brings a lot of energy and vitality and um, intellectual curiosity and, and research to the city. Um, so, so just to think about kind of the ways that we're similar to those other places, even though in some ways they're different. And then also, uh, we have the power to change things. So that's really what today is about. It's not about dwelling on all of the problems. We need to understand them. We need to understand that we have the power to solve um, some of those problems, and then that's where we can focus our energy. So with that, um, we will turn to questions. I want to um, invite Nolan and Mike uh, to stay on the stage, and then uh, we will just let you guys uh, take them as you like. Um, yeah, come on up. Um, so the first one is from online, and it is, how can Anchorage ensure efforts to make attainable and low-income housing is spread equitably throughout our community? Who would like to take that one? I'll try it first. So uh, I think that one of the ways that we can, sure, we can ensure that um, our housing incentives are spread equitably across the community is to do for example, one of the ideas that we put forth, which is the housing trust. That, that is one way to ensure that the young people in our population, those that are just starting their careers, um, anyone who is in that lower income bracket has an opportunity to buy a first time home because those are the things that are out of reach right now. And so I think that's one of the things is some sort of a housing land trust that focuses on single family homes. Yeah, and I, I like what I like what Mike answered there. I think that that's a, a really important way to look at it. I, one thing that I that I would really emphasize about housing is that more is, the more housing is like if we're if we're being really crude and, uh, and blunt about it, more housing across the board is the solution to affordability. Um, even even very expensive houses getting built is in good for affordability for the overall housing market. But that being said, um, it is much better to see. A variety of price points getting built, and so I think it, it's good to see some amount of housing that might be in the form of something that's that if targeting like the the starter home type of demographic, and maybe more like townhomes. Also, to not neglecting rental housing too, because there are you always need a certain amount of rental housing for people that are um, not ready to own a home or that are more um, you know mobile and moving to a place for the first time for a variety of reasons. Rental housing is really important. So so putting um, you know emphasizing sort of a broad range of housing types. Yeah, thank you. All right, next question coming from the room. Um, construction costs. So what can we do to build public infrastructure to support new development? You take that one first. Um, the answer is have Mike do it. Uh, no, I, um, I think I, I do think that that um, you know we we do tend to have a model of development you know in in Anchorage and and it's and really in a lot of Alaska where we put a lot of 
costs onto the developer to build a lot of the site infrastructure. And so a lot of them are burdened with building infrastructure that's actually going to benefit more than just the property that they make, um, you know, having to rebuild, for instance, roads that are used by many other users besides people on their development. And so I, I think that looking at some kinds of, of, of special funds that might be available to build that, um, it's not just a giveaway cost. There's a, there's a return on this kind of investment. If you build property that increases the tax base of Anchorage, increases revenue to the city, then, um, then and, and you make an investment in order to make that happen, that's, that's not a giveaway, and that's, that's a good thing. And I think we need to take a little bit more of an investment type of mindset to that site infrastructure. I was going to say let Nolan do it, but I think that uh, I think you're absolutely correct. I think that establishment of some sort of an infrastructure bank, there's no reason that 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 our city should expect builders to put roads in and sidewalks, obviously when they're building a development. But but we can recover the cost of some sort of an infrastructure bank where we we make that money available for them to rebuild. In the example of water and sewer, for example, that money is going to come back to us in the form of payment to AWWU. We're going to recover that money, and so it's not a cost, it's an investment, and that was what I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, the next question is about uh, land availability. So do we need all of our vacant industrial land, and then can Heritage Land Bank make more land available? So I think generally kind of the idea that we see these vacant properties around town, each one has a different story, how can we really be accessing more of that land that isn't built on yet? So. I, I, you know, uh, one of the things I neglected to say during my presentation is that we have to focus on things we can fix. We, we can't fix a problem by focusing on, for example, the cost of wood or the cost of uh, transport. We have to focus on things we can fix. And to a certain extent, land is one of those things. We can only focus on the land that we've got available to us. Yes, there are probably parcels of land, and I know that Heritage Land Bank just had an open house to look at developing some of their vacant parcels. Uh, but there's a process that we go through, and there's a reason we have something like Heritage Land Bank. It's designed to protect, for example, if we hadn't had it 15 years or 20 years ago to accumulate this land that it has now, we wouldn't even have that resource to try to apply to this problem. And so we have to remember that for future generations, too. So it would be great to go raid all of the Heritage Land land, bank, land but, but then what, is, what does my son do when they have this problem with, for his kids? in 35 years. And so we have to think long term. We didn't get here. Uh, it, you know, it hasn't been a problem that occurred in two years. This is a problem that's got here through decades of poor planning and poor processes here in Alaska. So I think that, yes, we can use Heritage Land Bank land. I think there's things we can do. The federal government still owns land right in the center of our city. One of the largest plots of land is owned by the feds. We need to apply pressure to them. So there's lots of places to get land, but the infrastructure we talked about is one of the ways we can help break that loose too. Yeah, and I think I think the infrastructure funding, like as we've already talked about, is one of those important things that we can that we might have be able to have some amount of control over that would make undeveloped land more economical. I, th I think another thing to look at too is the way um, zoning, you know, the the complete you know separation of uses between business, you know, between commercial and residential and so on. I, I think it's it, that some there's some logic for doing it that way, but I think there are also is this whole idea of mixed use development that we have a little bit of in Anchorage um, that makes a lot of sense. So we don't necessarily have to segregate off whole parts of the city, say no residential allowed here, you know, there, especially in, in places like in downtown Anchorage or other places, it makes a lot of sense to have, you know, um, what about those five over one style developments, you know, you have street front retail um, with, with living units above them. Th there's, these things are, are, you know, not common in Anchorage, but we don't have to necessarily radically segregate all uses like that. There are cases when mixed use development makes a lot of sense. That helps make better use of the land that's there, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, next one, um, we'll stay on the development topic for the moment. So uh, what is being discussed and directed toward downtown or midtown in terms of multi-resident, 10-story, uh, you know, lar larger complexes like those seen in uh, South Korea, Japan, places in Asia, and I'll say also other American cities? Okay. <laughs> I was trying to be polite there. <laughs> I don't know if I could speak to it either other than to say that um, downtown is the most expensive area of the city to develop in. It's the most expensive land. It's the most expensive per square foot. 
So to look towards multi -high, to look towards high rises in downtown is, to, is for solving our housing problem. I don't think is realistic. There's height restrictions that are placed on in current zoning on lots that might be able to help us with that. But there are, of course, there's there are projects being worked on in downtown for multifamily housing. But this feeds into one of the topics that you guys we were talking about earlier, which was the short-term rental problem we have. So if there's 400, uh, 400 to 600, whatever, short-term rentals in the marketplace right now, the only reason those exist is because we don't have enough hotel rooms during the summer. So our tourist industry has grown so much that we need more hotel rooms. If there were, if an, if an owner of a property could, couldn't make m way more money leasing those out during the summer than he could all year round having a lease, he wouldn't do it. I remember when I was a kid growing up here and I wanted to lease an apartment, we always had to sign a 12-month lease because that owner did not want that apartment empty during the wintertime. So he would make us take a longer-term lease. And those have gone up by the wayside as a result of the short-term rental. So I think that we have to be cautious about how we address the short-term rental, but we also need more hotel rooms because that will free up some of this inventory. And we also need to, to look at developing more multifamily units, which is something that we are doing right now. Okay. Actually, so we now have twice the tech, so you can hold on to that. Um, so next question is around attainability, so and really affordability. So we've talked a lot about building new housing, reusing housing. Um, so this question is, uh, my children are in the military, so they're able to buy a home with zero down. You know, there's a lot of good um, home buying programs for uh, military and veterans. Um, is it possible to extend that or duplicate a t that type of benefit to our police, our fire, uh, school district, other muni employees? And I think maybe broadly too, is there is there a way to extend that benefit to more folks? Um, and so that's really the question. And, and I'll turn that to you guys, but I'll also mention um, the assembly has been focusing on things that we can do, right, our local policy, but we're also really trying to be good advocates for the city at other levels. And so one thing that we're looking at is a, a federal bill, I believe it's called the Helper Act, and it proposes to have basically a, an accessible mortgage program for teachers, first responders, some other types of folks. So that would be a federal mortgage program that, that allows access to those things. So that's just a bill that's been introduced in Congress. Um, obviously, we know that's not moving right now, <laughs> um, but, but that's the kind of thing that we can also say that's beyond the scope of our city. So I just want to offer that as other options and other ways that we as a community and as um, policy leaders can be effective, even if it's something that we can't have direct control over. Um, but on that point, um, are there ways that we could institute local programs or, or are there discussions at other levels? So I'll see if you guys have thought. I can't speak as much to the financing and what it takes to create, you know, these kinds of specialized finance programs. A lot of the ones that I'm aware of are at the federal level, you know, and they have larger financial resources sort of behind them uh, to make them happen. One thing I will say, though, is that, uh, uh, is that you know, programs that require no, no money down, it's, it's good to have these kinds of options available, like not to have to put money down and so on, but, but those are also saddling people with a bigger payment, right, and less equity in their home. And so they're, they're, not, um, they're not a complete, they're not a full blessing. I mean, I think it's, it's good to have the options out there for people to assess for their individual circumstances, but I don't see them as necessarily that much of a fix for the kind of affordability issues that we're seeing uh, in, in, you know, here in Anchorage and, and, and elsewhere. So I do think that there's an issue sometimes of people who are more money constrained, um, giving them, getting them into a house that has a bigger payment, um, sometimes it's a mixed blessing. Yeah, I think you're, you're correct. And I think that, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, which is we should focus on the things we can affect. It's not I don't believe we should expect the assembly or the administration to put together a zero down, zero interest program for new home buyers, unless we're gonna build them on our land with our builders, because that, that's a private enterprise thing and I don't think we should mix with that. What we could do though, for example, is if we lack teachers for the school district, we could offer, as a city, we could offer $10,000 bonuses to those teachers to move to Alaska that they could use for their down payment. But, but I don't think we should get in the middle of the transaction between a bank and a finance company and the home buyer because as Nolan said, all we're doing is increasing the payment and making, you know, who knows if they can do it or not. So I think that the issue is to look at other ways we can affect housing inventory and bring the cost down. More inventory, prices go down. Thank you, and we'll do one more question, and I think um, this will end on a, on a positive note. Um, 
cooperatively owned housing, so spe again, speaking to attainability, affordability, cooperatively owned housing can be an incredible way to empower residents and shield from the speculative market. How can we support those new and current efforts? And I'm going to turn to Mike for that one. So this is one of the suggestions we made was a housing land trust. So for example, we could work with the Heritage Land Bank and we could acquire some land and then we could prepare that land for development. We could put out the RFP, bring builders in, have them build smaller, more attainable houses, not, you know, hold their costs down. Maybe we give them a permit holiday for building on that. We don't charge them for, we, we help them maintain and lower many of their expenses so they can build them less expensively. And then through deed restrictions, we just make that neighborhood or subdivision available over and over again as people churn through that housing. But again, the biggest solution, I believe, is inventory, as Nolan said, at all levels. The more inventory we build, the more affordable housing is. So we have to figure out and focus on the things that we can control. Focus on those things and we'll be successful. Thank you. All right. Thank you both so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, so next up, we are excited to welcome members of the UAA Hunger and Homelessness Support Network to present their research on housing and food insecurity among UAA students. In addition to the research conducted at UAA, our community relies on the university and higher education institutions to develop an educated workforce equipped with the skills and knowledge necessary for our city to thrive. And let me tell you, we on the assembly talk about workforce all of the time. From high school graduates to mid-career professionals with families at home, UAA student experiences inform their aspirations and future contributions. Travis Hedwig and Ray Shimizu are, are both researchers at UAA and serve in the UAA Hunger and Homelessness Support Network, a self-described ragtag group of faculty and staff working to understand housing and food insecurity at UAA. Travis and Ray, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much for having us. I wanna just give a quick shout out and a thanks to everybody that helped make this happen. Like Ali back there who invited us, everybody that did the work on the back end to help make this a good experience for everybody. Let's give it up for the sound guys. Come on, no love for the sound guys, come on. Uh, what do I have to do to call up the presentation? Oh, there it is. So, as was described, our goal today is to present some of the findings that we've been uh, conducting here on the UAA campus. Some of you might be asking why the campus. Um, some of you are talking about what it means to prepare the next generation. What does it mean to create pathways into community? Um, what we're seeing out in the community is very much mirrored here on our campus. Um, this is a national trend that is very much we're experiencing here in Anchorage as well. And I'd like to share with you some of the data that we have to show that. My name is Travis Hedwig. I'm the Assistant Dean with the Division of Population Health Sciences. We have Ray Shimizu, Ruby Freed, and uh, who could not be with us today is Kathy Trauber, who is a co-author and major contributor to this work as well. Thanks. Um, what we're doing right now with the Hunger and Homelessness Support Network is really framing this large, not so much housing or food per se, but a total cluster of basic needs. That includes, of course, food and housing, but also caregiving, transportation, uh, and other things that uh, students require to do well and succeed. We also really take as a foundational tenet that student success is much more than academic and requires consideration of all these aspects of basic needs, reflecting on that at an institutional level, and uh, trying to create those inroads across all spaces on campus. Um, as I said, this is a national trend right now. A survey in 2020 found that 58% of US college students experience some kind of basic needs in security. We know that this lowers GPA, has major impacts on uh, success, health and well-being, increased rates of depression, stress, anxiety, uh, decreased likelihood of completing a degree. It affects all of our numbers, retention, completion, uh, uh, graduation into a job, all kinds of other things. Um, the prevalence significantly is higher among marginalized or underrepresented communities. We have over 100 languages spoken in the Anchorage School District alone. We have to reflect on that diversity. Um, I'll just 
briefly talk about this because I've got the food experts here to my left, but uh, food security is a national focus right now. We've got various definitions, food and agriculture, uh, U.S. food and agriculture definitions uh, ranging from high food security to very low food security. Um, we have students on our campus that have reported, I'll show you the numbers in a minute, somewhere in the ballpark of 45 to 50 percent of students on our campus have reported struggling to have basic needs met, including food. It, reporting things like stealing food, skipping meals, uh, concern about making tuition uh, so that they might uh, come up with other, other strategies like uh, sharing meals, attending meals on campus, finding other spaces where food might be available. We know that this is also a trend nationally in 2021, thank you, 10% of U.S. households were, were food insecure. In 2021, 44% of those attending two-year schools, 32% at four-year schools experiencing some kind of food insecurity during college. For housing, not too much better. Difficulty paying rent, mortgage, utility bills, moving frequently, lack of housing stability. We have data on um, students' debt aversion, uh, to what extent you might be willing to put uh, your tuition on a credit card, uh, to what extent uh, you might be so concerned that you couldn't make rent that you couldn't attend class, and maybe didn't have pathways to speak with people at the institution to come up with alternatives for your, to help you succeed. We know following the McKinney-Vinto Homelessness Assistance Act definition that housing uh, homelessness includes a lack of a fixed, regular, adequate place to sleep. There's all kinds of expressions of that here on our campus, including showing up on the parking lots. We consider uh, our parking uh, services here on campus to be one of our really core partners in the housing and homelessness support network. We know that students sometimes crash in their cars in the parking lots. Um, parking services has come to the table. We've done peanut butter and jelly drives. We've done things where uh, for a certain period of time, this month, November, is National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Month. Uh, parking tickets donated to some of uh, these causes, like our food pantry uh, and others. Again, we know this is a phenomenon nationally, and we very much know that it's also a phenomenon on our campus. This is really the stuff I wanted to share. In 2016, Kathy Traver and I uh, analyzed FAFSA data, free application for federal student aid, which was, to our knowledge, the only systematic way housing insecurity was being collected nationally. Uh, what we found that of the people that filled out a FAFSA in 2017, approximately 1% um, had indicated an experience with raw homelessness, not housing insecurity, raw homelessness as defined by McKinney-Vinto. We knew we were onto something. We created a basic needs survey. We consulted with the California State University System and the Wisconsin Hope Lab to develop a basic needs survey on our campus. That survey went out to 3,000 uh, degree-seeking students. Uh, and what we found on the far left-hand side, on our campus, 44% reported food insecurity, 30% housing insecurity, 8.3% raw homelessness. We attempted to replicate that survey in 2019. Uh, we had some challenges because the earthquake got in the way, uh, but we did, for the most part, confirm some of those findings, 36%, 37%, and 10% raw homelessness went up the second time we ran the survey. Um, a lot of questions we get recently to what extent COVID has affected these patterns. Uh, COVID appears to not have affected the pattern all that much. It seems to have hold. Um, so you can see on the far right, post-COVID, two-year schools, 44% and 32% respectively for food insecurity, uh, going all the way down to 14 and 14 respectively for raw homelessness. Um, what we did here was publish this study in the Journal of Social Distress and the Homeless. We connected with scholars at the Cal State System and the Wisconsin Hope Lab. Uh, we, we borrowed from their bank of questions and sort of hybridized that to make it fit for our student body. And again, those, um, you can see on the bottom those findings were published. Um, as I said, the second study found that we have a significant number of students using personal consumer debt to finance their education. So major implications for creating pathways to known institutions and supports on this campus. Do we have a financial aid office? Who can help me navigate the shoals of the paperwork process? 79% of students uh, reported receiving some kind of aid, but of those, 65%, it didn't cover their expenses. 79%, it didn't cover living or educational. Um, and 27% reported that they were getting into uncomfortable debt situations, uh, having to swipe their tuition. 
Uh, this led to a grassroots effort on campus that led to the Hunger and Homelessness Support Network. It used to be just a, just a random assortment of people on campus that cared. And around this time, we came together as a camp campus-wide entity uh, doing some grassroots initiatives in this work. In 2018, the Food Insecurity Working Group and Housing Working Group came together and formed the Hunger and Homelessness Support Network. We do outreach and awareness, research and policy work. We run a food pantry, and emergency housing is one of our major initiatives this year, working with some of our, um, our dormitories, which are now at capacity. Uh, with that, I want to hand it over to the food people. Hi, this is food person number one, since you keep referring to us as food people. I'm um, so good to be here. It's really an honor to present um, to all of you. Shout out to District 5, which is where I live right now. Um, but we really want to talk about the food pantry and also something that, Mike, you presented on earlier, sharing your story about your son really resonated because young adults defined as ages 18 to 34 are one of the most neglected age groups in the United States because they do not qualify for a lot of the support systems um, like SNAP, um, right? For example, full-time students do not qualify for SNAP unless they meet certain very specific requirements. And so food insecurity is so important to think about. Um, and 18 to 34-year-olds, too, also, if you control for these public assistance measures, experience the highest level of financial difficulties and challenges, which I think um, is reflected also in the housing insecurity. So as we go into talking about this, I asked Dr. Ruby Freed to come and other members of the food pantry because this work cannot be done by ourselves. I also recognize Jennifer Spencer. I know you're back there, Summer Sweet, you're here. We're all part of the HHSN work and we all do this together. Um, so the seafood, the seafood, sea wolf food pantry <laughs> is what I was gonna say, um, is the food pantry that is run on campus. You see a picture here. This is Dr. Amanda Walsh who could not be here today, but she really led the charge in starting this. Um, and in the summer of 2019, there was a soft launch and then a full launch, and we started collecting data on who is using the food pantry. I also want to hand it off to Dr. Ruby Freed because she is also a food person, um, and she is the coordinator of the volunteers, and, and without them, we would not have the operation. So I'm going to hand it to you for a sec. So we have, are you sure this is mine? Okay. Um, so we, we've been collecting some really great information. Um, by collecting this information, it's not just to share with people like you, but also to allow our operations to continue to improve and make sure we're serving folks who um, need to be served. So about half of the folks that we're serving um, over the past year uh, are freshmen and uh, uh, and about, uh, oh, and sophomores, sorry. Ooh, I did not make these slides, sorry. Um, so uh, about half are really starting out in their educational journey here at UAA, and we know that that is important for retaining students. Um, about 80% are full-time students, and the same number live off of campus. Um, the average household size is about 2.4. Um, and that includes not only other students living with people, but students with children as well. We serve a, quite a few number of students with children. Um, most of our students hear about the food pantry by flyers and the school newsletter and um, word of mouth from friends. And over the last year, we've had 82 individual people who've utilized the food pantry um, a total of 239 times. So this is a clear need, and this was our soft rollout, really, our first full year of having um, the food pantry open to students on campus. Thank you. So I won't go through this data because I think I'm also cognizant of the time, it's 1043 right now, but just wanted to highlight that we do have national level data talking about how dietary quality is also the lowest for the young adult age group. So the lowest bar here, um, 47.81, it's 18 to 34 year olds, their dietary quality is the lowest. Um, we also know that food security is uh, lowest for the 18 to 34 year olds as well. So food insecurity is also associated with low dietary quality. And if you think about the health outcomes that that is related to, it's really important that we are providing students with this food. Um, 
we also talked about the intersectionality of these issues. We also know that this high bar, um, this is the highest score of clinical depression um, that was found among those who are food insecure. Um, so it all relates, it's all about well-being. And then thinking about the stress that students have of, do I pay rent this month or do I buy groceries? Like, they're making these hard choices on how to spend their money, right? Do I have heat this month or do, right? So like, they're making really hard choices. And so really thinking about how the food pantry can alleviate and mitigate some of that stress. Um, and I will hand this off to you. I'll wrap it up, I know we're out of time. Um, this is just a small list. I know that I haven't captured all of it, but we're thinking about creating a single point of contact. A student comes to an office and gets connected instantly with somebody who can walk them through all manner of supports that are available in this institution in the area of basic needs. As I said before, we have a lot of uh, uh, partners, even uh, uh, uncommon partners like the parking services folks. And I'm sure I'm missing some people here too, I apologize. Um, I just want to finish up by saying the whole point of doing this today is what we're seeing out in the community really is mirrored here on this campus. Prioritizing basic needs is essential to fulfilling the promise of higher education. As I said, student success is so much more than just academic. And these are the folks that we're going to be setting out into the world into conditions of known material insecurity. So let's have this conversation. Let's think about campus and community engagements, hopefully, uh, even after this week is over. Um, increased funding, yes, that's part of it, but it's not just funding. We need system-wide approaches. We need the single point of contact. There are good models out there. There's the um, Basic Needs Center at Oregon State University, Cal State, doing all kinds of interesting things in response to similar challenges. We can learn from one another. Um, are we busily reinforcing some of the structures of privilege uh, or, or, or stifling pathways to equity? What students are we talking about? Whose success are we talking about? Educational and op occupational opportunity should be possible for all, and the, and the whole purpose of higher education is to achieve exactly that. Uh, and to do that, we need principles of, of universal design in higher education in our community. We have to continue to work together to create these pathways to success for our students. We can work on every single one of these problems, and with your commitment and help, I know we can. Thank you. Yeah, let's have a great hand for our researchers and also practitioners who are part of the solution. Thank you so much for being here and sharing this. Um, just a couple observations before we uh, break, take a short break. Um, oh yeah, go ahead guys, <laughs> no worries. Um, this is really hard data to look at, and I don't mean hard as in numbers, I mean it's difficult to sit with. Um, and, and when I first looked at this presentation, it, was, it, it really struck me. Because just thinking about, um, you know, I was a college student about, I guess, 20 years ago now. Um, and I can remember how stressful school was. I remember that whole experience of, you know, you joke about being a poor college student. You, you hunt around for all the free food on campus, right? Like we, you know, those of us who <laughs> went through that system did that. Um, but when I imagine the stress of school, the thing I didn't have to experience myself is I wasn't also stressed about where I was going to make rent especially during finals week or during um, you know, that, that really stressful time in the semester. Uh, may, maybe you have to think about that the same day that your papers do, your term paper, and that's really what's gonna make your grade. And then imagine on top of that, you skipped breakfast every week or every day of the week, which didn't really set you up for that 8 a.m. class, right? So, so all of these things really, um, the lived experience of the students on this campus, many of the, too many of the students, it, is not good right now, and it's, and it's because Again, a lot of our, our larger community systems, our ability to, um, to house people, all of those things matter. You know, there's folks living in their cars, we heard, in, in the parking lots around this campus. So, so we shouldn't ignore those things. We should really sit with them, but we should also not feel powerless to address them. And so, um, so I really encourage, if you have questions, please seek out the researchers. Um, we, we provided all the materials online, um, and we know that this is really, this is a really serious problem, and just to acknowledge that a lot of the folks who are most affected by this problem are not in the room because they're working, because they're in class, because they're taking care of their kids. So, so again, this is an everyone problem, um, but we can do something about it. So with that, we're gonna take a break, um, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna hear some good news. We're gonna hear about things that are already working in our community and solutions that we're already pursuing or have already put in place. So uh, it's about 10.50, I think, so we're gonna come back at five after 11, so 15 minutes. Again, bathrooms are down there. 
coffee shop upstairs. There's still some snacks uh, for breakfast, and feel free to mingle. We'll call you back at 5 after 11.
Check. All right, folks, so we have about five minutes before we come back. So if folks want to start making their way to their seats, we're going to get started in about five minutes.
Okay. All right, folks, let's go ahead and take our seats. We're going to get started again. So as the findings of ACDA's report show, hold on, I'm going to pause for a minute while folks take their seats. We're going to get started. Don't want us to fall behind schedule. Got a packed agenda today. Cool, thank you. <laughs> the enforcers. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So uh, as I'm reminded, this is going to be our last session before lunch. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a, a break for lunch, and then we'll have our keynote as well. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a chance to talk with folks here soon. So as the findings of ACDA's report show, the problem is bigger than any one solution. We have a lot of policy lovers, financial lovers, that we can and should be pulling. And Anchorage is already working hard to implement a variety of policy changes that create an environment that is kinder to new and infill development. In the past year, with help from municipal staff, and a huge shout out to our staff, we ask so much from our planning staff, and um, we probably drive them crazy sometimes, but thank you so much. Um, the assembly has eliminated parking minimums, made it easier to build accessory dwelling units, simplified the process to convert hotels to housing, and funded repairs to abandoned buildings to bring more housing back online. We are also currently reviewing proposed legislation to make it easier to build three and four plexes, track short-term rentals, and simplify residential zoning. In this next session, Homegrown Solutions at Work, we'll hear from community members about how some of those recent policy changes are turning the tides. Each panelist has five minutes to describe the policy change and how it's impacted recent projects. After each panelist has finished, we'll again turn to questions from the audience. So pull up Slido or grab a pen so that we can collect your questions as the presentations unfold. Yeah, thank you, Felix. Um, so I will just briefly introduce the panelists. And then I know uh, if, if Connie's out there, um, come up on, on the stage. We might have one more panelist coming. Um, and then we'll, we'll have you go through and share the great work that you're doing and how it relates to, as we said, some recent policy changes. Um, so first we have Laquita Chimilowski. She's a senior land use planning manager at Dowell, a local planning firm. And uh, uh, sorry, a leading planning, surveying, civil and transportation, bridge, construction support, and environmental services firm. Next we, on the stage, we have Jason Bockenstedt. He is executive director of the Anchorage Affordable Housing and Land Trust. Or, yeah, sorry, Housing and Land Trust, a nonprofit organization which aims to provide affordable housing for low and extremely low income residents. Next we have Chris, oh sorry, actually we have, uh, I'll do Karen Bronga. She is a uh, retired teacher and currently serves as one of our Anchorage Assembly members representing District 5 East Anchorage. Uh, next we have Chris Schutte, principal of Capricom Alaska, a consultancy that supports economic and community development in the private and public sectors. And then lastly on stage we have Jacques Annandale, the capital assets manager at Anchorage Water and Wastewater Utility, or AWWU. And then I'll just note, uh, if we are joined by Connie Oshimura, she is the owner of uh, owner and broker of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Alaska Realty, a major local land developer. And sh uh, her story is the one that uh, Jacques will also be telling. Um, so thank you again for being here today. And Laquita, go ahead and take it away. And then we'll pass the mic down the way. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use the new parking requirements on the uh, Moose's Two South development, which is in the old Lamex building at Diamond and King Street. And so when we started this project, it was prior to the new code being adopted. And so we were looking at having to provide 81 parking spaces um, as part of the redevelopment of the Lamex. And the project consisted of a few building additions and then putting in like new landscape islands um, and some improvements. And because we know the popularity of Moose's Tooth, we wanted to make sure that we provided adequate parking. So we were actually planning for 99 parking spaces on site. So this site plan just shows you what our original design looked like. 
As we started into the redevelopment project, what we found was that we had a storm drain system that never worked properly, um, and it also needed to be upgraded to meet new requirements. We also found that the fire protection system in the building could not be renovated. It had to be completely replaced. And so all of these things increase the cost. And they're not things that the owner would have known going in. So it started to look like this project wasn't necessarily viable because all of these things, along with some other stuff that they found, was almost a million dollars in, in cost. <clears throat> so then the new parking, uh, requirements came into play and we looked at how we could utilize that to help this development continue forward. And so we came up with a creative solution to phase the construction of the parking. So the area that's highlighted in yellow is the first phase of parking and it included the storm drain infrastructure improvements um, and landscaping improvements along with accessible parking spaces and sidewalks around the building. And then the area that's unhighlighted is still paved and will be able to be utilized, but it'll be the second phase. And so what this does is it allows the owner to get the building up and running and have revenue coming in so that they can afford to do that second phase, but also provide adequate parking so that they don't become a problem with their neighbors. And so to me, the biggest takeaway was that this is really a tool that we can use in creative ways to keep projects moving forward and make sure that they're viable. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I'm going to actually talk a little bit uh, as well about uh, the, the change in parking requirements and what that's going to allow us to do at um, one of our uh, properties that, that we are turning into uh, low and extremely low income permanent housing. But I, I will just say that I, I can also talk uh, uh, at length about uh, the the importance of of the, these hotels being converted into uh, low low income and and permanent permanent housing. Uh, once the the Barrett Inn actually opens here uh, fully in the next uh, several weeks, uh, the the trust that I work for would have opened 271 units within the last year, and we expect to be uh, actually full. Um, at the Barrett within the next couple of weeks as well, uh, mainly because as of uh, last week, uh, we have a, a wait list of folks that have applied to live at one of our uh, properties of over 250 individuals. So there's maybe another 70 off of that list that will be able to get housing. So once 271 new units within the last year have been filled, we're still gonna have a wait list of over 150 uh, individuals. So the need is, is certainly there um, for you know, low and extremely low income housing. But uh, to what I wanted to just mention, this is kind of an aerial view of the Baird Inn, which is right off of Spinard. Uh, this is, uh, again, going to be 96 uh, units uh, once, once it's fully uh, renovated. Uh, the current number of parking spaces that we, that we have at this location, though, are just over 60. So under the old parking code, like, we still wouldn't have even al been allowed uh, to probably open this up as permanent housing because there wouldn't have been enough parking spots. But what we're finding, especially in that low and extremely low income category, is a, a lot of them use public transportation. They take the bus. They take cabs. Um, you know, uh, about one in every 10, maybe one in every 15 individuals that live at one of our properties actually have a vehicle. So the need for this much parking uh, was, was totally unnecessary. And as you can see, I mean, it's just a lot of pavement, a lot of concrete. It doesn't look very nice, right? Uh, everyone, you know, doesn't, doesn't like this. So one of the things that we're gonna be allowed to do as a result of the, the change in the, or the elimination of the parking requirements is really transform this 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 property and really make it, uh, you know, fit for what we want it to be used for. There will be still be roughly 40 parking spots for individuals that work there, for people that live there. But as you can see, we're going to actually make this a really nice indoor and outdoor spot for residents that live there. So you know, in the in the summertime. There's going to be plenty of spots to be able to sit outside if you want to have a barbecue. Uh, same, same in the wintertime. I mean, obviously it's colder, but there'll be locations for folks to go. So again, I think this is just one more example of, of 
the kind of those changes that can really impact what does housing look and feel like in our community, especially at a property that, you know, ha had just a lot of concrete before. So with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm sitting up here with the A team. <laughs> but um, I was asked to talk today because uh, my husband and I, uh, when we retired, well, right before we retired, instead of, uh, oops, wrong way, instead of um, downsizing, we upsized. And uh, short story to that, we had been living at a home where to the north, the person really, really loved to the south, the person really, really loved trees. We lived to the north. We couldn't grow a garden. We wore coats all summer. So we bought this house because there was not one single tree in the yard or next door, but it was on the park, and the trees were there if we wanted them. <laughs> so anyway, the house was way too big. Um, we, My husband and I decided that with 90-year-old parents, we would eventually, someone would fall and break a hip and need to go somewhere. So we took the rec room that um, was not utilized and there was a bathroom downstairs with a closet and we um, were able to turn the closet into a really nice shower and we ended up having this space and waiting for one of my parents to need to go there. Um, they're very independent, and um, it was kind of a hell no on this. And so um, it just sat there idle, and then we started hearing about accessible accessory dwelling units and reading up on them and trying to figure out if we could turn this into one. And um, I may not be the best researcher, but we did a lot of work trying to figure out how to make this legal and ended up coming up with, well, I, I looked through my Google history, and and it was really like two days of this, I got really cu uh, curious about how to do this right when I was running for assembly, but I could not find, there was tons of information if you happened to have, if you were going to build one from scratch, um, but when you have one that's internal to your home, the mother-in-law apartment type thing, um, it was a little trickier, and we had first read that you had to have like a one-hour fire door, and um, like the utilities had to be separate. And then we realized if it's free-flowing, we could rent it. But then I figured there had to be something else, and so um, I couldn't find it, so we just got a business license and started renting the place. And um, the this moral to this story is we've had a teacher who um, lived there, and we had a social worker, and we currently have um, a campfire director that works at one of the schools. It's very affordable to them. It's private. It's within our home, but they have their own entrance. It's private. And um, we need to find a way to make, there's other people like me who have this space that don't know how to go forward with it. And I thought I had the holy grail yesterday. Uh, I found a paper that said, uh, an affidavit of owner occupancy, but we don't have to be an owner occupied <laughs> space anymore. So I still don't know if we're doing it right, and you might someone's going to come after me. But we do have a business license. But uh, let me know. <laughs> Lance is taking notes. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Schutte. Um I'm a private consultant that had the pleasure of working, uh, being a municipal employee in the past, and working in the field of community development. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, one of the housing types that we certainly don't see in production uh, very much at all anymore that used to be pretty prevalent throughout our community, and that is the triplex and the fourplex. Um, I, as an introduction to this, I'm going to reference back to some earlier presentations that you heard from uh, Mr. Robbins and Mr. Clouda, who talked about um, the, the housing preferences of our community uh, as expressed in surveys over the years, which almost always you know, seem to say the same thing. Uh, people are interested in seeing more diversity in the housing options out there. Not everybody wants a snout house, and not everybody wants to live in an apartment. Uh, people are interested in, in affordable housing, which is why we're here today, and one of the easiest ways to help address affordability is to provide more housing across the board of all types, including triplexes and fourplexes. 
Um, but it's been problematic. And, and the single biggest reason why is that of the various codes that builders and developers have to work with, both zoning codes and building codes, there is this trigger point at which a higher standard is, is applied to triplexes and fourplexes that has really made them uneconomic over the, over the past 20 years, uh, which is why you're not seeing very many of them built. Um, we uh, were participate, I was part of a team of municipal employees, private sector um, builders and others who've been participating in a, in a working group for I feel like a year and a half, but it's probably only been six months. Um, I lost all track of time. We, we've spent a lot of time looking at what are the current barriers to triplexes and fourplexes, and are any of those barriers able to be adjusted to make it easier, i.e. cheaper, to build this type of housing in our community? Triplexes and fourplexes are density. They are a way to, I heard gentle density thrown out earlier, which I, I'm becoming a bigger fan of. Um, uh, it, it's a way to introduce more housing units and more housing options in a lot of uh, already developed neighborhoods. And the beauty of this, this type of infill development or redevelopment is that uh, the utilities that you're going to hear about here in a little bit typically already are there. You know, you've got the ability to provide utility services to these facilities without having to pr bring in new utilities or build new roads, et cetera. It makes them uh, a little bit more appealing. Um, so the, the working group, um, with, the, with the assistance of the assembly, um, developed an ordinance that you heard referenced earlier is currently making its way through the public process. Uh, and the sort of TLDR of what this ordinance does is let's treat triplexes and fourplexes like we treat single family homes. Um, it, it should not be more cost prohibitive to build something that can physically be the same size and physically occupy the same size space as single family homes when you're only adding you know, one or two more dwelling units. Uh, and so um, that ordinance is very exciting. It's uh, coming back to the assembly, I believe in December. Thank you for the nod. And um, I, I think you all should look into it because it really will be an important first step on addressing the zoning limitations to this type of housing development. In closing, before I pass to Jacques, I do want to highlight that I didn't put these pictures on the screen for no reason whatsoever. Um, there is a reason. And the reason is this. You're looking at structures that are roughly the same size square footage wise, but are built uh, to very different standards, with the single family home being the large snout house on the left, I think it's your left, and two examples of fourplexes on the right hand side, both of which are built on a quarter of an acre that, that uh, provide housing for up to four families versus the large house on the left that uh, only provides uh, housing for one family and eats up a lot more land. Now granted that one's on the hillside, so there's reasons for it to have such a large lot, but. The two homes on the, on the right, one is at the top is a newer construction project that um, Cook Inlet Housing did about four years ago, three years ago. And then the bottom one is one that I think anybody who's lived here long enough recognizes. And this is one of the 80s sort of pipeline era fourplexes that seem to dot a lot of our older neighborhoods in Midtown and some into South Anchorage. These are equally viable as a fourplex uh, or as a four-unit residential dwelling eats up much less land than a lot of single-family homes and shouldn't be cost prohibitive and impossible to build, and that's what we hope to accomplish. Jacques? Thanks, Chris. As Chris noted, I'm here today to talk about infrastructure in our city. Um, I'd like a quick show of hands here. How many engineers, developers, or planners do we have in the room? Can you just raise your hand here real quick? All right, so we got about half the room here. So many of you are familiar with well, a key problem, or maybe problem's not the right word, but um, an issue that we have in our city here in Anchorage is that infrastructure is not on all the, the streets within our city, as Chris pointed out. Uh, in a lot of cases we do on redevelopment situations, but even in some of the cases where we already have homes, people living um, in our city, there is not that public infrastructure that we're looking for. And I'm here to talk really about the utilities infrastructure, which we call the deep, the deep utilities in our, in our city. Um, they're the, uh, the ones that you have to excavate to get down to that depth where they're not freezing water or sewer. Um, and so 
because of that, we impact all the infrastructure above that as well, which is your roads, your drainage, your telecom, your gas, your electric, all that stuff. So back in the 1970s, when we became a certificated utility, uh, which is regulated by the state of Alaska, the RCA, um, we were a conglomeration of smaller utilities that came under one, one body. And because of that conglomeration, we were essentially a patchwork of pipes throughout the city. Over the past decades, that patchwork has been filling out a lot, but we still have significant gaps in that, in that area. In our tariff, which is the state regulated process of how we can expand and, and fund our system to make sure that we're being not only uh, uh, responsive to our community to provide safe um, and reliable water and wastewater services, but it's also to make sure that as an institution that we're financially stable. Um, because of that, we had several processes, public processes, that allowed for the expansion of our system. And those, when we began, were improvement districts, which were either community-led by neighborhoods that petitioned for voting, uh, or they could be uh, assembly um, ordinances that, that pushed to expand the infrastructure. Um, and then we also had a, a, a private industry-driven um, expansion program for private development and private systems. Um, that has been very successful for the early decades of the utility. In the recent decades, though, we've noticed um, uh, that hasn't been as successful as we've, we, we saw when we first began out. And primarily, it's this, co this conversation around cost, the cost of infrastructure, the cost to do that. Um, um, these two methods that we've had, um, the cost is always either on the property owner or the developer to put this in. And as we've been, you know, as many of you know, and we've been discussing all day today, that cost has become a little bit um, unattainable. So uh, several years back, the utility um, in instituted a, a tariff revision, which allowed for a, a, a third process to be um, adopted in the utility, which is infrastructure coordination agreements. Um, these are similar to public-private partnerships, which some of you in the room may have heard about, but they're not quite the same. And the only reason I'd say that is because it gives the utility the, flex uh, the utility the flexibility to partner with not only private industry, but other um, either government departments at both the local and state level and even federal level. This is fairly new, so, uh, and it's a, a, a unique contract mechanism that we've got now at the utility that allows us a, a lot of flexibility. Um, and on here, on the screen here, I'm showing one of our, our first and actual infrastructure coordination agreement, which uh, my partner here, uh, Connie, wasn't able to be here, but uh, we had a, a Sand Hill Reserve coordination, Infrastructure Coordination Agreement, uh, which was uh, completed, I believe, in 2022. The final, final piece of asphalt was uh, uh, paved and, and compacted down for, um, uh, for, the, for the neighborhood to use. And what you can see here is a, is a fairly simple contract. This isn't anything complicated, and it, it basically combined two of our existing programs um, into one. Uh, and what you see here is at the top there, which was uh, previously an undeveloped lot here, 10 acres, uh, you, uh, with the green dotted line there, was a private development. That was similar to the, that is the exact same mechanism that we've used since we became a utility. And below that, in the red dotted line, is a capital project that utility um, uh, constructed from our existing infrastructure to the private development. The primary reasons and the primary feasibility that this infrastructure coordination agreement could happen was for those two reasons up there. Number one, economy of scale, and number two, public health and safety needs. The neighborhood between the existing infrastructure and where the private development uh, was looking to build homes and, and housing stock um, has historical problems with wells and, and water quality in that, and things like arsenic, et cetera. Because of that public need, um, we were able to uh, craft uh, the terms of, a, of an infrastructure coordination agreement that both benefited the utility financially and operationally, as well as was um, acceptable to the, the private developer, Connie. Um, the scope here is very plain and simple, and we had a number of successes. Um, not only would I like to note that those, those three very, what I'd call hard successes of improved health and safety, housing supply, and an increase in the utility uh, uh, rate payer base, but the, uh, we are looking at, well, what has the impact been uh, to property values of all those existing homes along the way um, that we helped um, 
improve in, in, this, in this project. Um, so since Connie's unable to be with, uh, uh, unable to be here with us today, uh, I, I believe Anna, you're, you're next up to take questions for us or, or Felix. All right, thank you all. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and do some questions. All right, so we're gonna start from, with some Slido questions. So first question, why not add more units to housing properties with the extra lot space from less parking requirements? Whoever wants to take it. <laughs> Um, well, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I I don't know if uh, that's uh, necessarily as a result of kind of what we're what we're doing at the Barrett. But what I will say is that it would likely be extremely cost prohibitive for the trust to do something like that at, at our properties. What you know, the the average cost per unit um, for us to to turn on. Uh, a unit is right around sixty to sixty-five thousand uh, dollars per unit. I think when you're looking at kind of what I think the question is implying some sort of new construction on the property, you're you're looking at closer to four hundred thousand uh, dollars per unit. Um, so I think it would just be entirely cost prohibitive from from our perspective. You know, uh, other locations maybe that's possible, but for us it just wasn't possible. Thanks. Uh, nope. All right, so um, next question, and this is an interesting one. So with the benefits that you've seen from being able to redesign properties without parking, do you think that Anchorage should implement a parking maximum? So they actually have a, a parking maximum in our code currently. Um, and I, I guess from my own experience, I've only run into that being an issue for particular developments, but it doesn't come up very often that we hit the maximum. I just wanted to bring up one thing. Um, I think the success of our ADU is that we do have parking. There's a designated space in our drive for the tenant. And um, when I tell my neighbors that we do have an ADU, they're shocked because they go into their space, they stay in their space, they drive, they go to work. So having the off-street parking has made that successful. Otherwise, I'm sure my neighbors would be talking to me about why that car's on the street and the plow's coming. And I'll, I'll just add, Felix, that um, many of us attended the Alaska State Home Builders Association forum yesterday, where this topic was expressed in a, in a similar way, where a, a builder has an, a site a, a brand new development site, so a greenfield development site, and because of the various zoning uh, rules and requirements about driveways and landscaping and building placements, et cetera, what he talked about is how the reduction in parking um, did allow some additional unit production, but not to the degree that people think, because builders are still going to build in some level of parking. You heard Jason talk about it at the AHLT property, Builders still know that tenants want to park at least a car or two, so they're still going to build that in. But what he highlighted is that whether it's parking minimums or other zoning-based requirements related to setbacks or landscaping, keep in mind that every one of those begins to um, subtract developable land from the entire area of a parcel, meaning that a builder can build fewer units overall. So parking minimums and frankly, parking, parking maximums, uh, play a role in that calculus for builders. And then last note on parking maximums, I think another way to express that question that we heard yesterday is, um, why aren't people considering some kind of land tax on underutilized properties? So anybody who's spent time in downtown Anchorage knows there's a, uh, a lot of surface parking. We do need parking downtown, don't get me wrong, but surface parking really the best use of the acres of land in our urban core. I don't know, and maybe taxation is the answer to that question. Thank you. All right, so next question. Uh, if the city was to subsidize the cost of infrastructure for new development, how do you propose to ensure the developer will pass 
those savings on to the home buyer? Put another way, what is the public benefit to that? I think that uh, question is for me. You know, the funding, the funding source, and, and I, I'm assuming the, the, the question is, is talking about some type of infrastructure bank. I think that that's probably best answered at a policy level that I couldn't speak to because I don't, I, I implement policy. Um, I'll note that um, something the utility has done recently is uh, work with the federal delegation to get grant funding to help um, not only all of our existing customers expand infrastructure and in our system to make sure that the existing rate payers and the customers at the utility are seeing a benefit while also opening up some land for development and or redevelopment as well. So there's processes and things that we, the utility, have been going after to aid in that. And because that money is grant funded, um, those savings are automatically built into the fact that if a new customer comes into our system and it was grant funded, that money doesn't go into an assessment, which is key to the folks that understand the assessment, levy assessment program. So. Um, a lot of nuance there, but um, I think that's, that hopefully answers that question. All right. Um, next question. Uh, is there thoughts about concentrating housing with good public transportation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> next question. I'll just add that. Um, Public transportation or the transportation networks in, th in and throughout Anchorage are an important calculus for developers and builders as well. And you're seeing that expressed in um, some of the policies that the uh, assembly has passed over the past four or five years, one of which is an incentive designed for builders to put these kinds of higher density multifamily units closer to our transit lines so that individual, like Jason's example, as individuals um, are moving into and renting up, they may not be able to afford a car, or in many cases, want a car, because our transit system has improved so much over the past half decade that it's actually usable to get to and from work, no matter where you work in town. So um, the, you know, the community has recognized that as a priority. They've expressed it through one of the tools that are out there for builders. Um, but there are certainly other ways to do it, and it's a very important uh, policy. Great, thank you. Um, next question. With private, private parking requirements gone, people will still need to park. Where will we park? Did we just move the burden to the broader public? So as, I guess for me personally, as a designer, it's our responsibility to work with our clients to make sure that we provide adequate parking for their use. I think what we see um, is that every use is a little bit different. So for my example, with the Moose's Tooth, we know that they usually need as much parking as they can get. Um, but we also see uses that, that don't need as much parking as what the code used to require. So I think it's you know educating folks and guiding them in the right direction to be responsible so that we're not putting the burden on just on the adjacent right-of-ways. Great, thank you. Felix, yeah, yeah real quick. I, I think that's, a, that's a, an important thing to note that there's always going to be neighborhood effects. And I think that the city and the assembly recognize that. They, the assembly uh, appropriated money for the planning department and others to actually conduct this kind of citywide right-of-way study that asks these questions. You know, we're a snowy city. Is it realistic that people can park on the street all the time? And if not, should we have policies about when and where cars can park? Some of us who live in neighborhoods that are designated as snow routes know that you already can't always park on the street if you're on a designated snow route because your car could get towed before they come and do a plow out. Same true, it's true in downtown. Uh, which I learned the hard way many nights, so. Thank you. So uh, I think we have time for a few more questions. Uh, so I have a couple questions for Jason, I think related to the Barrett. 
um, will we prioritize or provide case management uh, so that vulnerable individuals can keep housing, housing stability, and reconnect with community? And then second uh, question is how many of the people on the waiting list for the Barrett Inn are currently experiencing homelessness? Currently experiencing. Can you? Yeah, how many people on the waiting list, I think it's overall waiting list, uh, are currently experiencing homelessness? Yeah, um, uh, great question. Uh, to, the, to the first one, yes, absolutely. Uh, at, at each of our properties, um, the individual has the option, we do not make it a requirement of living at any of our properties that you must participate in, uh, or or enroll in some sort of case management or tenant support um, you know, process. Uh, but the, the option is available for individuals if they so choose. What we are finding is the vast majority of individuals do take advantage of that sort of uh, opportunity, be it uh, help you know, accessing um, you know, uh, uh, kind of mainstream government benefits, be it social security disability or, or things like that. Um, people do take advantage of that. Um, people take advantage of, uh, you know, trying to figure out how do I actually uh, develop a, a budget um, for, for uh, you know, myself or my, the, the individual I'm living with so that I know I have enough money to, you know, pay the rent, uh, buy food, things like that. So they certainly take advantage of that, but it is not a requirement um, if you um, are, are living at one of our properties. Um, to the second question, um, I would say that um, I, I don't have the exact uh, numbers because, again, it's not a question that we actually ask um, folks that, that, that want to, to live at one of our properties. We, we set a maximum income threshold, uh, but beyond that, we've tried to remove as many barriers, and we don't want to necessarily uh, make decisions uh, based on are you, are you homeless or um, are, you, are you living somewhere, somewhere else. Um, that being said, um, the, the vast majority of, of the folks that I think are on our waiting list are people that um, are either currently experiencing homelessness or, or are very much in that housing insecure um, uh, space. They're maybe couch surfing, they're living out of a vehicle, um, things like that. So um, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I would, I would venture to guess the vast majority are. Great. Thank you. All right, so we're going to do one last question. And thanks, everyone, for all of the great questions and your curiosity. Um, so this is going to be for Awu. Um, why did Awu just subsidize Connie Yoshimuro's latest subdivision, yet that savings was not passed on to the homeowner? How do we ensure the developer doesn't take advantage of the proposed subsidies to developers? Um, I appreciate the question. I would like to note a couple things about this agreement. Um, number one, the cost of the ABU capital project was cut, or it was cut in half by 50%. So the assessments that go to the existing residents that benefited from that capital project was cut in half due to that agreement. Um, in addition to that, um, we got customers that we weren't planning on getting as well. So we gotta, we're gonna get about 80 customers that weren't a part of the utility rate base to start with. So um, I, I heard the question and I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to politely correct them that there was a benefit and it wasn't a subsidy. Um, so. Great, thank you. And uh, with that, let's give a final round of applause for our speakers, thank you all. All right, so uh, what I heard during those panel discussions is that um, we have made some positive changes that are having a positive impact, um, but th there's still a lot more to do. Um, the outcomes of our policy choices take time to implement. Um, that's where the housing strategic plan comes in. And this is where I come in. Um, <laughs> So we're gonna uh, just give you a brief preview before we break for lunch. Um, and I'm also really excited um, to that we're gonna have a great uh, keynote speaker. Uh, so, so get in there soon. But in the meantime, just a few minutes. Um, we're gonna, if we can, oh, never mind. That would be me. Can I get the next slide? Oh, sorry. There we go, okay. 
Um, so before we break for lunch and welcome our keynote speaker, um, you'll see the staff walking around distributing a copy of our draft housing strategic plan that we've been working on for the last couple months. And I'm really going to do just a quick overview to help you orient to help orient you to the plan, and then we're really going to dig into the plan this afternoon. So so it's not a test. Don't feel like you're going to get tested. Um, and then if you didn't get a copy, um, just come see us at the break, and we'll make sure that, that you get one. So you've heard us say many times that Anchorage has a housing problem, but it's actually many problems. And I think we've already started to kind of unpeel those layers today. Our aging housing stock, the high, high cost of building, rising prices, and ev of course everybody in this room can relate to at least one of these problems. And as I said, we've already heard some of these challenges. But the good news is, um, there's also many potential solutions. And what we've heard from other communities uh, who have had success in housing is that there isn't a single miracle cure. There isn't one policy, one um, program that we can put into place that would solve the problem on its own. It'll take a lot of different solutions from different parts of the community. So that's really um, something to understand, that there are solutions to all the problems up there, but uh, we really need to focus on what we can control or influence. Um, so with all those options, um, we really want to remind folks too, kind of the role of the assembly. Um, so we want to focus on things that we have influence over. We can lead on policy direction and code changes, that first column there. Um, we can support others, the second column, uh, others who are leading the charge, for example, AWWU, ACDA, and of course our private sector, the folks who actually build and, and renovate our housing. And then we can also um, really, if it's, if it's something that is a policy need that we can't do on our own, it's not, our, it's not in our sphere, we can advocate to our state and local, or st sorry, state and federal leaders. Um, so from there, we really want to work on the, uh, the solutions that have the most impact and the quickest return. So that's really, we've been looking at all of the prior plans, uh, recommendations, studies that we've done over the years as the municipality and with our partners to really pick out what we think is going to have the most impact. So what we've done is really look at a strategic planning process. So really setting out a clear vision, uh, identifying some clear goals to guide our work, and then, t and then working on what our priorities are going to be. And we'll come back to that this afternoon. Um, but first, I just want to remind folks, um, some of you have probably been through many strategic planning processes, but a strategic plan is really a great tool for getting a whole bunch of different uh, folks working on an issue to focus and be on the same page. So strategic planning is both a process and a product. Um, so it's a process where an entity defines its vision for the future and goals, or sorry, vision for the future and goals to achieve that vision. Um, so in this case, we're talking about the, the assembly, what we're going to be doing, but I want to really emphasize that what we're doing is not in a vacuum, that we need to be working with all the other players in this room, um, all levels of government, with private sector, with everybody who can really contribute to these solutions. Um, but, but because we're talking about something that, that we're, we're focusing on what we can lead on, that's why we're focusing there. So that process results in, um, sorry, in a strategic plan, a product. Um, so that is a plan that has about a three to five year time frame. Usually it's not, not 20 years, not 50 years. It's really focused on what you can do in the, the short to medium term. And it looks at achievable goals, actions, and then also metrics for success um, to achieve in, in that time frame. Um, so along the way, we really want to get input from stakeholders to make sure that our plan resonates with the community, that it's achievable, and that we can get buy-in from other folks to, that we can work together to really achieve um, these goals. So that's where you come in. Um, so we really want you to look over the draft plan that you have. Um, as I said, we've been developing it over the last couple months. We've had some initial discussions, but it is not a done document. You'll see that it is printed out. It says draft. So we really want your feedback, and we want to test out some of these assumptions. And then we also really want everybody's input on where we should focus first. Um, so whether it's something that's a big, pr a big step that'll take a lot of time, but we need to start now, or something that's more low-hanging fruit, something that we can turn around and do more quickly that will have an impact on our issues. So the document we passed out has a lot of details, but for now we're going to focus on the first two pages. Um, so first we're going to look at the vision. 
So the vision is that we have a affordable, abundant, and diverse housing opportunities so that everyone who wants to live here in Anchorage, it, it, in the municipality as a whole, can find a home that fits their needs and preferences. That's really the goal. So again, we're not, we're not promising everybody a 10,000 square foot house. We really want the market to figure that out and everybody to have opportunities to do that. But there's steps that we need to do because a lot of our current market or a lot of our com current community is not being served. We also set guiding principles to really serve as our compass. So when we're having to make tough decisions or we're having to really negotiate out, you know, what does this policy look like? What are the trade-offs? Um, who benefits and, and who's maybe going to pay? When we get into all those kind of discussions, we really want to stay focused on what our guiding principles are that help us make these decisions. Um, so as we said, you know, assemb individual assembly members, we won't all agree on the same solutions. And we know that there's a lot of different perspectives in this room and outside of this room. But when we have disagreements, we really can come back to these principles um, to, to focus on why we're doing this work in the first place and then help us make those choices. And I'll just point out a couple. Um, housing choice. Again, we're not telling people where to live. We want people to have that choice, whether it's a neighborhood, a type of house, um, something that fe fits their needs. Uh, maybe their needs change over the, the span of their life, right? Like making sure that there's opportunities for folks. And then I also want to point out government that works. So what we're talking about is really um, helping our government be a better partner in development, a better partner in the way that we do things. And, and again, not because government is the only solution, but we need to be part of the solution. And we need to recognize that we can be a partner. We can have that positive relationship with our development community, with our neighborhoods, and really that we can, that we can work on this problem together. And then finally, I'll just highlight our goals. So again, these are um, how we achieve the vision, and it gives us a clear direction of what we're going to do. So I'll read them off briefly. Increase the supply of housing units for sale and for rent. As we said, this isn't just about people buying houses. This is about having options for everybody and, and, and everybody across the income spectrum. Two is diver diversify the housing market. We want to have more types of housing, more sizes, price points, locations, and ownership models. So we talked about community land trusts. We talked about opportunities for cooperative housing. We could, we could allow more innovative ideas to flourish in our city. The third one, increase the share of resident-occupied housing throughout the year and reduce the number of vacant units. And I think this one is an interesting one to unpack, and we'll get into all of these in more detail later. Um, but this relates to we want people living in our housing. We've heard from folks in Girdwood talking about dark homes, for example. You know, homes that, that, that are, look like a house, but no one lives there. And that is really a missed opportunity to have somebody who wants to be in our community and wants to contribute. And so that's, that's really a place to look. And then, of course, we all know uh, it, that house in the neighborhood that's always been a problem. Maybe it looks like a haunted house, right? <laughs> and so we want to really reduce the number of vacant units that are, that are putting a burden on the rest of us in our neighborhoods. The fourth one, reduce housing cost burdens and ensure safe, affordable, permanent housing for all residents. And again, housing cost burden means if you're paying half of your income on rent, you're, you're, you might be food insecure. You're certainly not able to save up for a house. And when your kid gets sick, then that's a real stress point for you because you can't pay half of your rent, right? You have to pay the whole thing. And so really looking at uh, other ways that we can reduce that housing cost, but also recognizing that the cost of housing burdens some more than others. So focusing on how we can make it more uh, possible to live in our city. And then lastly, make the municipality a better partner in the development process. Again, that is uh, one, a theme that's come up. There's ways that we can improve our processes, that we can help folks get to yes, get things built faster, and really bring us up to par with a lot of other communities that are very development friendly, and more and more that we see we're competing with those cities. So that's a really important part of the, the, the process as well. And I think, uh, so that's it. So, so uh, we're really going to dive into what these mean. And then you'll see the other pages in the document are um, some specific targets. We can measure our progress, um, some actions, and kind of groups of strategies that we're going to get into. So we, that's what we're really going to spend our time on in the afternoon. And we're going to look at some real world examples of how to, uh, how to do that, and then really some of the challenges that we have in our community. So for now, I just want to leave you with that brief orientation to the plan, encourage you to look it over during 
during lunch, again, it's not a test, you don't have to memorize it, and start marking it up if you have questions, if you like a strategy, if you don't like a strategy. Um, really we want to hear that feedback and then we'll have an opportunity to talk through it. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to Felix uh, right before lunch. Great, thanks so much for that primer, Anna. And I don't know about y'all, but I am super excited for this work. Um, we're gonna be diving deeper into the strategic plan this afternoon after a uh, presentation and keynote from our special guest, Charles Marone. But first, we'll take 15 minutes to grab lunch in the hallway behind me. So there are a variety of uh, lunch bags available provided by uh, Sea Wolf Catering, so thank you so much, including turkey and ham sandwiches, uh, chicken Caesar, and vegan uh, spinach wraps. Uh, every uh, lunch bag comes with chips and a cookie, and the lunch bags are labeled with C for chicken, V for vegan, etc. Um, our lunchtime keynote will take place here on the main stage. Please grab your lunch and uh, join us uh, back here uh, in this space, or take a seat in the den down the hall where the where the keynote will be simulcast as well. Um, so have a great lunch, y'all, and we'll be back here at 12:15.
All right, if folks can go ahead and take their seats, we're going to get started again. So folks can take their seats and close out your conversations. We're going to get started here. Thanks, everyone, for taking your seat. All right. So as everyone settles in with their lunch, I'd like to bring uh, your attention to the stage to welcome our special guest and keynote speaker for today's summit, Charles Marone, the founder. Yeah, yeah. The founder and president of Strong Towns, Charles is a land use planner and civil engineer with decades of community and economic development experience. Marone is the author of Strong Towns, a bottom-up revolution to rebuild American prosperity and confessions of a recovering engineer. He hosts the Strong Towns podcast. Planet is in named him one of the top, one of the ten most influential urbanists of all time. Charles has presented the Strong Towns approach in hundreds of cities and towns across North America, reaching 49 out of 50 states until today. <laughs> Charles, you have saved the best for last. It is an honor to welcome you to your 50th state, and such a beautiful one at that. We are all so lucky to call this place home, and I hope the momentum that we build today will lead us to a future where there are more abundant, diverse housing options for everyone who wants to call this place home. Please join me in welcoming Charles Marone to the stage. Yeah, you're gonna have to give me a little bit of volume. There we go. Um, oop, too much. Too much, too much. Um, thank you. Uh, um, this is the 50th state that I've been able to go and present Strong Town's ideas in. And it's not, um, I want you to know that it's not like checking a box for me. Um, early on, this was a place I wanted to get to for many, many, many reasons. And in the brief period of time that I've been on the ground here, and I'm coming back in February, by the way, so I'm, I, I kind of look at this as like the preliminary scoping uh, trip. Um, if you want, I can use the podium, because uh, that humming, bring it out a little bit? Bring it closer. OK. Is that good? All right, we'll do that. Um, from day one, this has been a place that I wanted to get to. And I'm just going to make one little observation here. Um, because we did a walking tour this morning, and it was one of these things where it was supposed to start at 9, and it started at 9 o'clock. And we were supposed to be at this spot at 9.15, and we were there at 9.15. Um, this, since I got to this uh, event, everything has run very much on time. I don't know if I've just gotten lucky and gotten into a couple anomalous situations, but I'm a Minnesotan. Minnesotans like to start on time. We like to end on time. We like to have like things go like clockwork. So you feel like my folk, right? Like I, I feel very comfortable here. I feel like I, I fit in. I did a thing in uh, Miami once where we were supposed to start at 7 and I showed up at 6.30 and the host of the event didn't show up till 7.15. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I found out that in Miami, seven means more like nine. Um, it's just the way things are. Uh, it's very, very nice to be here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Strong Towns, and then we're going to do a lot of Q&A at the end. So let me, let me, let me keep moving. Uh, this is my hometown. I live in a place called Brainerd, Minnesota. It's a couple hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. This is what it looked like back in 1870. And I'm showing you this because... Uh, at one point, Anchorage looked just like this, right? Um, a little collection of pop-up shacks in the middle of nowhere that some people thought may amount to something, and lots of other people probably didn't even know existed, right? 
cities like this were built all over the world, really, all over North America. In fact, this is the base building block of every city that has ever been constructed up until a kind of modern post-war way of building. And when we built this way, what we were doing is we were starting out uh, with a very little experiment. Um, would this settlement work out? Would things happen? And if it did work out, a lot of these places didn't. They just kind of slowly went away, right? But when they did work out, you saw something very magical happen. They would start to grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and there would be this incremental thickening up of the place. So my little hometown in 1870 would become this in 1905. This is the same exact street uh, just 35 years later, right? And after another couple decades of growing in this incremental fashion, these little two and three story wood structures would get replaced by buildings of brick and granite. Neighborhoods have always grown up until modern times in this incremental way. We start small, uh, we build on successes, we tear things down, we rebuild them. Uh, it's an iterative process. I I've begun showing this city because a, a lot of people think, well, Chuck, this is a good story of Brainerd, but can you really do anything monumental with this kind of approach? Are you saying we should be doing, you know, incremental? We, we should be doing grand things, Chuck. Don't talk to us about incremental. Well, here's a city that you might recognize and I'll kind of fast forward uh, in time and see if you do recognize it at some point. Um, here's 1911, and then uh, here's what it looks like today. So a lot of times when we think about incremental, we think about small and insignificant. Um, when we think about incremental, we should think about it as the path for doing great things. Uh, in Rome, they didn't build the Colosseum and then build Rome. Right? They built a, a city, and the Colosseum was the culminating uh, investment that they made. At the end of World War II, uh, there was a lot of consternation about what was going to happen next. If you recall from your history books, uh, we had just gone through the Great Depression, one of the most traumatic economic dislocations that any advanced society has ever experienced. Um, we did not understand what caused the Great Depression. We still don't. We still debate the causes of it. Um, we certainly didn't understand how to get out of it. If you go back and study the New Deal, uh, the New Deal was an attempt to try many, many different things, none of which really got us out of the Great Depression. The thing we are taught that got us out of the Great Depression was, everybody? Yeah, World War II, right? Which, yay, global war, right? Um, if you are an economist, this is a narrative that makes sense. If you are a normal human being, we're taught this, and this is why we all hear this, but none of us really, this doesn't make sense to us, right? The idea that you would end a decade of hardship and then all of a sudden happy times are here again because we can mobilize millions of people to go overseas to fight and to kill. We could take all the uh, industries that we had and turn them towards war production making tanks, making munitions, making ships, planes. We could ration butter, ration sugar, ration gas. These are not happy times. But if you're an economist staring at spreadsheets, counting beans, uh, the economy went from the doldrums to roaring when the war started. Uh, the economists, and this is a quote from Paul Samuelson, who's one of FDR's primary uh, e economic consultants. He's probably the premier economist in the 20th century for North America. Um, he said, were the war to be ended, uh, suddenly there'd be ushered in the greatest period of unemployment and industrial dislocation any economy has ever faced. They were worried that if the war ended, we would just go right back into the middle of the Great Depression. There was nothing really different about the economy in 1945 as it was in 1935. And when we brought home all these troops and we shut down all these industries, uh, creating stuff for the war, uh, what was going to happen to our economy? As far as they knew, we were just going to go right back to where we were. Is that what happened? No, of course not, right? We had the, the, the greatest boom, economic boom in, in modern history, perhaps in like world history. Um, 
And the narratives that we tell each other about this boom, about this kind of immediate one or two decades after World War II, um, while well, they've started to not be as positive, um, the, the narratives, let's say, that we inherited are generally all positive about this time frame, right? Victorious troops came home. Uh, we set out to build a middle class. We created the suburbs. We created highways. We invested in infrastructure. We invested in social programs. We, we expanded in, in, in this uh, really triumphant kind of way. I, I'm, 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 I just looked at my watch and I'm like, you're spending too much time on this. I, when I'm comfortable, I start to talk more. Um, <laughs> I, I, you all have made me very, feel very welcome. Um, let me keep it moving so we can have a lot of Q&A at the end. I, I, I think this was a, a majestic period of time in our history. Um, we talk about it in these ways. I, I had grandparents, obviously, that were part of that war generation. And, uh, you know, was brought up with the idea that these were uh, heroic people. And so this was their story. I want to show you what this looks like on a map. Um, this is a map of Fresno, California. I'm not showing you a map of Fresno because I think Anchorage is like Fresno uh, in, in most ways. Um, but you are like Fresno in the way that this map shows. I have good maps of Fresno. I would love to show you this map of Anchorage, but I don't have one. So I'm gonna show you this, and you're gonna see a story that rhymes with your story, right? So the yellow, if you can see the yellow box here, the yellow box is the city limits of Anchorage, in, or I'm sorry, of Fresno in 1897. I want you to watch how the city boundaries change over time, right? So here's 1909, a little bit of growth to the north. Now you have 1922, uh, mid-1930s. Here's the end of World War II. If you look, what you've seen so far is that incremental expansion, right? That city growing incrementally up, growing incrementally out, thickening up over time. This is the traditional development pattern that we've seen cities use literally around the world for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is how all cities have been built up until this point in time. Now we have the end of World War II. We don't want to slide back into the Great Depression. We want to grow. We are going to change our cities into, in a sense, engines of growth, growth machines. And what we see is this. Uh, here's 1958, here's 1970, here's 1983, uh, 1995, and then here's the last image I have in 2010. Rapid, rapid, rapid growth. If you are trying to stay out of the Great Depression, if you are trying to juice the economy, if you are trying to get things really, really going, this was massively successful. So successful, in fact, that we still talk about infrastructure investment, government infrastructure investment, particularly uh, in, in these kind of grand uh, sweeping economic narratives, right? We built a middle class, we grew our cities, we created all kinds of prosperity uh, immediately after World War II. You see that every time we run into economic hardship, we tend to go back to this narrative and double down on it, triple down on it, quadruple down on it. Um, this was very, very, very successful in accomplishing the thing that this generation set out to do. And those approaches, those, uh, that mindset, that culture has carried with us to this day. I wanna talk about some of the implications of this, however, because while macroeconomists look at the world in one way, I, I was just gonna say real humans, uh, people like us, people working at the local level, uh, have a different set of things that we look at, a different set of variables that are most important to us. It's not to suggest that economists aren't real people, but sometimes, yeah, I kinda wonder. Um, this is data that uh, the group at Urban3 out of Asheville, North Carolina, and I, uh, put together as part of a project that we did in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, again, I, I'm not sharing this with you because I think you are Lafayette, Louisiana, but I think you will see a lot of your story reflected in this. Um, at the end of World War II, the population of Lafayette, Louisiana was a little over 33,000. Today, it's a little over 120,000. That's a three and a half times increase. It's a big amount of growth in that period of time. 
But when we look at Lafayette, Louisiana, we see that at the end of World War II, it took five feet of pipe per person to provide drinking water to the people of Lafayette. Today, it takes 10 times that amount. At the end of World War II, it took 2.4 hydrants per thousand people to provide uh, fire protection for the citizens of Lafayette. Today, it takes 21 times that amount. So, while the population has grown by three and a half times, what we see is that the amount of liability, the amount of expense, the amount of stuff that it has taken has grown dramatically. Now, people often say to me, well, Chuck, I get it. Uh, we are um, so much better off than they were at the end of World War II. Um, our houses are bigger. We've got more stuff. We have a higher standard of living. We are, in general, more wealthy and affluent than the people at the end of World War II were. And I ask the question, where does that show up? Because that's not what the numbers actually suggest. If we look at a city like Lafayette, Louisiana, which, by the way, I think is a very typical American city post-World War II, what we see is that they've been able to grow their population very, very quickly by taking on an even greater amount of liability. Roads they promised to fix, sidewalks they promised to fix and maintain, pipes that now are theirs to, to take care of. Um, yet when we look at things like family income, it's only gone up a tiny fraction of the amount of growth they've experienced. Uh, when we look at things like family wealth, we actually see that more families have a negative net wealth today than did at the end of World War II. What we found is that it's very, very easy to have growth at the macro level. It's very easy for us to experience growth in terms of national GDP when cities are willing to take on the long-term liability of an expense of maintaining the things that we built. This is uh, a, a, a neighborhood in my hometown. Uh, I wanna show you this because I wanna show you the trade-offs that we make at the local level when we grow in this way. These are two identical blocks. If you look at them, they're the same size, the same area. They have the same amount of public infrastructure. That block on the left was built in the 1920s. Uh, actually, all three of these blocks were built in the 1920s, but the one on the left is still has the original buildings. If you think of the city growing incrementally out, this would have been the far edge of town in the 1920s. The people who built these thought eventually we'll get, you know, the neighborhood thicken up, become more valuable. We'll get second and third stories. There'll be more growth here. That's not what happened. You had these built in the 1920s, then you had the Great Depression, then you had World War II, then we just skipped right over this neighborhood and started building out on the edge. These neighborhoods have stagnated, this neighborhood in particular, has stagnated for almost a century. That block on the right used to look just like the block on the left. We got it torn down. Uh, we were able to get something new built, something that met our new comprehensive plan, our new approach, uh, a Taco John's drive through Do you... Do you all have Taco John's up here? No. Wish did. You wish you did? No. <laughs> Taco John's you can think of as like Norwegian Mexican food, <laughs> right? It has just the right blend of like mild cheddar cheeses and uh, salts, yeah. So we were really, really happy to do this, right? We got rid of a block of blight. We got something brand new. It met all the building codes, all the zoning codes, the sign ordinance. It had commercial sprinkler systems, ADA bathrooms, expanded sidewalks. It, they have uh, native plants in the, in the stormwater area. This checked every success, every box of success that we had set up for what a good development would look like. The only problem is nobody bothered to, to look at the finances. That old and blighted rundown block has a total value of $1.1 million. That new block on the right, same size area, same amount of public infrastructure, same cost for us as a community to provide ongoing service and maintenance. Uh, the value of that block now is only 600,000. The block on the left is actually paying 78% more property tax to the city year after year after year. It has more small business owners, more local business owners. Those business owners actually consume more local goods themselves. They hire local attorneys, local accountants. There's much more like uh, flow in our local economy from the, on the left. But on the right is what we hold up as success. It's what growth looks like. 
This is a, a pattern that we see repeated in city after city after city after city. I mentioned uh, Urban 3 earlier on. Uh, Urban 3 has done some amazing maps where they have gone in and asked the question, where's the most productive part of this city? Um, when we think of a farmer going out and spreading seed on a field, the parts of the field that grow up uh, the most robustly, we say that's the most productive part of that farm field. That's where you get the most like bushels per acre. Well, where in a city do you get the most value per acre? Where do you have the most productive parts of the city? And I'm going to show you a series of, of cities now, uh, maps that Urban 3 have put together, but I'm going to start with Buffalo, New York. Um, Buffalo, New York, another very snowy place, very northern place. Uh, one of the kind of premier uh, cities uh, of North America, perhaps of the world, in the early 1900s, has experienced decades and decades and decades of decline. They've actually lost population every single year since the end of World War II. But when we step back and we say, where is the wealth in Buffalo, New York? Can you point to the traditional development pattern? Can you point to their downtown? This is all the stuff that was built prior to the Great Depression, prior to World War II. And it, today, despite the decline, despite the neglect, is still their greatest repository of wealth. We see this pattern repeated in city after city after city. And it doesn't matter if it is a northern city or a southern city. It doesn't matter if it's on water or not. It doesn't matter if it's on the coast or in the middle of the country. It doesn't matter if the city is big or small. Where we have neighborhoods that were built prior to uh, the Great Depression, what we see is that those neighborhoods tend to have very high financial productivity. The city tends to financially do really well in those neighborhoods, even if uh, those neighborhoods are occupied by the poorest people in the community. Everywhere where we see post-war development, the further we go out in time, the more negative it turns uh, from a financial return standpoint. The more expensive it is to provide service ongoing and the lower, more denuded the tax base tends to be. This is a uh, map of, again, Lafayette, Louisiana. This is part of that big study that I, I referenced earlier. Every place where you see blue on this map is a property that pays more in taxes and fees every year to the city than they require in ongoing service and maintenance. Every place where you see red is the exact opposite. These places require more resources to provide service and maintenance of key infrastructure than they pay in taxes. The higher the line goes, the more the disparity is. So what you have here in the middle is the core downtown. Uh, very, very, in a sense, profitable for the local government, for the city, for the community. Um, to the right of that, to the east, is this crescent of blue. These are some of the poorest neighborhoods in the community. Here's a, a, just a, a screenshot of what these places look like. That upper right uh, shot there is their core downtown. The bottom, uh, this neighborhood looks very run down. It is very run down. Um, the fact that the city is not up maintaining stuff uh, only means that the blue line in reality is higher than we theoretically show it. Uh, what we estimated was what it would cost to provide the service. The fact that the city is shortchanging these less affluent neighborhoods uh, only makes that disparity greater. All this stuff out on the edge, all this negative returning stuff, um, that's the stuff that you would expect to see out on the edge of town. It's the stuff we kind of obsessively build now today. Uh, the gas stations, the strip malls, the big box stores, the franchise restaurants, um, you know, the windy cul-de-sac type of developments. Um, these are very, very costly to build. They are extremely costly to maintain. And even though as individual parcels, uh, they may have a lot of tax base, that tax base is very spread out. So on a per, per foot basis to provide that ongoing service and maintenance, the cost is extremely, extremely high. Um, just to give you a sense of the numbers in Lafayette, which I think are very typical of North American cities, the median family in Lafayette pays $1,500 a year in taxes to the city. They'll pay other taxes to counties and regional authorities, but Back when we did this study in 2015, it was $1,500 a year in taxes to the city. In order for the city to maintain everything that they have built, 
to fix all the roads, fix all the sidewalks, maintain the sewer and the water and the drainage systems, the electrical systems, the parks, the buildings, all the stuff that they built. The median taxes would need to go from $1,500 a year to $9,200 a year. Um, one out of every $5 that a Lafayette family makes would need to get taxed by and sent back to the local government just to maintain the systems that they have already built. That's not going to happen, right? Th there's zero chance that that will ever happen. And so what we see in cities like Lafayette is that uh, they are, in a sense, uh, two or three decades behind where a city like Detroit is in terms of letting their neighborhoods go. If we look at a, a city like Detroit, there's a lot of uh, dialogue and conversation about Detroit, but to me Detroit is a very simple city to understand. Detroit, again, in the early 1900s, an industrial city, one of our most successful, kind of brightest lights uh, uh, of North America, really one of the richest cities in the world. Uh, they were the first city, though, to experiment with the North American development pattern, with the post-war development. They essentially were the pioneers. They were on their way to becoming the motor city. They were the first city to create auto commuter suburbs, to run the highways out to the far outskirts of town, to bisect their neighborhoods with highways, uh, to tear down buildings, to create parking lots, to basically spread things out. And when you take a very wealthy, very affluent city and you denude that wealth, spread it out across a huge area and drive up the costs, you get the insolvency, you get the bankruptcy of Detroit. Uh, a city like Lafayette is just a couple decades, two or three decades behind uh, Detroit. Um, I wrote that at the end of the third chapter of my book and my mom, who read an advanced copy, called me up and said, Chucky, this is a very sad book. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you uh, a, a very difficult story. Um, I think when I look at Anchorage, let me say this in a, in a very friendly way. Um, because like I said, you, uh, you've, you've all shown me tremendous hospitality since the moment I, I stepped off a plane. Um, what, what Lafayette has gone through is a boom and now a, a kind of slower decline that has happened over 70 years. Um, your boom didn't happen for the first 40 years that everybody else experienced it. But when it did happen, it happened much more quickly. And what we see, whether it is population boom and bust, whether it's financial boom and bust, is that the, the kind of longer the ramp up period is, the longer the unfolding period is. And the quicker the ramp up, the quicker the, the downslide. And so if you think of like your infrastructure, for example, as having an echo, we build it, then we have to go maintain it. You had a big boom all at once, right? And so you, in a sense, have like this echo coming or upon you. Um, and so my biggest fear for you, as, as, as friendly, congenial, hearty northern people, um, is that you, you have actually a, a more aggressive downslope that you're going to have to deal with than what Lafayette even has to deal with. Um, so, depressing. Let's move on. Because the question I'm always asked is, is what do we do? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, not having seen uh, this strategic, are you calling it a strategic, the housing plan thing you just passed out? Um, not having seen that until just now, I'm going to tell you, almost every strategic plan that cities do are just horrible. Um, they're too long, they're too wordy, they're not focused. Um, yours is actually really good. Um, I think it kind of gets at a lot of what's going on in housing and it has a lot of good strategies and it's tight and it's focused. Um, in that plan, they talk about cottage houses, they talk about housing up front. Um, when I think about like what we need to do to attack this series of problems, what we need to do to start addressing this series of challenges that are in front of us, um, we need to humble ourselves to walk away from or move away from the idea that there is a big project or a big fix or one or two things that will make things better. And we really have to embrace the first page of that 
strategic plan, which says this is like an all-in kind of thing. This is like an everything. We need to do a whole bunch of small things across a, a broad area. This is something that in my city we call a tiny house. Our ancestors in the same city used to call this a house. Um, for some reason, we have taken what is a normal starter home and we've put the word tiny on the front and uh, we make it go through, you know, if you want to build a tiny house, you have to not only meet all the requirements of a house house, um, but you have to, you know, meet subpart A through M of the tiny house provisions. You have to go beg permission from your neighbors. You have to genuflect in front of the planning board. There's all these things you have to do to build what is basically like a starter home. How many people in this room want to live in a 400 square foot house? There's a few of you. How many of you have lived in a 400 square foot house? Okay. When we are not producing these in sufficient volume, what we are doing is we take the bottom rung out of the ladder. We like to talk about, in America, we like to talk about people who pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And I know that's gotten a bad rap in recent years. I get it. The idea, though, at its essence is a good one. And it's this. A successful economic system is one where you can start with very little and end up with something. Where you can start with very little and by your own labor, by your own, uh, you know, uh, capacity, work up so that you have something. When we take the bottom rung off the ladder, when we say you can't build a small house, you can't build a starter house, you're not allowed to do this, we don't have space for you. In order to do this, you have to have a one acre lot or you've gotta have $80,000 of infrastructure. When we do those kind of things, we put up a lot of unnecessary barriers and we remove that bottom rung, the two rungs, the three rungs on the bottom that let people get a start. We actually need to humble ourselves to create that starting point for people so that they can get going. This is a great starter house. And while most of us in here do not aspire to live in a starter house, a whole bunch of people raise their hands that I have lived in a starter house. I have lived at this point in life. There's a commercial equivalent to this as well that we seem very resistant to. I, I went out and had some tacos at a local place last night and it was very nice. Um, it was very, very nice. Um, but I, I looked at like the amount of cash, the amount of energy that went in to creating this place and I recognize that it's, a, it's beyond what most people uh, in a starting position have, have the capacity to do. Um, we're very comfortable with the outside franchises coming in and building stuff for us. But recognize, particularly on a, you know, a frontier city like Anchorage, what that is. It, it is a way of mining capital out of your community. Um, it's a very different economic impact. This is in Muskegon, Michigan. Muskegon, Michigan uh, rapidly de-industrialized at the end of World War II. Uh, huge amount of population growth. Their downtown struggled and they couldn't subsidize people fast enough uh, to get the businesses filled. And they were losing money on each one that they tried to do. And so they, they went for a different strategy. They said, we've got great people here. We have entrepreneurial people here. They just need a start. They can't go to the downtown because the buildings there are too expensive to renovate. The standards there are too high. But that doesn't mean that we can't give them a start. And so what they did is they went out and bought a bunch of storage sheds. Again, this is a northern city, so uh, I'm not suggesting that they, they, do, they do do this in the winter though, which is kind of fun. But they went out and bought a bunch of storage sheds. They painted them up funky colors. They put them in the streetscape in a place where they filled a gap, a walking gap. And they rent them out dirt cheap to start up entrepreneurs. 70 bucks a month. Yeah. I'm glad you're, I, 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 I hope you're plotting Muskegon, not me. Um, <laughs> this is awesome. And, and let me tell you, I've been to Muskegon a couple times. When you're out there, um, these places are full of energy. They're full of life. There's all kinds of people there who are try If you've ever been around like real entrepreneurs, what's an entrepreneur? We think like the person who started the subway as an entrepreneur. No, that's a franchisee. That's an investor. That's someone who has money, who's trying to put money to work. We need investors. They're great. Entrepreneurs are like heroes, right? They're heroes. 
An entrepreneur is a crazy person who doesn't know they can fail, <laughs> right? It's someone with crazy ideas who doesn't have a sense of their own mortality. Um, what they did in Muskegon is they created a space for entrepreneurs to come in, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, where the stakes were really low. And eventually, a lot of them figure out what works. If you go to Muskegon today, you're gonna see a downtown full of local businesses. And a lot of those businesses are graduates of these storage sheds. They got their start in a place where the stakes were really low and were able to move up to something more substantial. I wanna give you, a, as a last thought here, um, well, the font there is kind of messed up, didn't it? Um, I'll tell you what this says, because that's what's most important. Um, when we do public investments today, particularly here in Alaska, we tend to only think in terms of big. What will the federal government fund? What's the big project that we can do? The more zeros, the better, right? And we tend to define a lot of our problems in terms of these big programs. When I did a tour of your neighborhood this morning, I saw a, a myriad, like almost an endless number of things that we could do to make the neighborhood better. Um, but the things that we are working on to make the neighborhood better all funnel through large transportation systems because that's where the money is. Why did you rob the bank? Because that's where the money is. Why does every problem we have morph into a transportation problem? Because that's where the money is, right? Um, we have overbuilt, overexpanded, overinvested in massive infrastructure projects. And what we actually need to do today to make our neighborhoods more productive, to make them financially uh, solvent, to make them financially successful, but also to serve the people in our places, is to go out and respond to where people are having a difficult time using the city as it has been built. These are desire paths, which is kind of like the low-hanging fruit of this strategy, but the idea is that we go out and recognize where what we have built is no longer working or does not work for the people who are using it. At Strong Towns, we've come up with a four-step process uh, to make the lowest risk, highest returning investments that we can make in a city. And this process is actually uh, so radically simple that I think sometimes we struggle to grasp it fully. Step number one, go out and humbly observe where people struggle. I, I, I go back to Steve Jobs who uh, rejected outright the idea that you could ask people what they want. I know uh, people on your, uh, your commission, they, they, they love public input. Let's go out and ask people what they want. When you ask people what they want, uh, they're gonna tell you they want a better Walkman, right? They're not gonna tell you they want the iPod because it's not part of their vision. That's what Steve Jobs found. Um, the best thing to do is to go out and not ask them what they want, but actually observe how they live. How do they use the city? And where is it difficult? Where are they having a hard time? Question number two then, ask yourself, uh, what is the next smallest thing we can do right now to address that struggle? Not uh, what is the comprehensive study we should do, not what is the federal grant, not what is the project that would fix this once and for all, but what is the thing that we can do right now with the stuff we have on hand, with the cones and the paint and the barrels and the straw bales and, and a little bit of elbow grease, what can we do to make this problem not go away forever, but just a little bit better, a little bit better? Step number three then is to go out and do that thing. Like don't form a committee, don't study it for six months, don't bring in consultants, just go do it. And then step four is to repeat the process over and over and over. When we think about cities being complex adaptive places that thicken up over time, what we have lacked is that thickening up. We're really, really good at going out and planting sequoias. We're not good at creating undergrowth. We assume that the undergrowth will happen, but if you actually study natural systems, the sequoia comes out of the undergrowth, not the other way around. For decades, we've thought, if we just plant enough sequoias out there, we'll get undergrowth. It doesn't work that way. It's the opposite way. We need to have a strategy for actually cultivating 
that undergrowth, cultivating stuff in our neighborhoods, working very small incrementally in our places. Here's the amazing thing, and I was asked for a little bit of hope in our walking tour this morning. Um, there is no city, there is no neighborhood, there is no group of people where this strategy is out of reach of. We have the capacity to do this in every neighborhood in the city tomorrow. We don't need more resources. We don't need more uh, capacity. We don't need a federal funding source. We just need a, 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 a modified version of what we're trying to accomplish. We just need to change our mindset. I know this is a housing summit. Um, I'm gonna give you three quick slides on housing. Um, I feel like I've just, I hope that I've given you a little bit of hope. If I'm gonna summarize the talk so far, it is, Things are really bad because we've adopted the wrong business plan. We have to start thinking about what we do locally, not in terms of the macro economy, but in terms of our local economy. We have to put that first. We can do that, but not in the current model. We have to actually humble ourselves to make modest investments over a broad area over a long period of time. That's the, that's the summary so far. You with me? All right. Housing. Oh, thank you. That was un unnecessarily generous. Um, we have a book coming out uh, in, tentatively in March. Um, it's at the publisher right now. It's being reviewed. It's always a little iffy, but uh, the manuscript is in, so it will be March, April, somewhere in that time frame. It's uh, called Escaping the Housing Trap. It will be all about housing. Um, I'm not going to give you that... that We'll come back, I'll come back, how about, in the middle of next year, and we'll talk about that book. Um, I'm going to give you a couple things, though, to think about that I, I think, I, I hope will change your framing of housing discussions a bit. Um, this is a chart, and I apologize to those of you that don't like charts. There's a story here, uh, but this is the Case-Shiller Index. Uh, it's an index of housing prices over time. Uh, what Case Schiller looks at is how housing prices change relative to income. As incomes go up, prices tend to go up. The two of them kind of go in parallel. You can see some uh, crisis points throughout history. Um, we have the, uh, the, the World Wars where prices went way, way down, the Great Depression. Then uh, suburbanization after World War II. Then you have a series of bubbles. Uh, we have the 1970s. Uh, bubble, the SNL bubble, and then you have the dot com going into the 2008 bubble. Uh, this chart ends uh, after that. And it shows as a predictor this thing going down like this. Is that what actually happened? Uh, no, no, right? Um, if I asked you, this is the audience participation portion of this presentation. If I asked you, what would you characterize the time period between uh, 1999 and 2007 in terms of housing. It was a housing what? Boom, Boom sure. I, I think the term that uh, we've come to use now is housing bubble, right? It's a housing bubble. Are we all comfortable with this term? It was the housing bubble, right? Here's what's happened uh, subsequent. And the fascinating thing about this is that we call this the housing recovery. Thank you for laughing. I, I'm, it's, it's, it's funny in one of those very sad ways, right? Here's the Case-Shiller Index updated. So this chart here uh, runs through really 2011, I think, is when this one ends right there. Um, here's what actually then happened. Here's what this chart looks like. So here's 2011. We went down a little bit, and now we're, we're up here. Um, there's two takeaways from this that I want you to, to have. The first one is that housing is massively complex. If anyone tells you it's one thing, just do this, just do that, just do this, they, 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 they either are lying to you or they're just kind of ignorant. Housing is really, really, really complex. That's why when I read your plan, it's like, here's all the things we need to do. Like, there's a ton of things. Yes, you need to do a whole bunch of things if you want to address this. Here's the other part. Um, if we look at this chart here, the big thing about it is that housing prices historically are about two and a half times out of uh, means, what, what, what it, it should normally be based on our incomes. Um, there's a whole bunch of financial reasons that has taken place, but here's the reality. The, the mean 
is a mathematical expression uh, that denotes uh, spending an equal amount of time above and below. Above and below. We've spent 40 years above the mean. How many people in this house, uh, how many people in this house, how many people in this room are willing to have your house price cut in half? Okay, that wouldn't even get us back to the historical mean, right? You would have to do two-thirds or three-fourths cut in half to get to the mean, and remember, the mean is something you spend half your time below and half your time above. It is really hard to deal with this issue without dealing with price appreciation. And everybody in this room who owns a home benefits from house price appreciation. Whether it's just being able to sleep better at night because you have a lot of equity, or whether you're actively cashing it out, or whether you're planning to use it to fund your retirement or whatever it is. And so as we look at this strategic plan, we have to uh, recognize that within ourselves is a conflict. Because while we want housing to be affordable to you, and if I sell my house, I would like to be able to buy a house at a more affordable price, we certainly do not want our own house prices to go down. And that is a social conundrum that results in very awkward decision-making processes. I will do whatever it takes, maybe, because I'm a very advocate, I'll do whatever it takes to help you get into a house except reduce my own home price. And if you look at our policy through that lens, you will see all kinds of ways that the things we do to help people get into homes are actually things we do to drive up home prices. It reinforces on the way up. What I love about your strategic plan is that it focuses on building more stuff. And at the end of the day, the more stuff we can build, particularly at low level price points, at entry level price points, uh, the more our market will be locally responsive and I think uh, get us to where we want to go. Um, I mentioned that we have a book coming out in, uh, in March. Uh, there's two books already, if you haven't. Strong Towns kind of goes through the first part of this presentation. I didn't talk at all about transportation, but Confessions of a Recovering Engineer talks all about transportation, and the next book that's coming out will talk all about housing. So thank you so much. I went a little over on what I meant to for time, but you were all so attentive and like I said, when everybody's into it, I tend to go slower and spend more time. So hopefully that, hopefully that works. Um, while we're finding, you're gonna, go ahead. Are you gonna lead the Q&A? You want me to do this? You're, I guess you're gonna lead it since you're up there. All right. The they have microphones here because they want to get it recorded, but if you have a question, while someone's raising their hand and people are moving to there, um, strongtowns.org is our website. If you haven't heard of Strong Towns, uh, we publish articles uh, two, three times a day, every weekday. We're on every social media platform. Uh, we do video, podcasting. All of our stuff is Creative Commons licensed. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We are trying to shift the conversation about growth and development, particularly at the local level. So when I say Creative Commons license, what I'm saying is that we have the license that we publish under says any of you who find value in our work are free to use it however it benefits you. What we ask people is thank you. We ask people to just go do good work. <laughs> you don't have to, I always tell people, if I wrote something that you find really insightful, go ahead and copy paste it and put it into your document and pretend you wrote it. <laughs> we have no problems with that. Please. The, thanks, that, that was great. Uh, you touched on two things, two of my favorite topics. One is entrepreneurship and the other is creative development. So I... Uh, entrepreneurship uh, and, and... Creative development. Creative development, creative yeah. Development. So um, I mentor young entrepreneurs. Uh-huh. Um, and the number one bit of advice I give them is just start. Do it now. Start, right. That was one of your guidelines. Yeah. Could you just comment a little bit about the notion of just do it, just start now in this context? Yeah. Um, and let me... I, I, I feel like... Um, I've been through the entrepreneur process myself. So to me, it's less interesting than focusing on like what it means for cities. Because our, our whole thing is about elevating what it means to be a local government, a city, a member of a community that lives in a city. Um, I find that 
a lot of people who work in local government have a very entrepreneurial mindset that is often stifled by the systems that we've created. When we look at the way cities are organized, they're organized around the 1940s, 1950s business model approach of silos and hierarchies. If we look at private practice, private businesses, um, that was the playbook in the 40s and 50s, and then we started to get our butts kicked by other places around the world, and our companies have changed. If you go to any Fortune 500 company today, you go to any successful startup, you go to any place, th they will have a, a management structure, but it looks more like teams than it does these rigid silos and hierarchies. What this does is it takes our entrepreneurial people within government and it constrains them. It allows, it, it allows them to do one thing efficiently over and over again, but not to work cooperatively across teams. And almost all of our things today require that cooperative teamwork. And so when we're advising people on how to be entrepreneurial, um, there's a sense that sometimes you get in government that we have to, I, I call it the Montgomery versus Patton approach because I'm a World War II geek. Um, if you, if you haven't studied this, Montgomery was a British general and he was very successful, but he was kind of uh, notorious for not moving until he had everything assembled. I've got to have all my supply lines. I've got to have everybody here. I've got to have all my troops in a line. And Eisenhower would just get mad at him, like, go already, like, get going. And he'd be like, I'm not quite ready yet. And he would have to have everything. But then when he went, it was very successful, right? It worked well. Patton was the exact opposite. Patton was like, I'm going, keep up with me. And he would just be yelling behind, like, get up here, get up here, go. And he'd be like in the first tank, like, we're going this way. And it was crazy. It was chaos. It was mayhem. But what he did is he just did the next thing. He's like, well, that's the next bridge. Go get it. Well, that's the next town. Go get it. Well, that's the next this. Go get it. And, 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 and everything caught up. An entrepreneurial mindset, um, I, I feel like in City Hall that the way we've created local government makes us have to work like Montgomery, and it actually forces us to do what I've called the, the least dumb thing that consensus creates. <laughs> Instead of working in these large chunks, go out and do the next small thing in front of you. That's what the four-step process is about. It's a mentality. Um, if I can't organize five departments to coordinate, who's the one person in the other department that I meet with at lunch that I like? Can we start working together? Can we expand that? Um, if I can't fix this whole street, can I fix this one crossing? Can I do this one thing? If I got four council members who don't like me, but I got one who does, can I work with that one to get something done here and get it moving? Um, we need to start racking up small wins and we need to look at that strategically as the way we make progress. Because one of the things that I feel like, and, and I'm going to say this as a friend, I, I, I feel like because you, have, because you have created a culture of large projects funded around you know, large government flows, you tend to stagnate and think only in terms of large steps. And what you've done is you've left a lot of things on the table. You've left a lot of stuff on the sidelines that you could do if you had a more bottom-up, entrepreneurial, take a bunch of steps kind of approach. So thanks for the question. Um, go ahead. You, you, you guys are in charge. Go ahead. Over here. Thanks for um, I'm curious about your walking tour this morning, where it was and what you saw. Um, help me out, Fairview neighborhood? Um, what, what corridor? Yeah, Gamble. I remember I was like, is this spelled Gamble as if I'm gambling to cross it? Um, and it's not spelled that way, but that was the vibe, right? Um, let, me, let me say this in a, in a, much of that walking tour made me very sad. And it made me very sad Probably not for the same reason that it makes some of you sad. I, I, I got the stories of, of redlining and I got the stories of a neighborhood kind of uh, uh, just discounted and not loved very much. Um, not, not by themselves, but by higher ups making decisions on their behalf. 
Um, and I, re I, re I respect that story, and I think that's an important story to, to tell yourselves and to talk about. Um, that's not the thing that made me sad. And it's not the thing that made me sad, not because it's not sad, but because it's, it's an oft-repeated story. It's a very common story. Um, the parts that made me sad were, I, I know you're not a rich city. I, I, I'm, I come from a small town in central Minnesota. Um, it, it, we live on the edge, right? Like, like there, there's not, this is not the frontier, right? The way that people would have understood it 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago, right? Where well, you don't live in that. But we live in the closest thing to like a frontier that anyone in North America, any, anyone who's gonna vote for the next president, we're on the far edge of what like frontier life would be like. Um, very isolated, very alone, kind of dependent on uh, getting stuff shipped in. Um, you've got small growing seasons. You've got, uh, you know, very difficult freeze-thaw cycles. Um, you have many months of dark. Like I, there's a certain mentality it takes to live in a place like yours, and there's a certain mentality it takes to live in a place like mine, and they are, in a sense, similar, right? When I look at, particularly in between the two highways, which the two highways made me sad, but when I look in the neighborhood in between and the neighborhood directly adjacent, and I look at how much money you have spent on infrastructure that is actually making you poorer. So you've spent about three times what you should have spent, and as a result, you made your neighborhood worse. It just makes me sad. Because it's not like you didn't have the money, and it's not like you didn't care. And so it's almost like a tragedy built on top of a tragedy, right? I think if I could ask something, I would ask you to go out and look at that neighborhood, look at those highways that, that, that you know, bisect that neighborhood and really cut it up, and recognize, just stand there for a while and look at it. Like walk around and let's look like very, very closely. Try to inhabit that space for an hour at some point in the next month. Just go out there and be. And I think you, you will come to the same recognition that what you're lacking is not resources. Like you, you look at the resource that you put in play. What you're lacking is a business model to actually make the neighborhood better and make the place better. And that's just like a, 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 an edge example, like it's a, it's a very dramatic example of what we see to a lesser extent in other neighborhoods. But I mean, you've got a four lane, you've got an eight lane highway through this neighborhood. Four lanes in one direction, four lanes in the other. Maybe you have a traffic flow model that says somewhere there someday will need to be three lanes. I'm telling you, two lanes is too much for me. I mean, I, 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 the design of that um, and, and what it imposes on your city uh, makes no sense to me. And it makes me very, very, very sad because it's hurting not just the people in that neighborhood, but it's hurting all of you, hurting everybody. And it's benefiting no one, really. I mean, maybe some distant commuter is having 60 seconds shaved off their commute because they can drive through your neighborhoods at 45 instead of 35. But it, it, it's ultimately not helping. And that makes me sad. <laughs> Ask me a happy question. <laughs> Please, who, who has the... We have a couple questions down here and then we'll be out of time. So if there's anyone in the back, grab Go Jennifer. Ahead. Please. I'm just gonna ask one back there. Ooh, so. One right here first. Oh, one up here. Okay, you're gonna have to fight with each other. I'm, I'm glad you segued into transportation. That's a favorite topic of mine. Okay. Isn't a strong town one in which neighborhood density reaches a level that allows walkability and transit as an alternative to vehicle ownership? And recognizing that Anchorage won't grow enough in the next 20 years to have any walkable neighborhoods with 20 to 30 DUA unless we target our infill and redevelopment. Um, as we look at rezoning, is it then wise to honor our comprehensive plan, which calls for targeted infill 
and redevelopment to strengthen our urban centers and create walkable neighborhoods? It's a big, big question. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't want to start off nitpicking it, but let me nitpick a tiny bit. Because you started out with density. And if you go to Strong Towns and you read our stuff, you will never find us advocating for density. And there's a really good reason for that. What I have witnessed and experienced is that when people focus on density as a metric, they build really bad places. We need to focus on building really good places. And when we do, density is kind of a byproduct of that. But when we go out and focus on building density, like sheer number of units, we tend to build places that people don't want to be in. And so for a place to be viable over the long term, it has to be a place that people want to be in. I, I feel like part of the tension here, um, and I, I think I picked this up from you and I've also picked it up from other places. I feel like part of the tension here is um, whether we should, um, and let me say this, in a, w w I hope this doesn't come across as pejorative, whether we should, in a top-down way, specify where growth should happen or where neighborhoods should thicken up, or whether we should kind of allow it to organically happen. And I am of the mindset of the latter, that we should allow it to organically happen. Now, that being said, right, um, the idea of organically having things happen is to build on success. Um, so, a lot of cities will go out and say, here's our corridor plan, and here's our five nodes, and here's, you know, where our transit's going to line up. And then the, no one develops that way. Like, it, they put the public investment in, and the private investment doesn't happen. And then everybody's mad. Like, that didn't work, and, you know, da da da, da. Uh, To me, I think the vision is a good one. I think what is lacking is a little bit of humility. Because to, to create, let's just say, a transit node, a transit node, a place where good transit system would stop and pick people up and bring people to some other place. In order for that to work, it's not a transportation issue. There's a transportation component to it, yes, but it's really a neighborhood development issue. What does a good transit stop look like? Well, it looks like a neighborhood with people who can walk to it. It looks like a, a neighborhood where you've got a corner grocery store and maybe some other commercial near that, near that node. Well, okay, if we start looking at that, the bigger question is, which of your neighbors is gonna embrace that? If we had 20 neighborhoods in a city, it might be one where the cultural thing going on in that neighborhood, the vibe there, the people there are like, yeah, that's what we want. And you're gonna have 19 where if you try to shove it down their throats, they're gonna show up and fight you. Well, my approach as a city would be, let's nurture that one. They're gr like, let's let everybody into this party. Like anybody who wants to do it can do it. But when they start to do it, let's go out there. Let's take the limited resources we have and say, all right, you're working out here. Uh, how do we help you get to the next level? Go to that four-step approach and all right, you, you, you want a corner store? Like we'll rezone that. Like let's make that happen. Okay, you can't walk here. Let's get out here with some cones and fix that and make that work. And yep, okay, people responded to that. All right, let's make it permanent. You, you, you iterate. You're kind of like grooming and gardening this neighborhood up. Now you've got a great node. You've got a great spot. And it's organic. It happened. You're, you're just reinforcing it. So the idea that we'll have great transit, yes. Do we create great transit and then that creates neighborhoods? I think we've seen that fail over and over and over. Do we create great places and then connect them with transit and then keep building? I, to me, that's a more humble approach and it's gonna be a more successful approach. So does that answer your question? I feel like at the end of the day, the goals you espouse are the same goals that I would have, but the means to get there would maybe be slightly different. Is that fair? It seems that if you grow, if you grow everywhere all at once, you get in city sprawl, as opposed to ever having density in that Yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll, I'll say this in a way. Here's our, here's our city. Yep, I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to repeat it. Here's our city. It's this big. If we are going to have a strategy that says grow everywhere at once, um, what we're going to do is just get denuded growth. We're just going to get unproductive stuff kind of spattered everywhere. And I, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, if we were to say as the exact opposite, 
here's where we're going to concentrate growth, we can actually have growth that reinforces itself that then can be served by transit and all that. That's kind of the um, green metropolis kind of mindset. Uh, I actually don't ascribe to that either because I don't think it happens or I, I've seen it in so many places be kind of imposed and not take, like not work, despite massive public investment. To me, a hybrid approach of those two makes a lot of sense, which is I'm not gonna subsidize new growth out on the edge. I mean, let's just have as a blanket statement. I, I, I always hesitate to make like, this applies everywhere, but I'm comfortable saying this applies everywhere. We should not build one more foot of sewer, water, uh, roadway. Like we just, we don't need, you have way more than you can maintain now. The idea that we would have another subdivision, another neighborhood, uh, like that's absurd, right? Like just stop doing it. But beyond that, the idea that we have this existing city and we can identify exactly what neighborhoods are going to prosper, I'm, I, don't, I don't have that confidence. And so what I would do is I would try to set up the conditions where anybody can come to the table and play. I want to, in my neighborhood, we want to have more duplexes and triplexes and cottages and corner stores and all this stuff. And if your neighborhood is that neighborhood, I'm, I'm all over that. How do we help you do that? How do we get you to that thing? And then once you build that up, how do we, you know, I've got this much money to spend. I've got this much demand. Uh, I'm going to choose to spend my money in the neighborhood that's actually kicking butt, that's doing awesome. So you kind of get to where I think you're trying to get to, but you do it in a way that is more um, bottom up and I think respectful of the, the, the neighborhoods and I also think more successful. So last question, is that what you said? Okay, La last question. Keep the answer short. Okay. I'll try and keep it. I'll keep, <laughs> it quite, I'll keep the question fairly short. Um, first of all, huge fan. Thank you for all your work. I really appreciate it. I'm also a recovering engineer, so that may be why. Um, so my question for you is, you, you keep on saying that uh, Anchorage is a city, and it isn't really a city. It's, a, it's more or less a region, which is incorporated what in other structures would be separate cities. So imagine the situation that you're talking to Minneapolis, and uh, Brenard is a neighborhood. It's treated as a neighborhood of Minneapolis, only even though it's, you know, in our case, my community 40, 50 miles away, in your case, it'd be 130. Um, what would your advice be about how to approach this problem when you're really dealing with a collection of disparate communities, disparate economic structures, di separate problems, but obviously related problems as well? It, it is... Um it is such a good question, and I think it's so hard, and I was told to answer it very quickly. So let me, um, <laughs> let me try to answer it in this way. The development model you have now, the approach that you've taken now, has suggested, or, or, or says, we are going to have a diminished quality of life the closer you get to the center of the city, so that people out on the edge can uh, build and expand and occupy those spaces. That is, a, that is a intentional growth strategy. It's a strategy saying we're gonna sacrifice our core in order to have growth out on the edge. I think you need to very intentionally go the other way and say we're going to really, really, really uh, make living in the middle of our city the greatest experience that it can be. We're gonna actually make that the most desirable land in our city. We're gonna make it so desirable that everybody with lots of money wants to move there. I realize that's a long way from where you are now, but to me that's like the North Star goal, right? Like that's where we're trying to be. And doing that is going to, by necessity, in a sense, negate some of the advantages of living on the edge. And let me just make this very, very clear. It's an advantage to someone very far out if I can drive through your neighborhood at 50 miles an hour. It wrecks living in your neighborhood. It like destroys everything about living in your neighborhood that is positive. And so driving through your neighborhood should be something done at 15 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour max. And I'm not talking about the speed limit. I'm talking about the design speed. Like it should be hard to drive more than 20 miles an hour through your core neighborhoods. 
what that will do is it will make living on the edge less convenient because now your neighborhood is not just a convenient bypass for me, it's an obstacle for me. If we can't wrestle with that trade-off and make that shift, we're gonna struggle to maintain anything we've built, really. And so I, I, I think having that mindset shift is gonna get you a, a long, long way. Out of time. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been very, very nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, thank you, Mr. Roan, for all of your great work and for inspi hopefully inspiring uh, the folks in the room today to move into our next exercise uh, this afternoon, which is our, our breakouts. But in the, before we get there, uh, we wanted to present a little <laughs> token of hospitality. You this don't have to do show and nice. tell. Um, this is uh, some items that represent Alaska <laughs> um, and are from our, our beautiful Anchorage Museum and a couple other local businesses. So Thank please you. enjoy. Thank you so much. And um, I, if you go to strongtowns.org and sign up for our email list, we will let you know in February when I'm, I'm going to come back. I might be bringing other people with me, but for sure I'll be back. And we're going to do member meetups and other things too. So like, I don't even know what the event I'm coming here for February is for, but let, let's, keep, <laughs> let, let's keep this momentum going because I, I do love what you're doing and I, there's a lot of heart here. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I'm leaving uh, this keynote with the image of uh, being in that tank saying, go, go, go. Um, that's absolutely the kind of energy that we need. Um, thank you, Charles. We're so happy you could uh, be here and able to engage with us this afternoon uh, as we bite our teeth into the meat of the housing strategic plan. Uh, for now, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, before I announce that, though, um, security has found a lost phone. So if anyone in the audience has lost their phone, security has it in the hall. Uh, with that, we're going to be back in five minutes. So really quick, five minutes.
One, two. Okay, wonderful. All right, folks. Um, so two-minute warning. If you can start heading back to your seats, please. Two-minute warning if you can start heading back to your seats. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone, I'm going to call us back. I know there's lots of good conversation happening. People are excited to do stuff. Um, we're going to focus you guys uh, for just a little bit, and then we're going to move into our interactive breakout session. So I know people are excited to keep talking. So I'm sorry to interrupt your conversations, but we are going to spend the afternoon really digging in and, and taking that action that we've been talking about. So if folks could just sit down really briefly. Um, or if you do need to continue a conversation, just head out in the hallway. So we've got about a brief 10-minute uh, presentation. We're going to dive back into the strategic plan, get everybody oriented to that. And then we're going to spend uh, most of the rest of the afternoon really talking and working together to, uh, to, to, to how we can take action. OK. Um, so just real briefly, so let's uh, look back at the housing strategic plan. So again, this draft, um, if you don't have a copy, just come see one of our staff and they'll make sure you get one. Um, so we're going to be walking through this plan. You know, we gave you a preview right before lunch. 
Um, we want to give you a sense of where the assembly and really the whole community is headed in the next few years on housing policy. So then we're going to move into our breakout sessions um, that give everybody an option to participate however you would like to. So we're going to have a lot of great discussions about the specific actions that are proposed in this plan. We're going to look at some real world examples of that. Um, but also we have for folks who maybe just want to learn more, you don't necessarily want to dig in on planning. Um, we've also got a couple of great sessions this afternoon where you can um, keep learning and keep having that conversation. Um, so we'll go briefly over it and then we'll, we'll get into more detail about how we're going to be um, doing the rest of the afternoon. So uh, next slide. Wait, should I be pointing it this way? Yeah, one second. OK, great. Um, so to set the context, again, we looked at the vision, we looked at the goals, we looked at really the big picture guiding direction of this plan. Um, what we're going to spend time on is how we actually do all of this work. Um, so to set the context, I want to emphasize that what we're sharing today is the Assembly Strategic Plan for Housing. It, there are other plans that set the community's vision, including our comprehensive plan and our land use plan. We also have many plans uh, from partners, you know, the organizations, what they're going to do, or um, recommendations like what uh, ACDA shared this morning. Um, so we're not intending to replace those plans. This is really to help focus policymakers' work and our partners on what we want to accomplish um, in the next few years. So in our plan, uh, we seek to build upon the vision and goals the community and our partners have already expressed and really narrowed it down to the assembly's part in all of this. Um, and I really just want to point out, um, when you're writing a strategic plan, you really think about who's going to be doing the work. So again, it's not that it's just the 12 assembly members and our staff, and really not just the whole municipality. This is an everybody plan. But we wanted to write our, our actions and our goals in a way that reflects what we're going to do. The assembly doesn't build housing, right? We're not going to go out there and start building apartments. Um, so we're really looking at how we incentivize more housing. We want to increase home ownership. The assembly is not buying houses for people. So, so how, do we, how do we increase people's ability to buy a house? Um, and, and so on. So that's really thinking about kind of, again, framing. We want to look at the big picture. We want to think about the outcomes of more housing. And then we have to take a couple steps back to how we can encourage that to happen, how we can incentivize that, and how we can remove barriers. Um, so we're almost there. But we need your help to make sure we're on track. So over the last few years, um, the assembly has been gathering suggestions from city planners, uh, industry experts, community members, reviewing prior plans. Really, this first set of bubbles there, there's a lot of um, uh, policy direction that the assembly has set. There's studies and plans, prior actions, really a, a, at least a, over a decade of work that we were able to build on when looking and building this strategic plan. Um, and we've already done some of that work. So uh, we've eliminated parking minimums. We've made it easier to build accessory dwelling units. And then we have some uh, current legislation out there that has already been discussed and we will continue to be working on. Um, we've, so we've got a big list of things that we want to do next. But we know we can't do it all, so we've really been working to narrow down that list to the ones that we feel will have the most impact and the quickest return. Uh, and I'll say quickest return because we want to we want to start showing those wins. Uh, Chuck said that we wanted to see a lot of small wins, right? Um, so some of those are going to be making those changes quickly. Other ones are going to take time, like the idea of an infrastructure bank. We're not going to do that tomorrow, but we can start laying the groundwork to get there. Um, so what we're sharing with you is really, like I said, a draft plan, lots of actions on there, and we really want to see what you, the community, think what our industry experts think, what co community members think, where should we really focus our time. And then we want to come back in December so that we can formally uh, finalize and adopt the plan. So again, this is not the only opportunity to engage. We know that we just put it out there to the public. Um, our goal is not to put this on Tuesday's meeting and just pass it. We really want to work it through this process uh, and not, not to slow things down, but to really make sure that we're headed in the right direction. Um, Sorry, I think I got ahead of myself. Okay, um, so we took all of our ideas, grouped them into six general categories of strategies. And so those are what's up uh, on the board and also on the plan itself. And underneath each of the strategies, you'll see a, a bunch of specific actions that we can take. Um, so we grouped them into these six categories, these potential actions. And, and as you go into the breakouts, we'll go into what that looks like. Um, but what we're really asking you to do is to look at real world examples um, 
individual properties, stories from individual people looking for housing, and really think about which of the actions on this list can help solve the problems that are brought up in these examples that we're going to go through. Because really the goal is to, to bring it back to real world examples, to local issues, and to make sure that we're focusing on what we feel is, is going to make a big difference in our community. So, um, so I also want to say that if, we, if you have ideas after the forum, you can send them to us later. You can email uh, the uh, assembly email. It's uh, WWMAS at anchorjk.gov. We can make that available to everybody. Hopefully you've, you've sent in testimony before, but if you haven't, this is a great first time to try. Um, and we really want to encourage you to, um, to help us be part of the solution, help us figure out what this plan needs to look like, and then over the next few years, help us do this work. Um, you know, going back to Chuck's point, we need to do the work, we need to do the thing, we need to get out there and do it, and I know everybody in this room is excited to, to get to work on that. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Felix um, to lay out what we're gonna do for the breakouts, and then we will move into our afternoon activity. All right, thanks so much, Anna. You're good. Okay, so um, there are gonna be two rounds of breakout sessions and you'll get to choose which spaces you'd like to spend your time in. Uh, so each breakout's gonna last 35 minutes with a five minute break in between. Um, so I'm gonna talk through those breakout sessions, uh, but you can also refer to page three of your program for more information. Uh, so here in the main room, AARP, uh, yeah, AARP, uh, is sponsoring two presentations facilitated by Eco Northwest on the uh, top of uh, on the topic of middle housing. The first is a foundational presentation about what middle housing is, and the second presentation digs deeper into how a middle housing works in a community. Both presentations will be live streamed as part of our uh, standard program, so online viewers stay tuned. Meanwhile, the two other breakout rooms will be focused on housing action, where you'll discuss case studies to help inform the strategies of the strategic plan. So that uh, stage one will be the two middle housing, and then this will be, uh, the back of this room will close, and that space will be dedicated to breaking barriers to housing development. Uh, so case studies in that room will explore questions like, why are good properties uh, undeveloped? Are we leaving housing units on the table? Who pays for public infrastructure? In the den, area three, uh, down the hall and to the right, there will be case studies focused on housing affordability. So these conversations will center around themes including how can we make housing more secure and keep people housed? What are barriers to affordable rent? And uh, we have a great activity to let you uh, get to know Anchorage's rental market. So this is a bit of a choose your own adventure here. Uh, here are all of the case study themes which are also available to browse on page three of your program. You can go back and forth between rooms or stay in one room for both br uh, breakouts. Uh, I also wanna point out that we have copies of all six case studies at the check-in tables and we would love it if you could take these with you and try these conversations at home uh, with your friends and colleagues. Um, all of the materials will also be on our anchoragehousingaction.org website for future use. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and take 10 minutes to transition into those spaces. So if you're interested in middle housing, stay here. A and then we'll see you at 145, uh, excuse me, we'll see you at uh, 155 uh, p.m. in the first session of your choosing. bad and and sorry folks I also want to encourage folks to spread out um, if you have like a certain planning expertise or community member we want to make sure that we have good teams as Charles was saying uh, in each of our groups
Okay. Yeah. Tell me if I'm. <laughs> All right. They're telling us we need to get started. All right. Hello? All right. We're going to get started on our presentation and discussion. My name is Jennifer Cannon. I'm a senior project manager at Echo Northwest. And AARP Alaska asked us to come here to provide some insights on middle housing. Um, this is a part of the AARP Livable Communities Technical Advisors Program. It's a really great program that we are helping AARP with. And uh, we've been working for them for several years now where we get to go to diverse communities across the US and help them with tricky housing problems and middle housing issues, housing shortage issues, and affordable housing topics. And there are all sorts of different types of engagement. Sometimes there are presentations and best practice guides. And it's, it's a really great opportunity for us to share what we're learning from other communities. So we um, also are helping out ARP with a best practice guide on middle housing. We um, put out a statewide legislation guide that's available right now, it's free, and it um, provides, it provides um, pointers on how a state could help re-legalize middle housing. Um, we are currently working on a local level uh, guide that will be released in 2024, and um, this could be a very helpful guide to the city of Anchorage and other um, communities. And I would like to give Becky an opportunity to introduce herself as well. Thanks. I'm Becky Hewitt. I'm a project director with Echo Northwest. Um, and we are a consulting firm. We're headquartered in Portland, Oregon, but we have offices in Seattle and LA and Boise. And we increasingly work across the country. Um, I've been working on our middle housing related work for several years. Um, and um, helped put together the state um, model act that Jen mentioned, and it w Jen and I are working together on the local guidance. Um, and then I've worked with a number of jurisdictions across Oregon. Um, Oregon passed statewide middle housing legislation um, and it, a couple years ago, and so worked with the state on kind of helping define what it needed to look like to implement that at the local level and then with several jurisdictions locally on their efforts, um, trying to help them think through what some of their policy choices might mean in terms of supporting middle housing development and the types of outcomes that they might expect. Um, so I'm gonna let Jen, uh, Jen's gonna take the lead on this first part of the session, kind of introducing middle housing. Um, and then I'm gonna come back in part two to talk about making middle housing work in your community and talk a little bit more about some of the kind of regulatory best practices that um, are emerging through our work with AARP. Great, so I'm just gonna give a little background on middle housing for those who need it. I'll give a little background on what it is, why it's needed, and who lives in middle housing. And then um, we'll lead into some more detail on how to make it work. We'll get into some of the policy details on what's helping other communities and basically reduce the obstacles to middle housing development. So as I was thinking about this presentation, I wanted to kind of do a, a deep thought about how did I get to know middle housing in my own life? And I actually have a middle housing story. When I uh, was in graduate school, I lived in a neighborhood that was chock full of older housing. It was a historical neighborhood. And the housing had been built from around 1900s to 1950s. And it had carriage homes, accessory dwelling units, duplexes, triplexes, a lot of old, older Victorian homes that were subdivided for four to six different living spaces. There was um, townhomes that were built in the neighborhood also that were as, as an infill development project. It was just chock full of diverse housing. And it was the best neighborhood in the town I lived in. It was vibrant, it was super pedestrian friendly. It was a neighborhood everybody took their kids to go trick or treating to because the houses were like right one after another and it was just the best place to go to walk around and um, just feel that inviting community uh, vibrancy. And I got to thinking, is why is this such a rare thing to have a neighborhood like this? 
And in that neighborhood, they had to allow middle housing because there was so much of that housing already there. They couldn't have policies that would restrict middle housing. But in other neighborhoods, that wasn't the case. So that got me on my path, personally, to look into how we can make more vibrant neighborhoods like that with that really rich diversity. So when we're talking about middle housing, it's good to define it. Um, middle housing is more than one living unit, but less than an apartment complex. So it's all of that housing in the middle. It can include accessory dwelling units, duplexes, triplexes, cottage housing, townhouses, and a lot of it is built to look like single family detached housing. It's that built at the same scale. Um, and it provides that gentle density that we've been talking about all day. So why is middle housing missing? In many communities, middle housing has been missing due to regulatory obstacles that were imposed primarily in the mid 20th century through zoning code regulations where it restricted middle housing from being built in residential neighborhoods. However, there is a movement growing to relegalize these types of housing. People realizing people don't all want to live in a single family detached home with a huge yard. They want more diverse options. There's smaller households that we are having increase in, our, in all different communities and in our nation generally. So there is a movement growing to relegalize middle housing and that movement has hit Ingridge from what I hear. So that's really exciting to hear. So to give you a little bit more of an introduction to middle housing, we like to show examples of what it looks like, where it might be located in your community already. Um, a lot of communities are doing walking tours, and I really wish we could do a walking tour, but that's not possible. So we're gonna just do a tour with our eyes and look at some examples of middle housing. Here's some local examples of middle housing. Um, on the left is a triplex that was built by the Cook Inlet Housing Authority. And it's, you know, as you can see, it's very nicely designed. It does not look like three living spaces, but it is, it is providing that. And then on the right is a duplex that was also built by the same organization. And then here's some examples of middle housing in, that's north of Anchorage. And there are a couple of fourplexes. It's important to note that middle housing often is designed to mirror the, the era of architecture. So sometimes it might look more like 70s housing or 80s housing. housing. It's, you know, it's gonna be a product of any other types of housing eras. And then we have some examples from all different um, areas across the nation. Um, on the top left is an accessory dwelling unit that's attached and built above a garage. I actually have one right now and I rent it out and it's a great source of income. And uh, there's duplexes and sixplexes and fourplexes and triplexes, townhomes and cottage housing. I don't know if anybody knows what cottage housing in, but is, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of a definition. It's housing that's usually smaller size from 800 square feet to about 1,800 square feet. And there usually is about four units in a development, at least. And then they have a common open space in the middle that everybody can use. And they might also have a shared parking area and shared driveway entrance. And here's some um, examples of townhouses that are built in another neighborhood uh, in Oregon. And as you can see, this is built to be very pedestrian friendly. And here are some examples of duplexes. And then an example of a fourplex and a uh, 12 plex. That example on the left is actually in that neighborhood I lived in in my graduate school days in Florida. So why should we encourage middle housing? Why are we all talking about this? Well, middle housing is a great form of a smaller housing unit, and it provides more housing choices. There are different needs and preferences of different people, and so it's one of, the, one of those ways you can diversify your housing stock. Um, there's a potential for multi-generational housing with middle housing, and they're generally lower cost than new single-family detached housing. It can, it can be integrated into the single-family neighborhoods quite nicely, and then it can provide a potential for greater socioeconomic integration within neighborhoods, which we're lacking in a lot of neighborhoods. And it can help expand the housing supply in areas with little available land. It's a great form of infill development. So who might choose to live in middle housing? 
there's a broad variety of people that might choose to live in middle housing, and your housing choice might change throughout your lifetime. That's what that graphic is showing on the left. And this is something we show to a lot of communities that when you are a single senior or older adult, you may want to downsize. So it's, it's one of those um, different types of housing choices you might make. Um, so middle housing helps to provide smaller homes for smaller households. It's a lower cost of housing that can be placed in desirable neighborhoods. It can help people age in place or age in community. It's more environmentally sustainable housing, and as I mentioned earlier, it can provide multi-generational generational housing accommodations. Um, seniors are one of the main populations that might be seeking middle housing. They might be seeking lower maintenance housing. And uh, first-time home buyers might be seeking middle housing. We have a reduction across the nation with the building of um, entry-level housing. And so middle housing is thought to be one of those ways to help fill that gap. Um, and it's also really helpful for single-person households. And as we've been seeing, in, even in acreage, that there is a reduction in the household size. And the four-person nuclear family household is not the dominant household anymore. Um, and it provides a, a way to downsize. Here's an actual example of my mother-in-law's house. She lives in a row home. And um, she was able to downsize from a larger house. And she has this nice little row home with a nice little porch. And she has a common space, open space, that she does not have to maintain. So she loves it. She's gone a lot, taking care of grandkids. So it's a great uh, place for her to live that lower maintenance type of lifestyle. Um, did you want to talk about? <laughs> Okay. Middle housing also is a way to provide more accessible housing. This is something really important for AARP. Um, Anchorage is an age-friendly community, and so this is something that really should be promoted more often, is to have more accessible housing that's built for those with limited mobility. Uh, there are various ways you can promote that. There are requirements by the federal government through the ADA act to provide accommodations for housing that has more than four units. Um, they have to provide co accommodations such as uh, wider entryways into common spaces and um, walls reinforced for grab bars and um, other accessibility features such as like lower light switches and, and whatnot. Another way to promote accessibility is through visitability and basically this is accommodations added to a house that make it so that anybody can visit, regardless of their mobility. Um, and it, it requires things like a uh, zero step or one step entry and uh, wider hallways and uh, first floor bathroom access. The city of Portland actually incentivizes visitability through bonus units. So that's something to look at. But overall, it gives an opportunity to build more accessible housing. So one thing we want to point out that middle housing is great, but it is not a silver bullet and it won't resolve all of your housing issues. It's just one of the tools in your housing strategy toolkit. And it really helps to serve that moderate income to middle income household in the spectrum of households from 70% to 120% AMI. If people are housing nerds and you know what I'm talking about. But it, it's, it's one of the many ways to help provide more housing. It's not going to provide low-income housing, per se. That's going to re require some other types of strategies that are going to um, probably involve subsidies and other types of efforts. And one other thing we want to point out is middle housing pricing you know, tends to be less expensive than new single-family detached housing. We have explored this topic through analysis in different communities. And this is an analysis we completed for Washington County, Oregon. We have not done that for Anchorage. But basically what it shows is that um, we've looked at housing prices and compared them. And it shows that recent new uh, construction, it tends to be less expensive for townhomes, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, and cottage housing in comparison to new single family detached housing. So bottom line with this is that when you build housing that takes up less space, and less land, it tends to be less expensive. I don't know if anybody was at the trivia night last night, but we have a couple of middle housing trivia questions. If you guys want to indulge us with these, we can do them. 
Um, and then, we, you know, that's pretty much all we have. We, we can just have some discussion if you guys want to have a discussion. All right. All right, which of the following best defines middle housing? This is a test on whether you were listening, <laughs> because honestly, the whole day, because there was many presentations talking about middle housing, which was really nice. Is it A, housing located in the middle of a city? B, housing with middle quality appliances? Or C, diverse housing with more than one housing unit, but fewer units than apartment buildings that is similar in scale to single detached homes? <laughs> C, good job. <laughs> All right, so this is a Where's Waldo kind of trivia question. And it's just kind of showing how middle housing can blend in with single family detached homes. And out of these options, which of these do you think is middle housing? Do you think option A is middle housing? Anybody? What about option B? Option C? Or option D? <laughs> yeah, I know, I didn't frighten, yeah. It's a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> All right, it's option D. And that's, yeah, that's exactly, that's great because that's another view of the house. So you can see that there's another porch entry on the um, left side. All right, another one. So do you think option A is middle housing? Anybody? What about option B? Option C? Or option D? And you can select multiple. <laughs> All of the above, okay. A and D. All right, they all are middle of housing. So good job, the person in the front. <laughs> oh, and I should go back. Um, option D is where Becky's parents live. So they live in a cottage cluster housing development. So, op you know, the option A is a duplex, and option B is a duplex, and option C is a quadplex that was converted from an older home. All right, one more. Uh, where's Waldo question? Can you spot the middle housing? Do you think option A is middle housing? What about option B? Option C, anybody? <laughs> or option D? All of them. All right, so option A, B, and D were middle housing. Option A is an ADU. You can see it in the back. It's an ADU that's built on top of a garage. And option B is multi-generational housing. And option D is an ADU that's a detached ADU. And that's it for the first part of our presentation. Um, we were going to have some discussion if people want to talk about middle housing, if you have any questions. All right. We can do questions and discussion here. I'll get, I'll, I can bring the mic around. So some thoughts as kind of the history of Anchorage. I think our builders build single family homes. They sell really quick. They're risk averse. That's what we do mostly. And, and I think most people want single family homes. And we've had some surveys that are continuously misinterpreted. There was a survey that went out and said, where do you think we should build housing and what type? Well, people would say, yeah, build apartment buildings, right? I don't want to live there, but I think we should build more. So that's interpreted as, oh, people want more apartment buildings like they would live there. So you got to be a little careful with some of these surveys that show what our desires are here. But you know, that you have some beautiful examples of the, um, you know, three, four, three or four plexes that look just like single family homes. That that's not how we do it here. What we do is we take a we cube have one door, and somewhere in there, there's four others, and we pave the entire thing, and it's got landscaping as three dumpsters, okay? So that was historically what we've done, and then um, nine, 10 years ago, we changed our code, and we have some minimum design standards. You have to landscape, you have to hide the dumpsters a little bit, have a little articulation, things like that. Well, now we get tremendous pushback on that, even though those are written to the lowest standards, just to raise it a little bit. But builders tell us that's destroying all building. We're not building because those three trees are required and because I can't pave the whole thing, et cetera, and so on. Um, so we're now in the process of getting rid of those design standards and going back. You know, builders say, we don't build ugly buildings. They don't, the ones involved here, but others do. And 
That's why people get nervous about this, though, is because we have this memory, and there's examples in town. It's just a stick cube, one door. So do you, I don't know, do you see that? Or? I'll let Becky answer that one. <laughs> I, think, I think Jen touched on this briefly, but um, they, what, what we've seen is that middle housing it, the, the way the middle housing looks is a combination of the rules in place in the time at the time that it's built and then the sort of predominant architectural vibe at the time. So I live in a detached home built in 1969. It was a real ugly spud from the street when I bought it. That, there are certain eras that are not renowned for having really cute architecture. If you have a lot of your housing built in one of those eras, not everything is really cute from the street. Um, and I think there's a, there's a balance, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in the second session, between having prescriptive standards that ensure that things look very cute, like they were built in 1919, and they have like little cottage, you know, porch things, and, and being totally flexible. And there's, there's a pretty wide spectrum there. Um, I think with having um, dialed back your parking requirements, that might help because the, the tendency to pave everything in front of your building um, is partly because if you have to build a lot of parking, getting it around the back does take more space than just putting it in the front. And if you don't think anyone cares, you would just put it in the front. But you can require less parking or require it go around the back. And as long as there's space on the site, you can get the parking in the back. So I would say we tend to fall on the side of and we'll talk about this more later, um, having some, some standards that are clear, that are straightforward, not too persnickety, but they get at the things that matter, that make the housing, whether it's middle housing or single detached housing, because snout houses also not so beautiful from the street, um, that get at how it faces the street and how it impacts people that might walk by and, and support that kind of walkable vibe. And the only other thing I would add is that, um, again, single detached houses can be just as big offenders as middle housing, if not more so. And we saw some examples in some of the other presentations today. Um, so making sure that whatever standards you're applying to middle housing to make it kind of look the way that you would want, that those are similarly applied to single detached housing. And some of the, you know, Lots of parking and having dumpsters rather than trash cans are specific to multiple units, but some of the things are not. And so um, I think there's that, there's that balance there. There are other, yeah. So I, I think you've hit on one of the ideas about what sort of perhaps minimum design standards. And if you could find a way to come up with a design standard or components that would then guarantee you a more of a use by right, a expedited permit process. It addresses the concerns by the neighborhood. And then the third thing would be if you could find a way to reduce the costs. If you could get all those three things done, it would be, I think, a good way to get neighborhoods to accept middle housing and get developers to accept middle housing. You guys are stealing all my thunder for the next session. Um, absolutely, and I think the, um, Per permit ready plans is one one way of describing what you're talking about, which is saying, if you build a thing that looks like this, we are okay with it. We have already checked that it meets all of our codes and requirements. And you can, when you create the permit ready plan, you can try to make sure that it looks in a way that you're happy with. Um, and that doesn't mean you dial it in, down to the paint color, but you know, you, you get the kind of architectural vibes roughly right. Um, and then if you do that, that should allow for lower permitting costs, lower design costs, expedited permitting, and maybe not guaranteed neighborhood acceptance, but if you've given people some ability to provide input on the permit ready plans, then their input has been heard, and hopefully the developments can then move forward. Other comments, questions, yeah? So I came to this because I saw the ARP and I was um, hoping that you were going to address senior housing in Alaska. But So this is kind of off topic, but um, I don't know if you're aware of the costs for 
assisted living in Anchorage. And uh, we currently, we moved our mom down to Arizona for $3,200 a month uh, memory care in a facility that would have been 9,000 a month in Anchorage. She's got a friend that needs no assistance at 6,500 a month. So I really think um, it'd be really nice for ARP to focus on how do we help seniors that, that don't wanna be a burden on their family but really can't live alone anymore. It's really hard up here. I was gonna ask if Marge wanted to chime in on that one. That's something we're very involved in at the state legislature is expanding access and options for home and community-based services. Um, that it, so one example is a, is a bill that was passed this past session that adds a, a type of facility um, kind of commonly known as assisted living home light. Um, it's called adult host homes. It kind of lowers the barrier for a facility and a provider for, to, to bring in one or two seniors um, and who need less services than, than full-on assisted living. But yeah, that's work that we're very much involved in at the legislative level. Yeah. Um, I am sorry because I uh, missed the first portion of your presentation, but um, caught the back half. Um, and so I was just curious if um, there is a standard definition or maybe an industry standard slash best practice that you're seeing nationally um, around the number of units that qualify middle housing. It's a great question. Uh, so. I would say um, there's sort of tiers. So I would say there's pretty strong agreement on up to four units. I think all of the places where we've seen this defined formally, it does extend up to like a quadplex. Um, that's not maybe not 100% universal, but I'd say that's kind of the common denominator. And then there are some places, Washington, Jensen, our Seattle office, um, some places that are going up to six units. And I would say when we, um, when we look at middle housing in other areas, sometimes even more than that is considered middle housing depending on the scale. So some places are defining based on unit count, but if you're talking about cottage clusters or if you're really taking a fully form-based approach where you're just like, the box is this big and you can put as many units inside that box as you can fit, then it might, it might be more than six units that could be part of middle housing. But I would say four is kind of the um, most sort of broadly accepted and then up from there is, uh, kind of depends, depends who you ask. Jen, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, and, and, and just say that um, our statewide best practice guide um, gives a lot of guidance on how you can define middle housing and how you might define it in your code, and there's different approaches for doing that. Um, there's different options that we provide based on units and type of housing, but yeah, usually it's over two <laughs> as a baseline and um, up to four in most places. Yeah. Thanks. This is a timely discussion, and Allie led a task force on this, but we have an issue that you must as well, wherever you live, is if you go over two units, then you go from residential code to building IBC. It's much more expensive. It's like a quantum leap. So we have an ordinance working its way through now that would put form below into the residential code, but this may not work because the fire department's got qualms about it, and they're very powerful. It, but in every city, that's the same issue. So. If you're seeing four, and, and we, what we hear is it just doesn't work, so they build duplexes. Um, so how did you get past that? Um, also a great question, and yes, we do have the same problem. I think most places have that same threshold between the residential code and the building code, the international building code, at three units, and there are places that have tried to make that leap. Oregon is has directed thinking about maybe changing it, but there have not actually made changes. 
Um, the thing that we see a lot in Portland is um, units built as town, effectively townhouses under the building code. So from a zoning code perspective, it might be a fourplex. From a building code perspective, it's townhouses because if those units are attached with firewalls, then they can stay under residential code. So we've seen a lot of that, and then we've seen some stacked flat that would be under the commercial um, building code, usually more so when they can get to six units. And so this kind of gets at that, that threshold number. Four is a little bit of an awkward in-between, because um, you're you're, if you're trying to go stacked flats at four, you've probably picked up all the costs. On the upside, as Jen mentioned, you are now providing accessible units if you're not going townhouse style, but also it's more expensive. And so going to six, then you still get the accessible units. You can kind of make a little bit more efficient use of the site. And so what we've seen is the economics for stacked flats, where they work, they kind of start to work at six units. Other comments or questions? Great question. Stacked flats, um, I, and there's probably different, different words that people would use for this in different places, but basically where you have, um, instead of having all of the units walk out onto grade level, have their entrance at grade, um, you'd have like that, uh, Jen, your fourplex examples that I think from Anchorage were stacked flats probably. Um, these ones, so where there's units that are above other units, they have a ceiling floor intersection, not just a wall-to-wall -wall intersection. Other comments or questions? I'm not, Allie, how long are we here for? Okay, is there one more question out there? Otherwise, I have a question for everyone. Yeah, so we have a second presentation that's more in the how, what do you need to do from a regulatory perspective to support middle housing? Yes, yeah, so if you are interested in getting further into how to make middle housing happen, that next session is for you. Yeah, and I would say the next session gets more into the detail on design and density standards, development standards. So. This was just an introduction, just to give people some background on middle housing. Okay, and then my question for folks that are still here is, how many of you have ever lived in middle housing? Have you ever lived in a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, cottage cluster? A few folks, okay. And how many of you have lived in or currently live in a neighborhood that has middle housing? Yeah, even more. And uh, I do as well. There were a, a number of these pictures in the slideshow are from my neighborhood because I take a lot of pictures of middle housing when I'm out and about. Um, and um, including the 12 plex, which really does not look like a 12 plex. But um, what I think is amazing is just that it's it's in so many of our neighborhoods it, unless they were built during specific periods under exclusionary zoning it's often out there and and a lot of people kind of pass through it at some point in in their life as as our little diagram showed okay i think with that we are at our break and we will come back in a couple minutes and talk a little bit more about the details of how to make middle housing happen
Okay, I think we're gonna get the next round of breakouts going here in just a second. So if folks are gonna join us for part two, come have a seat. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, other exciting sessions going on, so it's a tough choice. But we'll get started here in just a second. Go ahead and get started. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I think most of the folks who are here were here for part one. I'm not going to do too much of a recap on what we're talking about with middle housing because I think folks have heard plenty about that at this point. Um, and I'm going to pick up from where Jen left off and talk about what it takes to expand middle housing options in your community. Um, so first. If you're thinking about where you would expand options for middle housing, um, it's helpful to think about like where, where, where are good places for it. Um, Anchorage already allows duplexes in a lot of places. Um, but if you're thinking about where you would want to expand, um, the answer is basically, is, is it a good place for housing? OK, it's probably a good place for middle housing. Generally speaking, if, you can, if it's appropriate to have housing in that area, it's probably appropriate to have middle housing in that area. But there's degrees and, and variations within that. So places like heavy industrial areas and protected resource areas, not really appropriate for housing at all. Also not really appropriate for middle housing. And if you have environmentally constrained areas, floodplains, steep slopes, wetlands, that kind of thing, then Unless middle housing is the way that you are allowing people to still build housing and not build on those places, you don't necessarily need to add a lot more development potential into those areas. If you have places with limited public infrastructure that are on septic or private wells, then the question is, can middle housing realistically afford to put in the infrastructure it would take to be able to increase the intensity there beyond the level of a duplex? Um, if you have places that have bigger scale development, they already have apartment buildings, that they already have taller, um, other types of taller commercial buildings. It's not to say that middle housing would be incompatible there, but maybe you want to allow kind of the most intensive end of the spectrum. We talked in the earlier session about what's kind of the upper limit on middle housing. Those would be places to kind of push that upper limit on middle housing and allow, allow, more, allow more options that get closer to uh, just an apartment building. Um, because you already have the larger scale of development there. On the other side of the spectrum, if you have neighborhoods that have concentrations of disadvantaged households, it's not to say you wouldn't allow middle housing there at all, but you want to think about how you can write the rules in partnership with those communities so that they support people investing in their own properties um, and, and keeping them affordable to, the, that, um, to that community without increasing displacement risk. So middle housing can still be part of the answer there, but you want to write the rules a little bit more carefully and, and with some collaborative engagement. If you have a neighborhoods that are not so accessible, where you really need a car to get around, you cannot, you cannot really do much of anything without a car. Again, middle housing is not the wrong answer there, but you might, you know, you might not have the exact same standards that you would have in a much more walkable place. Um, the, some of the best places to think about for middle housing are anywhere that you're going to have future housing because if you can build it as an integrated neighborhood up front, some of the um, best neighborhoods like Jen talked about have middle housing built in and that's still true today. There's um, Northwest Crossing in Bend is one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the city of Bend. It was built out 
through starting in the early aughts. And um, it has middle housing integrated into the neighborhood, and it's a fantastically desirable place. So any area that's planned for future housing, it's great if you can get that middle housing integrated in up front. And then in an infill context, the places that are walkable are great. Also places that offer good access to good schools, access to jobs, things like that, that provide people access to opportunity. That, those are the best places for middle housing. So some examples of what that, um, how communities in, in a couple places that we worked with in Oregon have taken that kind of um, approach to allowing middle housing pretty broadly, but still making some adjustments. Um, the city of Portland, they allow duplexes pretty much everywhere. Um, but the areas that are shown in pink on the map on the left, um, those are um, areas that have either natural hazards or other constraints, flooding, landslide, et cetera, and they don't allow other types of middle housing in those areas. They also restrict the amount of middle housing you can build if you're on a street that's not maintained by the city. So you can still build a duplex, but you can't build all of the housing types unless you get the street accepted for maintenance. And on the right side, Beaverton doesn't necessarily differentiate the number of units you can build or the intensity of middle housing, but they do vary the standards a little bit in terms of the scale and setbacks and things like that to kind of match up a little bit more to what those neighborhoods are like. Um, and so they have three different flavors of residential, all of which allow middle housing, but the standards are a little bit different in each. So um, in terms of writing regulations that really help support middle housing. There, I'm going to uh, talk about some of the, the specific things that are helpful um, and kind of where, in, you know, we haven't worked in Anchorage extensively, but what from what we've heard today and what we've seen, kind of where you stand relative to some of these best practices. So um, it's helpful if you want to treat a certain thing differently in your regulations. It's helpful to define it, uh, define it specifically. So um, if you lump triplexes, fourplexes, et cetera, in with other multifamily, that makes it a little bit harder to have different rules because you always have to say, well, multifamily that has less than this many units or that type of thing. And you're always kind of trying to say like, well, so if, if it's this, but it's not quite that, it, sometimes it's clearer just to create a definition. So just defining what you mean by triplexes doesn't have to be that specific. Um, you can say, you know, up to four units on, on a lot, you can define it a lot of different ways, but it's helpful just to say, this is what we're talking about that's gonna get these, these different special standards. Um, and just on that point, um, Anchorage right now, you've got duplexes are, are their own thing, but everything three and more units is kind of grouped together and there's a couple different sets of, of standards that apply, but they're not defined separately. Um, and then the next thing that's really important, um, it was interesting to hear the person from St Strong Towns talking about how they don't really focus on density um, as the solution. It's also important um, not to focus on it as the problem. So um, you, if you're looking at supporting middle housing, you can't just say, it's okay, you can build a triplex. And then say, but you do have to build a triplex on three, times as much area as one unit. So you can build it, you just have to have three times as much land area because no one will do that. So instead of getting too hung up over what the density is, and you can see this is, um, I'll give credit to Opticos here, as it says, this is um, a graphic that they put together and that they share that shows kind of a range of what the densities are for some of these kind of idealized middle housing examples. The range can be, be pretty big, but it can get pretty high. And if you get caught up in saying, well, we don't want to allow 37 units per acre in our residential neighborhoods, that's not gonna get you anywhere very productive. So as much as you can, focusing on the scale of it, because things the densities can get pretty high on a small site, especially if you don't provide a lot of parking. Um, so focusing on it's, it's only so big, it's only so much floor area, it's only so tall, those kinds of regulations rather than limiting density. And in Anchorage, I believe most of your residential zones um, regulate based on the required land area or requi lot size, required land area per unit, but some of them do say you need to add more land as you add more units. 
that's, not, that's still basically regulating by density. It's not super helpful for middle housing. It also makes it harder if you have an existing lot that is a specific size, can you put a triplex on it? Can you put a fourplex on it? Or does it not meet that minimum lot size because you have to have more land for more units? Um, another one is parking. I hear y'all just took care of this, so good job. Um, but if you are gonna require too much parking, you're gonna leave less room for housing. Um, smaller units tend to need less parking and walkable areas may need less parking. Um, and the other thing to think about here is if you are building development with a driveway, that driveway takes away an on-street parking space. So if you do have on-street parking, and we have, I know you all have snow, you can't always park in your on-street parking, but if you do have on-street parking and you're uh, just substituting driveways for on-street parking, you're not really gaining parking, you're just privatizing parking. So thinking about that as part of, um, as part of kind of getting comfortable with allowing development to build less parking, because that can be really helpful, especially for middle housing infill in existing areas with an existing lot pattern. Um, and then having specific regulations like setbacks and lot coverage and things like that. This is another example um, that Opticos put together that shows if you require big side setbacks, like you might for a big apartment building, and you have a small lot, sometimes there is not actually room for a building on that lot. And so treating middle housing as if it's basically the same size as a single detached unit, regulating it basically the same way. So you would uh, just have the same setbacks, have roughly the same amount of area on the lot that can be covered by the building. Maybe you allow a little bit more because you want to see more units, but you don't require it to kind of do all these special things and contort itself to try to buffer it from, from single detached housing because it doesn't need that. It's really, it's, it's not that different from the single detached housing. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the earlier session of having some, some straightforward kind of basic design standards that get at some of the common design concerns that you might have. So that can be about the scale, how big the buildings can be, um, it can be about bulk, kind of how big each structure is or how big it looks from the street. Um, that can be about shape, if you care about the shape of the building. And so sometimes that's like articulation or things like that. And putting a friendly face towards the street. So things like how much of your, uh, the area that faces the street is in garage doors and whether you have windows and entrances that face toward the street, whether you have other things that kind of create some visual interest for passers-by. Um, but as I mentioned before, in thinking about putting standards on middle housing, you want to try not to put on standards that are going to be harsher than the ones for single unit detached housing, because you don't want to discourage the middle housing. And because single unit detached housing isn't always beautiful either, so kind of keeping everybody to the same standards in the same, same zone and same scale. And keeping those clear and objective is really important because that allows you to move through a review process more easily and that's why it's important for them not to get too detailed or too persnickety. Um, and so that clear pathway to approval is, is really important for middle housing because some of us love middle housing and some people might be concerned about it next to them. And if you have a process where the neighbors can turn up to a meeting and say, I do not want to have that next to my house, and that is part of the process for that duplex, triplex, whatever, to get approved, that's gonna create a lot of uncertainty. When you create uncertainty for development, that means that developer's risk goes up. And if you think about investments, financial investments, the higher the risk, of the investment, the higher a return you need to make to move forward with that investment. So if that development is not going to make you a whole boatload of money and it's got a lot of risk associated and you might lose a bunch of money, you're either not gonna do it or you're only gonna do it for those kind of premium situations where you can really make a lot of profit and that's gonna really limit what you can deliver. It also slows things down if you have to go through a lot of process. Um, and slowing things down both 
doesn't help you with producing housing, and it makes it harder for developers to time the market. If you are in a place with boom-bust cycles, like perhaps Anchorage, and you make it a very long headway from when you decide that it would be a good idea to build a thing until that thing is available to consumers, that makes it much harder for developers to sort of react to where the market is going and get, uh, and it kind of can contribute to a boom bust cycle by everybody's like, this is a great idea, I want to do it. And by the time they do it, there's lots of supply and the demand is not as strong. So the faster you can get from this is a good idea to it's available, the better developers can time the market and the more they can respond so that you don't see those kind of big spikes. Um, and then it also just adds cost. If, if people have to go through a big process, there's usually more fees associated with that. Sometimes they have to pay consultants, pesky consultants. Um, so <laughs> it's, um, it adds cost to the development if they have to, if they have to go through a big process. Um, and so for newer and smaller developers, it's especially important to not just rewrite the rules and make them so that the thing is possible, but to kind of help teach people how to use the new rules. Middle housing is in a space where you're not necessarily talking about big institutional investment money. If you are building a major apartment building in a major city, you have big institutional investors. You are a professional developer. This is not your first time. If you are building a triplex in a smaller market, you probably do not have big institutional investors and possibly this is your first time and you might be using like your mom's money to do this or like what you've saved up over a lot of years. And so you might need all of the help that you can get to figure out how to do this thing and to figure out where are all the issues that I'm gonna run into. And middle housing, um, to, to move, because it hasn't been a form that's been really common there isn't necessarily a strong ecosystem of developers that know how to do this right now. This isn't necessarily somebody's business model today. And so being able to help people figure out how to make it a viable business model so that they will build it. Because if there's not a developer with a viable business model, there's not development, if there's not development, you don't get the units. So things like having lunch and learns, having information packets, and then you know there's always the friendly people at the counter. But the more that you can kind of make the information on how this works readily available, the easier it's gonna be to get more people interested and get more people involved. And with middle housing, the more you get the kind of creative, innovative, small developers, the more interesting stuff you're gonna get. And the more you're gonna find people that are like, oh, hey, I figured out a model where I can have an existing homeowner build units on their site, reduce their mortgage costs, and not get displaced. That happened in the Seattle region. It's a small developer. And so the more that you have those innovators working in middle housing, the better and more interesting results you're gonna get out of middle housing. And then um, beyond just having middle housing exist, sometimes we want it to accomplish specific goals. Like we want it to help provide affordability, we want it to provide accessible housing, we want it to be more sustainable. Um, I would caution, maybe don't start from a perspective of you can only build metal housing if it's one of those things, but it's nice to encourage and incentivize those outcomes that kind of meet multiple goals, not just housing, but housing and something else. So having some incentives built in, this is where like maybe you can build a triplex if it meets one of these things. Maybe you can build a six plus if it meets one of these things. Maybe you can build a bigger building. Maybe you can build a taller building. You guys already, did parking came off the table, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you were requiring parking, you might want to reduce the parking requirements. And then you can get into financial incentives if that's an option. Um, and those can be more powerful, um, but also take money. So starting with what you can do in the code sometimes is a, is a good starting point. Um, and I will note that although middle housing is not always, Jen talked about how it doesn't on its own hit the kind of lowest end of the income spectrum, it can't hit all income ranges. There are developers, and the example on the top here is from one of them, there are developers who build affordable housing, that's a community land trust, and for them, they often, it's helpful to be able to build their 
affordable housing as middle housing because it's a lot cheaper than trying to build it as single detached housing. Sometimes they have to build at a, at a multifamily, bigger scale, but for there are some affordable housing developers for whom middle housing really works. Habitat for Humanity, if, if they work in your area, they work in our area, they often build in, middle, in a middle housing form in places where the land costs are a little bit higher and where middle housing is allowed in more places. That's something that, that they often find works for them. Um, and we've talked some um, earlier today, folks have talked about um, the need to support uh, entry level starter homes and, and first time home buyers. So middle housing is not always affordable to first time home buyers, but if you want to help make it more likely to be um, available for sale, um, one of the things that can be helpful um, is to allow it to, to the land underneath to be divided. So condominium development in most states is complicated and expensive and has more legal risks than um, just building on separate lots. And so in, um, in Oregon and in Seattle and in several other places, you can see in the image on the left, um, they have allowed developers to subdivide the lot without the individual units having a, a frontage onto the street. And by doing that, they're making it easier for you to just buy a middle housing unit like it was a townhouse, like it was a detached home, and you don't necessarily have a condo, it's easier for the builders, can be easier for the buyers. Um, so that's something that um, you could consider if you're really interested in trying to make middle housing more, uh, more likely to be an ownership product. And then in terms of thinking about how middle housing gets built and then what that might look like in terms of pace of change. Um, you, you see middle housing happen as infill development, you see conversions and additions to existing homes, like adding an ADU or um, converting a single, uh, single dwelling to a duplex. And then you also see new housing development when it's kind of part of a bigger um, new development. And so the, the pace of change um, in, a, in an area, so this is from Portland, Portland, um, did kind of a two-step process of expanding middle housing options. Their first step went into place in um, 2001, and so this is data from their first year in which their rules were in place. Um, and you can see they had a couple hundred um, middle housing projects developed in that time, but they're kind of scattered around. It wasn't like a major, like, you know, no whole blocks got demolished or anything like that. It was pretty, it was kind of sprinkled around. Um, and so that's something that if you're running into concerns from, from neighbors, from community members about how they're, they don't want to see their neighborhood like transformed into all fourplexes or whatever, it's important to keep in mind that most neighborhoods have some lots where you might be able to take an existing home and add some units, some lots where the existing home is not in condition to be kind of rehabbed and maintained and it's, it needs to be demolished anyway and where that might be demolished and replaced with middle housing and some lots where none of those things is gonna happen. And even if you have those sites where you could tear the thing down and you could replace it with middle housing, that's not gonna happen unless that property owner decides to sell, generally, because most people don't demo their own home. Um, and so that, that doesn't happen very quickly. That takes place over a long period of time. My own block, I have several small, older homes, some of which are not in the best condition on, on, on all sides of me. One of those, um, the first of those owners to sell, their house was torn down and replaced with, with two units. Um, and the other four, um, they're still there. They're, they have a homeowner in them and it, it, they will be like that until that homeowner decides that they want to sell their house and then at that point we'll see what happens. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight, it happens over the course of many years. 
And so we, um, we put together a, a couple of links here with resources for um, other, if you're looking to kind of encourage middle housing or um, talk to neighbors and community members about middle housing, some resources that can be helpful for that. So um, AARP has a whole host of information in their livable communities, um, kind of section about middle housing, and um, some of it is aimed more at just kind of community members, like how to like understand what middle housing is, how to think about it, and some of it is more technical. So we worked on this one, the Model Act and Guide to Statewide Legislation that is intended to provide kind of a not a copy-paste template, but a starting point for states to think about legislation to support middle housing, and then we're in the process of developing one that is a best practices guide for local governments that are looking to support middle housing. So those are some other resources you can use to kind of think about the specifics of what might make sense. I think in Anchorage, you guys are actually ahead of many other places because you do allow duplexes in a lot of places and because You've passed some recent legislation related to parking. And so I think you're in a good position. You've got a lot of momentum going today. You're in a good position to kind of pick up and look at how you can expand that beyond just duplexes um, and create more opportunities for triplexes, fourplexes, cottage clusters, and, and potentially beyond in more areas of, of Anchorage. Okay, so if folks have questions, I know we, we had a couple questions in the first section that were about kind of more the, the how-to, but if folks have other questions about kind of how to think about the regulations for middle housing, we can take some of those. Uh, so the question was, when is that local best practices guide coming out? Uh, that depends very much on how long it takes for, for them to review and lay out and approve and publish the document. So we're, we're at the point where they're reviewing a draft and it's just a question of how long it takes to get from draft to final. So stay tuned. I would say first half of 2024 is safe, but I wouldn't want to promise beyond that. Thanks. So uh, one point on your slide 40 about the land ownership, we do that in Anchorage. We call it unit lot subdivisions, so you can own it. And on your page 36, can you flip back? What, what is that space those cars are drawn into? Are you and talking this third about one? this yeah. one here? Where the oh, that's showing, um, I think... I'm actually not sure if that's showing garages or driveways. It's what it's showing is um, spacing between um, between the driveways and how much of the front can be garage. And often, um, so this is actually specifically illustrating the maximum amount that would be garage. But often there's also requirements about the garage being behind the. Uh, the front of the garage being behind the front of the house, not in front of the front of the house. That's so not a snout house. Um, so I think this one is specifically illustrating so. that as a garage. But in some cases, um, you also see a requirement to set the garage door back even further so that you have space for a car between the sidewalk and the garage door since people tend to park in the space in front of their garage more than they park inside. I mean, maybe that's different in Anchorage because y'all get snow. In my hometown, people park in front of their garage and they put their bikes and their stuff yeah. inside of the garage. Well, that's but what I was checking because we don't park in our garages. <laughs> we park out front yeah. and our tail ends of our cars block the sidewalk. Yeah, that's, that's, our a, strategy. that's a common that's a common concern. And so I, when I, um, the thing that I, I typically see as a response to that is a requirement to set that garage door back by 20 feet or so, effectively saying if you're going to have a garage, you need to have a driveway you can park in and a garage, because otherwise we know you're going to park across the sidewalk because we've seen you. We know what you do. I'm glad that John took us to slide 36, because I have a question about slide 37. Um, so here is a really interesting graphic that shows that 
um, the regulation is one part of it, and then the process for folks to move through is another. So are, have you um, seen success, or I guess what kind of success have you seen from communities um, that tackle both the regulatory and the procedural pieces together? Um, or is that common to do, or you know, tell me more about what that looks like in practice. Yeah, so um, I think the most successful kind of uh, looks at, at streamlining and permitting do need to take into consideration both the regulatory requirements and how things kind of work in practice and how different departments maybe work or don't work together. And um, the what I have seen and heard is I, a number of smaller communities that I've worked with um, one of their big advantages is that they have really, they're, they're small and nimble and they pull every, all the right people together for a meeting up front. Everybody says, okay, this is what you're gonna be required to do. They get that detailed up front. Everybody knows, they move pretty quickly, they work as a team, and they get that review and, and permitting process done pretty quickly. In Oregon, we have some rules that limit how long um, the maximum amount of time from when somebody submits a complete application to when that application must be complete uh, uh, approved, but they're like you know six months. It's pretty long, and um, and there's some hmm, there's some things that jurisdictions sometimes do to work around that. I would say, but in an ideal world, you're not anywhere near the that kind of legal limit. You're you're looking at your department's pr your permitting department and then everybody else who's involved, engineering, fire, whoever else is gonna need to buy off on this and you're kind of trying to get everybody march in the same way and communicating and communicating to the applicant what needs to happen so that um, what's on paper is, is streamlined and then what's happening in practice is also streamlined. Jen, did you wanna add on to that? Yeah, I think one area that um, I've seen a lot of jurisdictions first get into that is just by allowing different middle housing types like duplex, triplex by right. And that means that you don't have that conditional use permitting process. And so that is something to work out. But um, I worked in a jurisdiction where we did that. And one of the other um, ways we did that was to have a housing ombuds person help the applicants. So that was a special position <laughs> where they really went and helped the applicant um, get through the permitting process. And usually it was um, a building permit process and there was a transitional period though with that. But um, yeah, it's incremental. It's really, it can be really stressful though to um, streamline a permitting process. And um, a lot of jurisdictions will say, well, we don't have enough staff. You know, like to expedite this process, we need to have more staff. So, you know, there is some concerns with that, but, you know, like there's design review requirements, there's all these different requirements in different jurisdictions, so, and it's, it's good to maybe do an audit and kind of see where there are all the pinch points in the process and see where you might be able to make some incremental change and work at it over time. We are at our 315 endpoint for this breakout session. Um, so I expect that folks will be coming back into the room. So we maybe have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. Any final questions? Okay, well thank you Becky and Jennifer um, and thanks to AARP Alaska for sponsoring this part of the program. Um, let's take a quick break. We're gonna transition this space and meet everybody back in the main event hall um, in about 10 minutes, thanks.
Quoi, quoi. All right. All right, folks, we're going to get started here in a second. So if you all can go back to your seats and then uh, wind down your conversations, which I know you all are having great energetic conversations, we are going to get started with our wrap up and our closing here in a minute. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone, if we could come back together. Sorry again to break up some good conversations. We want to um, spend a little time kind of sharing back what we learned um, in our small groups. And then we also want to make sure that we end the day with a good call to action, a good uh, specific thing for folks to do. So please come back together. There we go. Um, OK, so uh, so thank you, everybody. We are nearing the end of our program. Like I said, we're going to spend the rest of the afternoon um, discussing, uh, sorry, <laughs> discussing uh, kind of what we learned and then uh, what we're excited to be working on and then really talking about next steps. Um, so first I'm going to invite um, all of the facilitators to uh, come up briefly and we want to, because um, we want to give people a flavor of the, there were six different case studies. Um, if you spent a lot of time in, in your two groups, you maybe didn't get to hear uh, what the other ones were. So we want to make sure folks have that opportunity. And then I also want to put this question out there, because we also want to hear some, um, some kind of takeaways or, or thoughts from you all in the audience. Um, we have a little bit of time for that. So I want to put the question out there. Was there something that surprised you? Maybe something that you learned that you weren't, ex that you weren't expecting or, or something that you always thought was true and then you found out it wasn't. So really thinking about that. Um, so I will, I see we have all our facilitators here. Um, so I'm going to invite you guys to just uh, maybe briefly come up on stage and then um, share and then you can go back off stage. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, I can I can pull up one at a time. Let's do that. Okay, okay. Um, so we will have folks come up one at a time, and then we'll keep passing the mic. So they're just going to read um, the brief description of the case study, share a couple takeaways, and then we'll have some time again for uh, other folks who want to share who have been part of these conversations. So I will start with Claire. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Actually, sorry. <laughs> um, I think if we go to our next slide. Or if we go back to the slides, I have the clicker. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've got one slide per case study. And so, OK, so first we'll have the person, oh, it worked out. <laughs> Here you go. And I'm not going to give takeaways. I'm going to leave that to you. Ali's going to walk around with the microphone. Um, so for those of you who participated in this topic, you can give the takeaways. But I'll read, I'll read it so everyone understands. This is called Emerald Hills, a six acre lot that sits empty in a popular neighborhood. Emerald Hills is a six acre lot located on the corner of Di Diamond and Arlene in West Anchorage, close to schools, parks, and a retail center. The owner would like to develop it in phases into a walkable neighborhood with up to 240 residential units for rent or for sale, with additional space for light retail and offices on the first floor, as well as the possibility of underground parking. The development would highlight the beginning of the Campbell Creek Trail with a high degree of integration with the surrounding community, trails, park, and bus routes. However, many constraints in the zoning code, the high cost of financing this project, and requirements for costly utility connections means that the project isn't feasible, even though many in Anchorage desire this type of housing to be developed near retail centers. 
So anyone who participated in that have any key takeaways to share? All right, Ali's coming to the mic. Okay. Um, hi, yes, I was in this group and I think it was really fascinating, especially if you don't really know a lot about uh, the development of these things or kind of how they work. I feel like one of the takeaways that I got is the processes that are in place might be a little too complicated, I think, for developers as far as um, them being able to really get through the door and be able to get us that housing that we need. So them working with the Muni and the Muni working with them and the community working with them to try and help them develop this, I think, is going to be our biggest step forward, being open to those ideas. Any other takeaways or things that surprised you when you studied this project? If not, we can move on to the next one. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Hi everybody, um, so our group talked about whether we are leaving housing on the table. We looked at the McCain Loop project in Spinard, um, talked about the difficulty of creating a triplex instead of a duplex. So in 2022, Cook Inlet Housing Authority, an affordable housing development agency, redeveloped a property on McCain Loop in Spinard to create two duplexes and one triplex on two lots, a type of housing that is common in our older neighborhoods but rare today. In fact, CIHA found that from 1970, 85, wait, oh, from 1970 to 85, 326 triplexes were built. That's about 22 a year. But since 1999, only 31 triplexes, or about one a year, have been built in Anchorage. CIHA persevered, but others, especially small businesses and families, have instead opted to build duplexes on land that is zoned for higher density because there's less red tape. Inspired by this project, the assembly is currently looking at making three and four plexes easier to build. So would any, anyone from our groups like to talk about their takeaways, their aha moments? How they really, really want to support this. I was surprised to learn that the, uh, a lot of the requirements for the triplexes are the same for big box stores, right? That feels like a odd um, sort of stopping point for that. So I was pretty surprised by that. Yeah. Any, anyone else? We had some really smart people around the table, so. Oh, Emily, yeah. Yeah, one thing we talked about was that this is one of the rare success stories in terms of building a triplex in Anchorage. And it seems like maybe in this case, one of the reasons that was able to happen is because there was actually outside funding that CIHA is able to get that most developers are not able to get. So some lessons there. Oh, oh Allie, right up here at the front. Um, well, a couple of people made comments that put together with Karen's presentation about whether there might be some educational materials the city could put together outlining the process if some if an you know an individual wanted to convert their home into the duplex or triplex and also um, the fact that there this is really creative for me so when um, there's so many split level homes in Anchorage like somebody could come up with a couple of different plans for how you could convert it and have information maybe on like oh it would cost you this much to add the bathroom over here the separate door or something like that and that could ultimately bring down costs for everybody
Hi, my case study, or our case study was who pays for public infrastructure? Uh, completely coincidentally, this is a hot topic for me. Chabala Corners is a new 86 unit senior and multifamily housing development by Cook Inlet Housing Authority at the intersection of Spinard Road and 36th Avenue. During permitting for the first phase, a replatting action triggered a requirement to dedicate right of way and make improvements to the neighboring Chugach Way. Chugach Way had long been identified as needing upgrades to support future development and was already slated for rehabilitation in municipal plans. See how plan to provide right of way to support a future, uh, sorry, future MOA improvement, but was surprised to learn that they would be responsible for the road upgrade as well, which required an upgrade to the sidewalk, curb, and 24 feet of asphalt at a cost of $340,000 additional to the project. Not only did CEHA have to absorb the cost of rehabilitating public infrastructure, the project resulted in other problems that don't necessarily result in public benefit. Where's my group? <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't. Thanks, Jed. So yeah, I was in this one. And um, we talked about a lot of things, but there um, is kind of a couple of approaches that um, you can come up with for this. One is, are these requirements really necessary? And are there changes to code that should be made? Um, and then also, if they are necessary, is it really fair to put that burden on the developer, or should the city maybe put together a financing mechanism to do that infrastructure. So those were kind of some of the big takeaways from our discussion. Sorry, I was, I was not in this group, but just wanted to highlight that our group talked about something similar. On the Emerald Hills project, there was all told about three and a half million dollars in off-site improvements between water and traffic. Uh, so it's, it's a similar issue than just wanted to highlight. It's, it's a, I think, a broad challenge. Um. If I could also add, sorry, just to like chime in, um, but I sat in on the um, middle housing presentation sponsored by AARP Alaska. And um, a, a theme that came out of those is um, looking at middle housing as a way for people who aren't developers to develop properties. And so to then to also think about the offsite improvement requirements for somebody who um, doesn't have federal funding <laughs> to support the project is I think an interesting element to then tie into this conversation. Carolyn, you were pointing? Oh, the, yeah, green shirt. Thanks, and I think Carolyn provided a good example of even a business development that was required to add a small piece of sidewalk infill where no other sidewalk existed. And, and it's a perfect opportunity to maybe create a land bank um, for the neighborhood so that you would actually put that funding in for the neighborhood and any other development that happens in that neighborhood. And then the neighborhood could choose what they want in public um, improvements, such as uh, maybe a little pocket park, a playground, um, uh, you know, even f fill in all the sidewalk once they get enough um, funding there. Um, one other aspect that we talked about was that the existing network, and this ties back to what Chuck presented on to the group earlier, the existing network is all built out. So w when we talk about right of way, we should really try to work within the existing means. So we shouldn't ask developers to dedicate additional right of way to the public and instead try to actually Im I put in road diets and non-motorized facilities or plantings and things that are low-hanging fruit for the neighborhood so that you can actually just quickly 
improve it rather than waiting for the mega project that's going to put in curb and gutter and middle traffic lanes that on the on the assumption that your traffic is going to expand to this and need this master road when in reality we we have many places that are doing just fine with less All right, our group discussed how can we make housing more secure, trying to find housing support before becoming homeless. Elsie has received rental assistance through a housing voucher that is expiring in a few months. She is trying to be proactive to line up new housing support, but it's a real struggle. She loves her apartment, the affordable rent and central location have been the key to her independence after a life altering injury, and she doesn't want to move. She is on social security disability and is connected with her tribe, so receives assistance from a number of programs, but she keeps getting referred from one program to another. She wants a caseworker to help her navigate the system, but they seem to be in short supply and not always knowledgeable about housing assistance. The clock is ticking and she's getting worried. Groups, let's hear your voices, yeah. I ended up sitting in on this discussion and it was really surprising hearing from the group that when we were trying to look at the issues that were really pointed at in this case study that at least from our side we were having a difficulty finding specific strategies that really seemed to approach the problem that was being supported on here. There was uh, talks about in here supports expansion of programs for emergency rental assistance which we talked about being really helpful in the short term, but we are really worried about what that long-term goal is. That kind of dovetails in with that whole missing middle where it's like, okay, if you uh, had a housing voucher and like say you earn extra income, got put out beyond that, uh, that if there's no middle for you to go to, you're kind of just bouncing back and forth in between those programs. And again, it was really concerning to the group that when we were looking at um, caseworkers and them not being knowledgeable on like uh, housing issues that there didn't really seem to be a lot that was in the plan anyway to try and address the really down on the ground people needs for uh, people trying to go through and navigate some of these programs to help keep people housed. We also talked a lot about how hard it is to access the resources and services in our systems. Like it's a very uh, segmented between local, state, and federal programs and how like it's very paper intensive and time intensive to navigate such that it requires a lot of assistance often for, fee for people uh, to use caseworkers. Uh, we also talked about like public perception of people needing these services and how often uh, it's seen as an individual problem, uh, especially people experiencing homelessness, instead of systemic and structural problems that we kind of need to tackle as a community. One more and then we'll move to the next one. I'm Shanae Williams with Shiloh Community Housing and this is our main focus, is to keep people housed that are housed. We're in the process of developing a resource center that would provide that those services. We understand through our other projects with financial assistment, assistance to prevent people from getting evicted, the gap. There's a lack of education on how to stay housed, how to budget, how to manage your finances, how to manage other issues that will, you will end up being homeless if you're not able to manage it. So this is what we're trying to develop in, in Mountain View is a over 14,000 square foot facility, and we're trying to develop that service, a one-stop shop, where service providers can come and provide that service to those persons before they lose their housing. Okay, hi everybody. Our group took a look at Block 96, um, 
And here's the description. Anchorage Community Development partnered with Debenham Properties to construct Block 96 flats downtown, the first 100% market rate, rate apartment in the area in over 40 years. Even with a goal to build affordable market rate units, development costs still need to pencil out for the developer to obtain loans and recover their cost. So there's a slim margin in the budget to set rents low enough to be considered affordable. And that's especially hard in Anchorage with our high building costs. This $11.6 million project relied on a $1.8 million investment and a 50-year ground lease from ACDA, as well as municipal tax incentives to create 48 studio and one bedroom units. All right, where are my group members? Any takeaways? Okay, well, I felt like a, a missing bullet point under five strategy, maintaining housing affordability and stability, um, would be the, the Muni has a lot of land, whether that is in real estate department or heritage land bank, and I feel like there should be some expectation of the developer to provide affordable housing if public land is being utilized for the project, um, and that could look like a, a low cost lease so that the developer can include the affordable units within the development, and it could also look like donation of the land in exchange for doing a, an affordable project. Hello. Geek. Okay. John is a working professional making 42,000 per year. He and his wife, Michelle, who is taking online courses and stays at home to care for their one young child are long-term renters. The family has been stably housed in the same duplex for the past five years. Recently, they learned their landlord has decided to sell the duplex they've been renting for $1,100 per month. The family has 30 days to find another place to live and move out, and they want to stay in Midtown close to John's work. John and his wife haven't had to navigate the Anchorage rental market in more than five years, so they're not sure where to begin or what they can afford. I'm going to call people out. <laughs> Dave, Mr. Edgington, Todd had good thoughts. Cool. Uh, hi. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about was just that 30-day timeline is, is, is anyone uh, that has moved recently, 30 days is a pretty short amount of time to find out you have to move to be able to find a place to stay that's affordable, that's near your bus line, near your kid's school, um, and then also execute moving, and, and it does not give you a lot of time to be able to sort of save up money, um, check all those boxes that need to happen. Uh, when when moving, so potentially extending that 30-day window, and I, I heard that, that that's already being talked about, which is excellent. Um, one of the other things that we, we talked about was really, is there a way that we can incentivize landlords um, or look at some of the things that we're already doing to incentivize keeping people in long-term rentals? Is there some sort of, you know, if you can, and, and this kind of dovetailed with the second to last group we were talking about, if, if you can keep someone in housing for three years, five years, seven years, whatever. Like, could you know, as a as a um, as a landlord, could there be some sort of incentive for for holding on to long term renters rather than flipping that unit over and being able to increase the rent when you post it again? So, you know, is there a way to, to incentivize keeping people in housing longer? Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, Amanda. Um, so one thing, um, actually, there was one thing I learned which I hadn't really thought about before, which was um, that I'd, I think that relates back to what we were told earlier in the Strong Towns presentation, that a lot of our housing you know, appeared about 50 years ago, and much of that is in the rental market. And uh, it's the point where things are disappearing from the rental market because property is basically either, it's not maintainable anymore. So we're seeing potentially some decrease of the market there. Um, the other thing I thought would be interesting is the, um, 
the, the strategy talks about um, ownership as being kind of, it almost reads like gold standard. I don't think it's meant to be that, but it reads as if um, you know, ownership is always the goal. And I think long-term rental should also, stable long-term rental should also be an acceptable outcome. Um, so any, anything where we um, sort of focus on owner occupation, we should probably give the same set of incentives and, uh, and sort of benefits for property which is long-term rented. Against at least in my corner of the uh, municipality, we don't really have, you know, it, it's it's either it's either owned or owned and empty. It's either owned and occupied or owned and empty. Often, um, and we're seeing the squeeze on the uh, long-term rental. So anything which kind of incentivizes long-term rental use as opposed to empty use, I think, is a is a plus. Okay, thank you everybody for sharing and thank you again to everybody who really was engaged in the conversations this afternoon. Um, I had a, the benefit to walk around and kind of overhear what y'all were talking about and I really appreciate um, that everybody was really digging in and I know um, each of these case studies is one really micro example but, but the goal was really to start illuminating these big problems and to make them feel real, right? It's, it's one thing to talk about infrastructure banks and, and, and sidewalks to nowhere. It's another one to think about a real property in this town where you can go look at that and then you can think about how we can do better. Um, so I just want to share kind of a couple highlights and then we'll do, um, we'll do our, our closing. Um, so one is that, of course, housing is complicated, right? I think that hopefully people walk away with that feeling and it doesn't mean that it's unfixable. It just means that there's a lot of different pieces we need to work on. And I think the, the conversations this afternoon really highlight even on one piece of property or even with one person's situation, all those things are swirling around. Another one is that I know we feel a lot of urgency. Um, I especially felt that talking about housing affordability, talking about people's experience in the rental market, um, and not just renters, really really everybody, um, but, but we want to make sure that we're doing things because we can't afford to just sit and wait for this problem to go away. So I hopefully people feel that we have urgency behind what we need to do. And also, this will take time, right? We, we unfortunately, as much as I'd love to go make sure everybody is securely housed in the perfect place that they want to live tomorrow, that's not in my power to do. That's not really what our task is. It is to really work together, try to untangle these really complex problems, and then really build the community will to do that. That's really what this summit is about, and that's what the strategic plan is about. It's not just what the assembly's going to do, what the 12 of us are going to hash out over the, last, the next uh, couple years. It's really how do we get everybody moving in the same direction on the same page. So with that, I'm going to do a really brief call to action. Um, and it's three things. And again, really building on uh, what Mr. Marone shared earlier, that we can go do the thing. Um, first, I want to share a very brief story. Uh, if you've ever walked into the Linny Pasillo parking garage, and, and if you've ever followed me on Twitter, you've seen me post this probably 15 times now. Um, one of my favorite things is to go to that the, the payment machine on the first floor. It's, it's probably just a bad translation, but it says change is possible. So that's what I want to leave us with. And I bring up that parking garage because that is a huge piece of infrastructure, right? It's right in the middle of downtown, but it's not named after a public figure. It's not named after one of our former governors. It's named after a, a person in the community who decided that she wanted to help people out and not get parking fines. So if you remember the parking ferries, um, and, and we can get into that whole story, but the bottom line is that community members can make a difference and they can make a really lasting difference. So again, change is possible. Um, so the call to action that I have for all of you, the first one is take a walk. I think we all love being outside. We love going in our natural areas, our parks and trails, but really take a walk in your own neighborhood. Maybe you don't get out of your car and look at your neighborhood very often, right? Or, or go next door to the neighborhood that you haven't been to for a while. Really walk around and start to think about what you're seeing and what the policy choices were that put them there. Whether it's those sidewalks to nowhere, whether it's an empty lot that's been like that for 20 years, uh, whether it's that, that Diamond and Arlene uh, property that you're like, why hasn't that been built on yet? So so really start to think about what you're seeing on the ground and then start to think about how it connects back to these big big issues that we're facing. 
The second one is to start a conversation. So uh, we hoped with this summit to continue the conversation that we've been having about housing, but really this conversation needs to happen in every household in Anchorage, in every uh, tent of unhoused person in Anchorage, in every apartment building. Um, break, strike up that conversation with your neighbors. We're moving into the holidays. Uh, maybe ask people, you know, where, where would you want to live? Or talk to your kids, talk to your parents, um, you know, kind of have those intergenerational conversations. Um, really kind of help others understand the things that you've started to learn today and that we're starting to uncover because that's really how again we build the community will to make the changes that we need to make and the third one tell policymakers what you want anchorage to be so that's us on the assembly it's our mayor it's our state legislature it's our governor it's our federal delegation uh, you can try calling the president i don't recommend spending your time doing that to change housing or to change our local housing policy um, but really tell us what you want um, and so that can be something commenting on specific ordinances that we mentioned the three and four plex um, other ones that are out there that we've been talking about and if you think that we should change it right it's we're not just asking for support we're asking for what your opinions are on these matters and then along those lines we really want comments on our strategic plan as i said it's a draft it says draft this is not the final version, um, especially if you have thoughts about actions, if there's ones that are missing from our list that we really need to be highlighting. If there's things that you think, well, maybe that's a good idea, but it's not the highest priority, let us know. So um, in order to do that, uh, we're asking for comments uh, in the next month. So by Monday, December 4th, um, please send it in. You can either mark up the draft, um, you can just send general comments by email, you can reach out to an assembly member and we can have a conversation. It doesn't always have to be in writing. Um, you can testify at a meeting, although we won't have this for a public hearing quite yet. Um, but in the next month, if you can send that, again, I'll, I'll, I'll read out the email, but you can also go to our website to, to find this. It's wwmas at anchorjk.gov. That goes directly to all 12 assembly members, um, and then we all see it in our inboxes as a public comment, and I can say that we all read our emails. Sometimes we're a little behind, like me, <laughs> on my e inbox, but we all look at that. So that is a way to reach us, and again, have a conversation. Um, and then with that, I will turn it over to uh, Felix to close us out. Great, thanks, Anna, so much. Thank you all so much for gathering with us today. As we've mentioned repeatedly, the housing problem is an everyone problem. The assembly is committed to doing the hard work, but we need everyone pitching in and helping us get there. We want this to be a community where people can thrive, and we want a healthy economy with lots of opportunities, but we can't have that if not everyone can afford to live here. While Housing Action Week is nearly over, this is just one step of the process. We hope you will follow along with our work on housing long after this week. We will continue to keep the Anchorage Housing Action.org website up and running as a central place to learn about housing, get updates on the work, and get involved. You can also sign up for the Assembly's email newsletter to get updates on the projects that we're working on, as well as our recent actions and items that are coming up. As I said earlier, Housing is a fulcrum in our community that touches so many issues. If we want to encourage economic development and create good paying jobs, housing is a solution. If we want to retain and attract young families, housing is a solution. If we want to keep our current ASD students in Anchorage, housing is a solution. If we want to address our unhoused crisis, housing is the solution. I'm gonna give a few thanks, because uh, we couldn't have done all of this without so many wonderful staff, contractors, and volunteers. So first, I wanna thank Scott Jensen and the team for your great work on tech. Thank you so much. I wanna thank our wonderful assembly aides for being here today, Camilla, Genevieve, and Caleb. Thank you. I wanna thank Amanda Moser, who has worked with the assembly on this issue since our retreat in May, wherever Amanda is, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank Carolyn Hall, who worked with us on comms and media. Thank you, Carolyn. 
Uh, I want to thank Sharon Pehisawa, I hope I said that right, um, who worked on our amazing website. If folks haven't been to that, please go check out anchoragehousingaction.org. And then I also want to thank UAA for hosting us today. This has been wonderful to have this event here. Um, I haven't been in this space in a while, so it's great to be back here. Um, I want to thank our volunteers who helped facilitate the case studies, all of the wonderful presenters. A huge thanks to our keynote speaker, Charles Marone. Thank you again for being here. And then last, but certainly not least, I want to thank our amazing Legislative Services staff, Claire Ross. Stand up, Claire. <laughs> Jennifer Vineklausen, stand up. And Allie Hartman. Where, where are you, Allie? Okay. Um, the three rock stars who really helped to make this happen. Thank you all so much. Finally, I want to remind those of you with kids that we have a final event tomorrow from 2, 30, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. at Mountain View Library, the Future City Fund for Families. Um, so there's going to be uh, craft activities for kids of all ages, and parents can learn more about the Assembly's housing work. Again, the comment deadline that Anna mentioned uh, is Monday, December 4th, for folks who want to get in their comments for the strategic plan. Um, but just remember her three key takeaways, right? Take a walk, have a conversation, and then get involved in public policy. Monday, December 4th is the most immediate opportunity you have to get involved with the strategic plan. Thank you again for joining us and looking forward to working with all of you to, on these housing solutions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.